So good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Norni Lejon and I'm Director of the Information Law and Policy Centre, one of the academic centres based at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies within the University of London. We are delighted that you are able to join us here today for the Centre's annual lecture and conference of 2020 on AI and the rule of law, regulation and ethics. It has been a significant year for this area of law and policy, but before I speak more about that and the fantastic programme that we have for you over the next two days, let us take a moment to acknowledge that 2020 has also been an incredible year for the world and for us all. Since the beginning of the pandemic, things have changed, including these conference proceedings. Usually, I would be welcoming you this morning at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies at Russell Square in Charles Clore House in London. And perhaps we may have already met in the conference room over tea during registration, and we may have discussed the panels, the topics, speakers that you were particularly looking forward to over the next two days. But this year, the Centre's annual lecture and, com and conference, as you can see, are being hosted entirely online. And my usual remarks to you regarding health and safety are also very different this year. So everyone, please remain calm and do not be alarmed if any adorable cats or dogs or children join the speakers in their presentations, or if you, ha if you hear the distant sound of a doorbell ringing, or if you suddenly see stunning alpine mountains, beautiful gardens, or the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco in the background of your screen. These are all standing operating procedures in 2020. What has also become normal in these post-COVID times is our increased use of technology. This has dramatically increased the role, in turn, that AI-driven systems that use modeling techniques like machine learning quite, quite prevalently now play in how we all live and work, how industry use algorithms and micro-targeting on an unprecedented scale to deliver and market services and products to us and the communities we belong to in a more personalized way. And of course, how countries are governed during a global health crisis. Certain public authorities around the world have, for instance, added facial recognition to CCTV cameras in order to monitor social distancing during the pandemic. And contact tracing apps have also been used to track and manage the spread of the virus. There is no question that protecting the health and safety of the public are legitimate aims for any government to pursue. But such wide scale personal data collection and profiling and data analytics that interfere with human rights, such as the right to privacy, equality, freedom of expression and due process, to just mention a few, must comply with the rule of law and be shown to be necessary with safeguards and independent oversight to ensure against their abuse. If these measures indeed are to be acceptable in democratic society. Indeed, as recently highlighted in the landmark Court of Appeals judgment in our Bridges versus Chief Constable of South Wales Police, which held that the use of live automated facial recognition technology by the police there was unlawful, new AI technologies are not exempt from rule of law requirements. They must operate under a legal basis that must be accessible to the public. This means that there must be a published and comprehensible framework, and it must be possible to discover what its provisions are, its scope and its rules and restrictions. Any use of an AI driven system or tool must also be foreseeable, meaning that it must be possible for the public to foresee its consequences for them, and it should not confer a discretion so broad that its scope is actually in practice dependent on the will of those who use it and apply it 
rather than on the law itself. So this raises significant policymaking questions regarding how do we ensure the development and design of legal frameworks that provide robust protection for human rights and the rule of law for governing powerful AI-driven systems and tools that often operate by design in a highly opaque way in how they either make or play a significant role in making decisions and profiles and predictions about individuals and communities that have significant impacts on people's lives, including what news and information they receive, whether or not they receive a loan or employment opportunities, whether they may travel to other countries, or what results a student may receive in terms of their A-levels or GCSEs, excuse me, examinations, if they were prevented from setting them as normal due to the pandemic. I'm delighted to say that we have a fantastic lineup of speakers and panels tackling these important questions over the next two days. These papers and conversations will address the extent and the interplay of the roles and contributions to be made in this policy space by regulation and ethics. We're very excited about the fact that the ILPC will be a national and international hub on a topic of great public interest and importance over the next two days for what is going to be a very rich conversation, interdisciplinary and cross-sector between scholars and practitioners with perspectives and insights brought by speakers joining us from across the UK and Europe, Australia, Asia, North America and South Africa. And on that note, it is now time to begin today's proceedings and it is my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker for the ILPC Annual Lecture of 2020, Lord Clement Jones. Lord Clement Jones is a consultant of DLA Piper, where former positions held include London Managing Partner, Head of UK Government Affairs, Chairman of its China and Middle East Desks, International Business Relations Partner, and Co-Chairman of Global Government Relations. He is Chair of Ombudsman Services Limited, the not-for-profit, independent ombudsman service that provides dispute resolution for the communications, energy, property and copyright licensing industries. He is a member of the advisory board of AIRMIC, Association of Insurance and Risk Managers in Industry and Commerce, and board member of the corporate finance faculty of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales, where he also chairs their AI and corporate advisory expert consultative group. He is a founder member of the OECD parliamentary group on AI, and a member of the Council of Europe's Ad Hoc Committee on AI. He is a senior fellow of the Atlantic Council's Geotech Centre, which focuses on technology, altruism, geopolitics and competition. Tim was made a life peer in 1998 and until July 2004 was the Liberal Democrat health spokesman and thereafter until 2010, Liberal Democrat spokesman on culture, media and sport in the House of Lords. He is a former spokesman on the creative industries and is now the Liberal Democrat Digital spokesper Spokesperson in the Lords. He is former Chair of the House of Lords Select Committee on Artificial Intelligence and a former member of the Select Committees on Communications and Built Environment. He is Co-Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Artificial Intelligence. He is Deputy Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on China and also Vice Chair of other key All-Party Parliamentary Groups. From 2012 to 2019, he was the Chair of Lib Dems and Communications. Tim is also Chair of the Council of Queen Mary University of London and Chair of the Advisory Council of the Institute for Ethical AI in Education, led by Sir Anthony Selden. He is a former Chair of the Council of the School of Pharmacy, University of London, and is now an external member of the Council of University College London. Tim is President of Ambitious About Autism, formerly Treehouse, an autism education charity and school for children with autism and other communication disorders and its former chairman. Tim is a council member of the Heart of the City, fellow of the Public Relations Consultants Association and honorary fellow of the Chartered Institute of Public Relations. He is a governor of Halle Berry and an ambassador for Bart's charity. He is a former trustee of the Barbican Centre Trust and former chair of Crime Concern. Finally, until its merger with Macmillan Cancer Support in 2008, he was a trustee of Cancer Backup, the UK cancer information charity founded by his late wife, Dr. Vicky Clement-Jones. 
In terms of format for this morning, Lord Clement Jones will speak for 30 minutes and he will then join our keynote panel that takes place at 8.30 a.m. following the break. So now I would like to thank all of our speakers, discussants, chairs and participants for all joining us here today. And we'll now invite Lord Clement Jones to deliver the ILPC's annual lecture for 2020 entitled AI, Time to Regulate. Thank you very much indeed, Nora. Um, th that CV is almost as long as my lecture. Um, I I'm, uh, but I'm delighted to be uh, with you today uh, on this very hot topic, which uh, we're going to be talking about. Um, and I'm just sorry that we can't all be together in person. I'm now going to um, share my screen and hopefully uh, we'll be away and then we can get into the slides. That's great. Um, now, nowadays, virtually every company and sector is affected by new technology and is dependent on the successful and sound adoption of the latest relevant technologies for their survival. COVID-19 has accelerated this imperative and powerfully illustrates the issues involved, ranging from the ethical issues, the treatment of employees and customers, and the regulations that need to apply. Artificial intelligence itself presents great opportunities in a whole variety of sectors, healthcare, education, financial services, marketing, retail, agriculture, uh, energy conservation, smart or connected cities, where the predictive, analytical and problem solving nature of AI can make a huge difference in improving performance, productivity and customer experience. But there are also risks, especially in terms of retaining stakeholder trust, especially as there is a strongly polarized narrative around AI, the worst or best thing for humanity, according to the late Professor Stephen Hawking. Now, our original UK House of Lords committee report, which we've recently revisited with an evidence session with academic, ethical and regulatory experts and UK government ministers, emphasize the need to realize both the opportunities and mitigate the risks involved in the application of AI. A crucial element of the latter is the retention of public trust through demonstrating ethical, trustworthy AI. We've seen in the UK how the word algorithm has become problematic this year, for example, although you might well argue that AI was actually not involved. So there must be a high standard of ethical application of AI and of accountability. Jan Kleisen, the Council of Europe's Director of Information Society and Action Against Crime, recently asked us to recently asked us to remember the 1993 movie Jurassic Park. In a famous scene, Jeff Goldblum, who plays a chaos theory expert, tells the owner of a dinosaur theme park that your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could create dinosaurs from prehistoric DNA that they didn't stop to think if they should. And that's exactly what Professor Margaret Bowden said about AI. Even if AI can do something, should it? Does it better connect and empower our citizens, improve working life, create a more sustainable society? Now, we've seen the high level sets of AI ethics developed by bodies like the EU, the OECD, the G20, the Partnership on AI. Now, these are very comprehensive and provide the basis for a common set of international standards. And they're not alone. There are many others. There are something like uh, 150 uh, sets of different sorts of principles at the last count. Many of us uh, uh, have preached uh, the gossip, the gospel uh, of ethical AI for some years, but however well-intentioned, voluntary ethical guidelines may not be enough. And these, uh, for instance, are the ones that uh, uh, the core principles being established uh, by the OECD that were set out uh, and published last year. But in the words of the title of Brent Middlestadt's Nature paper, principles alone cannot guarantee ethical AI. So there may well come a point 
where the risks attendant on non-compliance with ethical principles are so high that policymakers need to understand when certain forms of AI development and adoption require regulation. And that is what I will be exploring later. This is a mind map which the OECD Global Parliamentary AI Group has been working on and which demonstrates the many and varied positive aspects of AI, but also the risks involved, particularly to fundamental rights. It's a complex area. The level of risk uh, may vary, uh, 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 may very much vary and depends on the circumstances. Uh, the applications involved, the sensitivity of the data employed, the relevant sectors where it's deployed, and the probability of harm. And we need to be wary of the idea that the precautionary principle should always be the overarching principle for risk calibration. We certainly don't want to replicate the mistakes made over GM food regulation. So how do we evaluate the impact uh, of various AI technologies? How do we calibrate the risk which will determine what level we need to go to? Do we have the necessary tools for risk assessment and a, and a clear understanding uh, uh, and a clear um, uh, understanding of the necessary escalation in compliance mechanisms to match? As has been well illustrated during the COVID pandemic, the language of risk is fraught with misunderstanding. How do we achieve any kind of consensus on what the hierarchy of governance and regulation associated with AI systems is? I believe that there is a clear governance hierarchy which can be followed depending on the risk involved. Where the risk is lower, a flexible approach such as a voluntary ethical code without a hard compliance mechanism can be envisaged. So, as I mentioned, we have ethical codes such as those adopted by the OECD, EU and G20. Where the risk is higher, corporate governance using business guidelines and standards with firmer compliance mechanisms need to be built in. This would include, for instance, the one adopted uh, by the AI uh, uh, partnership. Then we have government best, uh, uh, best practice, such as the AI procurement guidelines developed by the World Economic Forum and adopted by the UK government. Finally, and as some would say, as a final resort, we have full-blown regulation, such as the GDPR as applied to data, and uh, such as that which is being adopted for autonomous vehicles, which are enforceable by law. Professor Arisa Emma of Tokyo University sets out a rather different hierarchy in this form, in what she calls the ecosystem of AI governance. But essentially, it's all about rising levels of governance, depending on the risk. So let's take corporate governance first. It is clear that in the context of AI adoption, business has a responsibility to ingrain ethical behavior. Boards must have the right skill sets to understand what technology is being used in their company, how it's being used and managed, and to ensure that ethics are embedded in corporate behavior in order to fulfill their oversight role. For instance, do they understand the many and varied ways AI can be used and managed? For instance, by their HR department in recruitment and assessment, or in keeping track of employee movements. How many boards have their heads around this range of applications of AI set out by Cognilitica? So there are a number of things boards need to do, uh, need to do beyond complying with data protection regulation. In the workplace, boards need to ensure that they're informed about the implications of the automation of many jobs before uh, deployment of AI solutions takes place, such as what data is being used for training an AI system, the level of potential bias, and whether AI will augment roles or substitute for them. Whatever the scale of introduction of AI, there will be major disruption in the workplace, and concerted retraining to meet demands for new skills will become a major and continual necessity. Understanding the different aspects of business context in which AI can impact is crucial. 
If boards are going to retain stakeholder trust, they also need to adopt an overarching ethics framework, which ensures certain principles on the deployment of AI solutions are followed, such as beneficial purpose, personal privacy, transparency, Transparency of use, the data being used for training, testing or operational inputting does not exhibit bias and that algorithmic decision making is explainable. And as I mentioned earlier, common principles can clearly be derived from the international ethical guidelines I've mentioned and provide a basis for a set of common standards with which business is increasingly expected to comply. And there is also Plenty uh, uh, of corporate guidance out there from some very well respect, respected in, or, uh, organizations such as the ICAW, uh, the accountancy uh, 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 body, the Institute for Business Ethics, investors such as Fidelity and Hermes are now imposing their own governance expectations too. Boards need to be aware of the questions they should ask and the advice they need and from whom. They should consider whether to mainstream oversight of compliance with ethics and values in their audit and risk committee or set up a separate ethics advisory board. In particular, they need to consider what tools they have available in exercising this oversight in terms of AI risk assessment and ethical audit mechanisms. Do they adopt ethics by design, i.e. ex ante verification and or certification, impact assessment, standards for training, testing and redress, self-certification such as kite marking. Uh, it may be that kite marking has a great potential, but is part of the wider agenda of ensuring trustworthiness in AI as a whole. Audit tools to check data sets used uh, in AI and its operations. Boards will also need to ensure that they have the necessary diversity and inclusion in the AI workforce to spot problems of bias in training data and decision making. Is an AI adopting business taking full advantage of regulatory sandboxing, a rapidly growing concept? This means a regulator such as our Financial Conduct Authority or the ICO permitting the testing of a new technology without the threat of regulatory enforcement, but with strict overview and individual formal and informal guidance from the regulator. The truth is, however, that both for the private sector and the government, we do not yet possess really effective tools for assessing compliance, whether of codes, standards or regulation. And it is really heartening and encouraging that our UK representatives uh, uh, at the Council of Europe have been key authors on the policy development group of the Council of Europe's ad hoc AI committee, CAHI, of proposals for compliance tools, adoption uh, and development. This is, however, what Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, said in his book on tools and weapons. Many business leaders are absolutely aware of the need for good corporate behavior. But at the end of the day, ethical principles and good corporate responsibility guidelines, however, may not be enough. However high the standards that are adopted, there is a point at which policymakers may need to consider going beyond voluntary codes of ethics or corporate governance standards for certain sorts of technology, depending on the perceived risk to society. Our first instinct, in my view, should not be to regulate. I'd prefer to see compliance with an ethical code or standards of corporate governance in the first instance, but some areas of AI application may be early candidates for regulation. So there are a number of key questions for policymakers and regulators in making these judgments. What harms from AI are we trying to prevent? When is an ethical framework or regulation or legislation appropriate to prevent those harms? What assessments of conformity or audit mechanisms are appropriate? Which of these mechanisms should be made mandatory? What if any external or independent uh, evaluation uh, uh, or oversight is appropriate? Do we need a cohort of approved auditors? Do the regulators determine this? I know that the accountancy profession, for example, in the UK, is being encouraged to step up to the, the audit plate in this respect. Is there a standard setting body we can rely on? 
There are challenges in terms of how standards could be developed, for instance, regarding training data used, algorithm construction, weighting of di different data inputs, output in terms of accuracy, bias, et cetera. And of course, the IEEE is very active in that area. What consumer or small business redress should there be? Do we need a dedicated ombudsman? Can regulation be a positive for innovation so standards can be set? Autonomous vehicles are, are a good example. Do we need different rules of liability and accountability for AI from normal product and service liability? Can the, prod, uh, the public sector, on the other hand, use its procurement power to ensure that risk is recognized appropriately and voluntary mechanisms are put in place rather than regulation? How do we bring the citizen and the consumer along this journey? But above all, policymakers like business need to understand the language of risk. And we saw that in the EU AI white paper, which kick-started a discussion of risk-based sector-specific regulation. The EU itself in its white paper has adopted the language of risk management in order to determine when the risk of harm is so great that we must regulate. They say a risk-based approach is important to help ensure that the regulatory intervention is proportionate. However, it requires clear criteria to differentiate between the different AI applications, in particular in relation to the question whether or not they are high risk. The determination of what is a high risk AI application should be clear and easily understandable and applicable for all parties concerned. Nevertheless, even if an AI application is not qualified as high risk, it remains entirely subject to already existing EU rules. The feasibility study for regulation of AI, shortly to be agreed and published by uh, CAHI, the Council of Europe, is traveling down the same road. The OECD is considering the same subject through its global parliamentary network. The One World Trust has recently suggested bringing all this together through a UN framework convention on AI, together with a protocol which, provide, which would provide a global legal framework for the regulation of AI together with a monitoring and inspection body. And that is a pretty ambitious vision. Of course, if you aspire to a risk-based regulatory and governance approach, you need to be able to ca calibrate risk. For AI technologies, we need to calibrate the risks of the probability of harm, the likely impact, the importance and sensitivity of use within a particular sector, the risk of non-compliance, and whether a human in the loop mitigates risk to any degree. Now, you can see how this might fit within the wider risk universe, such as this rather splendid categorization by uh, Professor Ortwin Wren, uh, literally opening Pandora's box. At least that's where I place it in this uh, particular uh, categorization scheme. For AI technologies, we need to calibrate the risk of harm, uh, the importance and sensitivity of use within a particular sector, and so on. And that's where the focus of policymakers uh, has recently shifted. And we saw that in the report of the German Data Ethics Commission with its five-point scale uh, of risk, starting with applications with zero or negligible potential for harm, all the way through to applications with an untenable potential for harm. And they suggest regulating at the point, and you'll see that cutoff point, uh, uh, they suggest regulating at the point where there is some potential uh, for harm. And many of us wouldn't necessarily draw the line at that point. One of the key questions, of course, is whether on the, this basis of risk assessment, there are early candidates for regulation. The Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, created in the UK two years ago, has been carrying out research into a number of areas, including online targeted advertising and algorithmic bias, which may lead to regulation. They published snapshot papers on deep fakes and audiovisual uh, disinformation, AI and personal insurance and smart, smart speakers, and voice assistants, and very recently, an AI barometer report. This also discusses risk and regulation and found a common core of risk across sectors. They say, while the top rated risks varied from sector to sector, 
a number of concerns cropped up across most of the contexts we examined. This includes the risks of algorithmic bias, a lack of explainability in algorithmic decision making, and the failure of those operating technology to seek meaningful consent from people to collect, use, and share their data. Significantly, they say the AI barometer highlights examples of promising interventions from regulators, researchers, and industry, which could pave the way for more responsible innovation. The Alan Turing Institute is also working on whether it's possible to establish a set of principles that establish when regulation is appropriate. <clears throat> and now in the UK, we have a newly formed Regulatory Horizons Council, which will be engaged in this area too. Now, a very good example, and Nora mentioned this, of where some of these issues have already arisen, uh, is in the use of live facial recognition technologies, which is becoming widespread. <clears throat> it's unusual for the Metropolitan Police Commissioner to describe a new technology as Orwellian as she did last year, talking about live facial recognition. But now the Met is beginning to adopt it at scale. And Nora mentioned the important Bridges case, in my view, and that of the Science and Technology Select Committee and many other organizations. We need an immediate moratorium on live facial recognition so that we can take stock and then set some regulatory parameters. In addition, over the past few years, we've seen a substantial increase in the adoption of algorithmic decision making and prediction, or ADM, across central and local government in criminal justice and policing. Algorithms for prediction and decision making are already in use. And even though the UK government has developed AI guidelines for the use of algorithms in the public sector, there is no central enforcement mechanism yet, and we need much better oversight of the use of these systems in the public sector and compliance with ethical frameworks. Another high-risk technology which needs to be added to the candidates for regulation is the use of AI applications for recruitment processes, as well as in situations impacting on employees' rights to privacy. And there's also a range of decision making in financial services, which may in the future be considered high risk and candidates for further regulation, such as credit scoring or, or determining insurance premiums by AI systems. But the debate over hard and soft law in this area is by no means concluded. Denmark and a number of other EU member states have recently felt the need to put a stake in the ground, which is what, uh, with what is called a non-paper to the EU Commission over concerns that AI and other digital technologies may be overregulated in the EU's plan for digital regulation with a consequent impact on innovation. And the same arguments are applied uh, to AI regulation. On the other hand, there are enthusiasts for regulation in unlikely places such as the US Congress with a proposed bill to enforce algorithm bias audit, um, which I heard from Congresswoman Clark uh, not very long ago. Now, I haven't mentioned, I haven't mentioned uh, the area of digital competition regulation, but this impacts heavily on AI, in particular in terms of access to data sets. Both Lord Tyree, the former chair of the Competition and Markets Authority, and Professor Furman have spelt out very clearly the challenges of the digital age. One of the big questions is whether to continue to allow big tech to dominate in digital markets, such as social media, e-commerce, search and online advertising, and particularly in their access to data sets. In the UK, the government has set up the Digital Markets Task Force, and I hope that this will lead to a strong digital markets unit in the CMA. In the EU, digital so sovereignty is a hot topic, and it should be here too. So. We're still only in the foothills in talking about where to rely on ethical codes and where we should prescribe better corporate governance or go the whole hog and regulate. Whether in the public or private sector, however, the cardinal principle must be that AI needs to be our servant, not our master. Going forward, policymakers and regulators need in achieving that aim to recognize that they have a duty to ensure that whatever solution they adopt, they recognize ascending degrees of risk and the policies and solutions are calibrated accordingly. Thank you.
Tim, thank you so much for what was a impressively comprehensive overview of very many, very many issues. And I, I'm so I'm so glad that your your lecture did exactly what we were hoping would kick off and inform the rest of the two days in that you didn't focus on just regulation or just ethical frameworks for for governance of AI, but you spoke about the merits and challenges of both and also of their relationship and, and interplay. And I think that's, that's a, a hugely significant question because often in many of these debates, um, as you mentioned in your talk, uh, there's a very polarized narrative. AI is either going to save us or it's going to become our master and, and doom will inevitably follow. So this doesn't get us anywhere, of course, because it's not a constructive narrative and it doesn't deal with the, the pre-existing issues that we have. Um, if I could be permitted to ask you maybe a, a couple of quick questions, since we have a few minutes before the break, I was wondering whether, whether you think, you know, quite sweeping broad definitions of AI are helping this policymaking dialogue. You hear a lot of people, not so much uh, lawyers, so I would include myself in this, but you hear you know, more computer scientists and experts talking about soft AI and hard AI and using that as a metric to talk about high risk AI versus low risk AI and also about the sophistication of the AI. So hard AI being the AI that will be completely autonomous and, you know, in that, you know, polarized narrative you mentioned, you know, will have, will have, you know, unreined power over how it interacts with society. Do you, do you think that particular narrative is is useful in terms of helping with public understanding and, and trustworthiness of this conversation? I think people can get incredibly hung up on definitions. Uh, and that's, you know, I've seen <laughs> I've seen the Council of Europe uh, shy away from being over definitional, even when they're talking about uh, the feasibility of regulation. So, uh, you know, at close quarters, I think trying to get overly definitional is a mistake. That's why I much prefer the risk uh, framework, because what you're looking at is impact. You're not, you know, just sim I mean, so that you could have uh, actually quite low levels of autonomy or autonomous AI, um, but the impact could be could be very high. Uh, you know, this isn't all a question of, oh, it's the, it's the AI taking off without any human control in every case. You might well have, uh, um, you know, live facial recognition, which, you know, is under, is under human control, you know, but nevertheless, it, it's being used for the wrong purpose and it's being very intrusive. It's uh, uh, impinging on people's privacy and so on. So that's why I much prefer to look at the risk profile. But I think within that, then you need to do what the uh, Center for Data Ethics and Innovation and people like the Ada Lovelace and so on have been looking at, which is, you know, particular impacts in sectors uh, 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 and, and certain technologies or applications of technology. So, you know, I mean, I love the, uh, the very, very simple definition that Brad Smith gives in Tools and Weapons, which is, you know, software that learns from experience. But, you know, I've tried to persuade people to adopt a very simple um, definition of AI, uh, but sadly, uh, I haven't been very successful. And I don't know whether Brad Smith has actually persuaded everybody that that's the way forward. So everybody's going to have their own way of looking at this. Uh, and so that's why we need to move on from there. Yes. No, I think you raised some excellent points about if there are going to be definitions, that there should be clarity around those definitions and certainly the, the scope of their, their application. So if I were to, quite unfairly, I might add, Tim, uh, give a very quick response to your title, AI Time to Regulate, uh, my, my understanding from the presentation is that your position is, is a qualified one, uh, which is very much in line with what we've both uh, mentioned is a greater need for nuance in these conversations. And, you know, to, to that end, how do you feel about the EU regulatory approach that effectively is moving towards and is already, when you look at the general data protection regulation, for instance, it already takes a risk 
faith-based approach as part of its increasingly more you know, co-regulatory approach, you know, to involve industry and data controllers more in how they govern and regulate themselves. Do you think there's there's a particular area where automated decision making, for instance, you know, falling within that, you know, broad umbrella of AI? Do you think there's there are particular areas where a law like the GDPR falls very short or is unhelpful in this space? Yes, I, I, I think that's uh, 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 correct, I, because it, it is not all about data. Uh, I mean, the GDPR, of course, is actually rather a, uh, a it's a good piece of legislation, but it's it has never been completely clear, you know, on the automated decision making front uh, that it really uh, uh, covers enough. And I would like to see uh, particularly in the case of intrusive technologies. And, you know, I think I'm in pretty good company because, you know, we've seen uh, 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 Big Brother Watch, Ada Lovelace, you know, we've seen quite a number of, of different organizations rooting for the same thing, even the, uh, uh, you know, the the uh, the camera commissioner, so to speak, the and biometrics, I think he's got a joint title nowadays, uh, and his outgoing uh, uh, valedictum uh, said that's what he'd like to see, um, which is, you know, there are certain of those t very intrusive technologies where we need much greater transparency, explainability, and so on. You can't just simply say, oh, this is implied consent and this is for a particular purpose under GDPR and so on. AI is, is different from data. We don't know, for instance, whether in the future machine Machine learning is going to be the predominant AI technology. You know, we may develop other more probabilistic forms of AI, uh, which don't have so much uh, requirement for so much data. But nevertheless, the same issues will apply in terms of the ethics uh, to be applied. And they're not so they're not all about data. Um, it's, it is about impact. Um, it, it, it is about uh, the outcomes, in which may be biased. It, it is about some of the black box issues as well. So, uh, you know, those are the issues for regulators. And that's why, I, as I said, I think there are some early candidates uh, for regulation and LFR, deep fakes, you know, um, uh, employer use of, uh, of LFR and so on, uh, I think are, you know, candidates. And also, government governance of AI algorithmic decision making and prediction, in my view, is far too lax. And I'm hoping that uh, as part of a national data strategy, we'll get some way towards that. But again, it doesn't, it won't solve the whole, all the issues within government about decision making by algorithm. Thank you so much, Tim. So I've just, there is this, you know, absolutely fascinating, and this is what, you know, an organizer at a conference always wants to see, you know, this fantastic stream of consciousness that your talk has raised happening in, in the sidebar here. And if I just quickly just take from uh, what one of the issues that one of the attendees has raised, um, which I think I would agree with, is a very good one by Marion Oswald. She raises the point that, you know, while there's, you know, considerable merit to a lot of the various um, ethical frameworks for AI at the moment, that they're, they're incredibly high level. So you're almost falling into, you know, the same challenges that you have with some regulation that you have, you know, significant ambiguity. And I'm wondering whether if perhaps, you know, we had ethical frameworks that were more specific, more focused, would they be of a more significant contribution given that we already have some very well established high level principles that relate to processing data not just personal data as you mentioned quite rightly the lines are very much blurring between personal data and non-personal data and irrespective of whether it's personal or not there can still be as you noted huge impacts in terms of various rights not just privacy but quality discrimination and i think you made the very good point about mentioning that competition law also has a significant role to play here so i mean do you think that going forward there are ethical frameworks that will become more prescriptive more sector specific uh, yes i think that, i think that's that's correct but again i come back to this point people say oh there are lots of uh, uh, well accepted frameworks and so on. I don't think that is the case. I don't think yet we have boiled down all those ethical frameworks into a well understood uh, uh, set of ethics. I would love our Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation to say 
actually, we think there is a kind of horizontal set of principles that we think can be applied across sector, then that gives you the, in a sense, the license then to start looking at, well, what is appropriate sector by sector? And you're absolutely right. I don't think that you could have a, uh, uh, if you were implying that, I don't, I don't think it's possible to have regulation that is so to that is totally cross-sectoral. You know, I think you, that's why the risk uh, uh, mechanism is so important because it has to be sector by sector, technology by technology. And this is the big challenge we have at the moment. It, you know, it, it's a horrible word, but people incessantly over the last year or so have been talking about operationalizing the ethics. Well, that's the challenge now. And, you know, that's why the Council of Europe has written their feasibility study. Uh, you know, they've made some suggestions about where we need to regulate and the risk profile and so on. This is what the EU is the next step, you know, for their proposals coming forward. And, uh, you know, that's going to be extremely interesting. And, you know, uh, 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 people in other parts of the forest are doing quite a lot on this as well. I mean, the, the, the New York, the, uh, uh, the Congress, the US Congress bill uh, on, uh, you know, algorithmic audit. Very interesting. You know, how widespread should that be? Just the use in the public sector or, you know, I mean, we'll be picking up ideas across the board, but um, I, I'm, I'm not really a big fan of kind of regulating on a one size fits all basis. Uh, I'm in favor of having a common set of ethics, which you then, and you know, my work in the education field uh, convinces me that each sector has a particular set of challenges uh, that need to be addressed, not simply saying, right, guys, you're all under, in the same bag, so to speak. Well, Tim, there, there is so much more to say and so many uh, issues to respond to in um, the fantastic lecture you've delivered this morning. But I'm going to put us on pause for now, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful for the fact that you'll also be joining us for the keynote panel so that we can continue this, this conversation with you and, and all the very pertinent and very timely points that you've raised in your annual lecture. So thanks to everyone for joining us for the keynote this morning. Um, it has kicked off some fantastic debates already, as you can see in the fantastic stream of conversations happening there in the chat bar. And I hope you can all join us and be back here for 11.30 to hear from our keynote panel. Tim, thank you so much again, and I'll see you all shortly. Okay, well, everyone following that excellent and thought-provoking presentation by Tim, I'm delighted to introduce you to our keynote panel this morning. Our first speaker is Ellis Parry. Ellis was appointed in November 2019 as the Information Commissioner's first data ethics advisor, responsible for articulating the regulator's view on the interplay between the inherently ethical principles of the GDPR and the Data Protection Act of 2018 and the growing field of data ethics. Prior to this, Ellis was the global lead for data privacy at BP, responsible for maintaining its binding corporate rules and designing its GDPR global change program. Before that, Ellis was global privacy counsel at the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca, where negotiating the relationship between medical research ethics and the data protection principles was a regular and constant feature of his practice. Ellis is a solicitor with 19 years PQE, an MBA, and a contributing author to Sweet and Maxwell's Data Protection Law and Practice, fourth and fifth editions and its standalone guide to the GDPR. His experience encompasses all aspects of information rights law with a particular focus and interest on ethical implications of big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and their intersection with data protection laws. Following Ellis is Dr. Joanna Bryson. Joanna is professor of ethics of technology and of ethics and technology, excuse me, at the Hershey School. Her research focuses on the impact of technology on human cooperation and AI and ICT governance. From 2002 to 2019, she was on the computer science faculty at the University of Bath. She has also been affiliated with the Department of Psychology at Harvard University, the Department of Anthropology at the University of Oxford, the School of Social Sciences at the University of Mannheim, and the Princeton Center for Information Technology Policy. During her PhD, she observed the confusion generated by anthropomorphized AI, leading to her first AI, AI ethics publication, Just Another Artifact in 1998. 
In 2010, she co-authored the first national level AI ethics policy, the UK's principles of robotics. She holds degrees in psychology and artificial intelligence from the University of Chicago, the University of Edinburgh and MIT. And last but not at all least, our final panelist and discussant on this keynote panel this morning is Carly Kind. Carly is the director of the Ada Lovelace Institute, an independent research institute and deliberative body, a remit to ensure data and AI work for people and society. A human rights lawyer and leading authority on the intersection of technology policy and human rights, Carly has advised industry, government and nonprofit organizations on digital rights, privacy and data protection and corporate accountability in the technology sphere. She has worked with the European Commission, the Council of Europe, numerous UN bodies and a range of civil society organizations. She was formerly legal director of Privacy International, an NGO dedicated to promoting data rights and governance. So in terms of format for this keynote panel, each panelist will speak for approximately 10 minutes. We will then have a discussion joined by Tim and we would welcome any questions for the, from attendees for the panel. A break for lunch will then follow at 12.45 p.m. with our first academic panel beginning at 2 p.m. on new governance for new technologies, which I hope you can all join us for. So now I will invite Ellis to begin our keynote panel. Ellis, whenever you're ready, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and some opening marks, uh, remarks uh, just to reflect upon uh, some of the content of what I think Lord Clement Jones said. I hope I have interpreted his comments correctly. Um, but I agree it's helpful in this space to think about ascending levels of risk, impact, harm. And I think that's permissible under the existing um, GDPR with its principles-based approach. I know that there is there is a counter argument that the GDPR leaves almost too much to the imagination, perhaps, and that it doesn't offer sufficient desirable specificity, um, which is where I agree with um, Lord Clement Jones' view that codes of conduct, which are sector specific, uh, could play a very valuable role in making organisations accountable, um, helping them to build and maintain the consumer and citizen trust that I think we're all recognising is becoming one of the golden threads uh, in this area, in this debate. Uh, but of course, AI, which involves the processing of personal data, is already governed by existing law. Uh, the question raised, I think, is whether it's governed adequately and efficiently. Is it effective? So the ICO wants to be a clear and uh, credible voice in the debate, advocating for citizens and consumers' information rights um, without seeking to, or very importantly, uh, being seen to uh, try to regulate purely ethical considerations, which are, of course, outside of our statutory remit. However, um, the ICO's information rights strategic plan articulates the role of a regulatory environment promoting fairness, transparency, accountability, and how that can um, encourage ethical innovation in the AI world and build people, again, consumer citizen trust that organizations across the whole of the economy, so public, private, and third sector, are handling their personal data appropriately. During a period of rapid change and novel processing possibilities, viewing ideas about how personal data may be processed, including data which, as, uh, as I think we were exploring uh, earlier, it can sometimes be difficult to discern whether or not it is in fact personal and therefore protected uh, by the GDPR or not, or whether indeed it is qualifies as sensitive personal data or not. Viewing these possibilities through an ethical lens, I believe can provide a consistency of approach uh, of how fundamental charter and human rights should be safeguarded through this period of undoubted rapid and disruptive change. Organisations asking themselves ethical questions and answering them uh, can help them understand how to, and I desperately tried to re-edit uh, this word because I'm going to use the word operationalize, which I know Lord Clement Jones <laughs> said was not one of his favourites. Um, I will try uh, not to use that word again, but it might just pop out because it's one of my favourites, um, but can help them understand how to operationalize correctly the GDPR throughout their business operations as part of their legal accountability obligation under the GDPR. 
The appointment by the Information Commissioner of a data ethics advisor, so me in this instance, uh, responsible for articulating the interplay between the inherently uh, ethical principles of the GDPR and the emerging field of data ethics, including in the AI field, is evidence that the UK regulator is sensitive to the new demands novel technologies are placing on how black and white letter law should be interpreted by controllers and indeed, of course, processors now in scope under the GDPR. These demands are potentially as acute in the private sector as they are in the public and third sector. However, the public sector, uh, from my uh, reading around this topic, and I think from some of the content um, uh, in uh, the previous presentation, show that the public sector may already have more and more mature tools in its arsenal with which to meet these challenges, um, having had to adapt decision-making processes to the direct application of the Human Rights Act and Equalities Act already. The Committee for Standards in Public Life published a report in February on artificial intelligence and public standards, which found that the UK's regulatory and governance framework for the use of artificial intelligence by the public sector remains a work in progress. I think that's echoed in the content of the first lecture. The existing framework not being sufficiently strong to safeguard adequately against the risks posed by mass adoption of AI to deliver public services in all instances and in all use cases. Again, back to that concept of a, an ascending scale of risk. This conclusion, I believe, can reasonably uh, be inferred to include the private sector too, given the scale of its processing and personal data collection and sharing can in some instances begin to rival um, local and central governments. However, the report does stop short of recommending the creation of an omnipotent and new AI regulator, which I think is also congruent with the comments of uh, Lord Clement Jones's remarks. However, the report does go on to say that the risks would be better managed if the government issued a single, comprehensive, well-publicised, authoritative set of ethical principles for the whole public sector to use when deploying artificial intelligence. These principles could be used as a guiding light, I would submit, a north star, if you, like, if you will, uh, by the private and third sector when considering how to build ethical decision-making practices into their processes in a repeatable and measurable way as they learn not merely to talk the talk, where I sense some of the frustration is uh, currently, but walk the walk. So better clarity of which ethical principles apply and recommendations on how to apply them is much needed because the use of AI will fundamentally change how services are delivered to the public including blurring the lines of the role between the public, private and third sectors in the delivery of services to the public. And again, to go back to one of the themes which I think uh, is emerging or will certainly emerge, uh, the blurring of the lines between what is personal data and what are not personal data, including whether or not they are sensitive. There are currently three sets of ethical principles endorsed by the government, um, although as Lord Clement Jones's slide showed, with to great effect, there's a plethora of materials out there. We have the DCMS's uh, data ethics framework, the OECD principles of AI, and uh, as I think Lord Clement Jones referred to, the Office for AI and the Government Digital Service partnered with the Alan Turing Institute and published a guide to using artificial intelligence in the public sector. Now, how all of these work together, um, if at all, is not entirely clear. Uh, the confusion, therefore, may hinder their adoption and adaption, and uh, that is not particularly desirable at what I think we can all agree is a critical juncture. Further, any inconsistency, it strikes me, may begin to lead to some form of undesirable forum shopping uh, between the three officially um, uh, endorsed ethical principles. Uh, one comprehensive set of authoritative ethical principles, if it could be reached and arrived upon, could form the basis of sector-specific codes of conduct as advanced, as I mentioned, as a good idea by Lord Clement Jones. And as is envisaged under the GDPR, codes of conduct do play um, a very um, prominent role in the black and white letter of that law. So this does appear to be within touching distance, um, or certainly from my point of view, I believe it's within touching distance, as all of the ethical frameworks that I've just referenced 
um, all incorporate the concepts of fairness, transparency, and accountability, which of course are core data protection principles and therefore within the purview and remit of the Information Commissioner's Office. The Global Privacy Assembly, chaired by Elizabeth Demon, issued a declaration on ethics and data protection. The European Data Protection Supervisor has a five-year rolling program on how data ethics can strengthen the data protection principles application. The French Supervisor Authority, the CNIL, has issued a report on ethical issues within machine learning. And finally, the Hong Kong Privacy Commissioner has also introduced an ethical accountability framework. The work already done by the data protection regulators around the world in this space is illustrative of the travel of direction and um, is underpinned by the communality of language and purpose behind the ethical considerations and the inherently ethical GDPR principles is my submission. So it's my job to explore that intersection and the role the ICO should play in that space in more depth. To that end, I will be opening a public consultation seeking views on the role data ethics can play uh, with the GDPR before the end of the year. So please watch out for that and share your thoughts and experiences when that goes live on the Information Commissioner's website. I should stress that these considerations um, or operationalising ethics are not uh, the sole purview of central local government or indeed just large corporate entities, but the small to medium sized enterprises which make up the majority of the European economy are firmly in scope too. The debate sometimes does seem to be had and monopolised by the larger players in the market. There are lots of great materials out there um, and available for free to the SME community to help them structure their thinking in this space and I would really endorse they take that opportunity. I've done some work with the Institute for Business Ethics and I'm familiar with the Open Data Institute's Ethical Canvas too. They're great tools, um, good maps to help you plot a course in this area if you are a representative of an SME. So my closing thought is that many organisations, in fact every organisation I've ever worked in, has a code of conduct, stated values and behaviours, including in relation to data protection and privacy. These codes of conduct usually form part of a corporate social responsibility program, which themselves may sit alongside or otherwise incorporate data protection compliance programs now as necessitated under the GDPR. So perhaps uh, this is the moment to take an holistic assessment about what all of these strands of good organizational intention and endeavor are trying to achieve and how they're going about that and how that could be done possibly better in a more coherent way. Because I believe all of that good work that these corporates and the public and, and third sector have already undertaken, all of that good work represents a platform or building blocks towards an ethical decision-making um, operationalization, there's that word again, um, process-based governance framework. It may be less time consuming and less hard work than it appears to optimize everything that already exists and just possibly reshape it into a GDPR compliant ethical decision making process, answering the legal and yet also moral call for sustainable personal data processing practices, which maximize the digital dividend for the benefit of all. So I think those are my, um, that's the conclusion of my introductory remarks. Okay, so I think Nora told us we had to just remember our, our order, which is a, a stunning amount of. Uh, I think you are next. <laughs> and, am I right? I should go. If nobody, yeah, I think so. me, I'm going to do this. Well, I'm going to stop. So if you don't go, <laughs> I was listening. <laughs> Okay, great. Okay, well, thanks. Those those, those comments were great uh, too. And, and although I was running a little bit of uh, side commentary on on uh, uh, I'm so bad this, on Lord Clement Jones' uh, work, I hugely respect him and uh, and and agree. We're much in alignment. But there's um, my 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 comments are about uh, you know the pragmatic uh, aspects of AI and the rule of law. And, I, and I'm going to start out uh, talking about um, uh, this regulation issue. I, my first note was to talk about the fact that AI is not a new novel legal entity that we need to, to uh, 
somehow incorporate. It's not another uh, location of responsibility. Um, but given that we already uh, are not kind of going down that, nobody's talking about AI legal persons right now so far in this meeting, uh, let, me, let me take that in the direction that, that we were just going, in fact. Um, first of all, with respect to uh, presentation, I never say that AI did something or AI may come to learn how to do or AI is evolving. Even though I would normally use that metaphorical language, there is so much confusion in the general public about this that I really, really try to make sure that we talk about the actual responsible entities. And the responsible entities are individual humans and or corporations or governments or other sort of uh, human assemblages. So it's important to understand that we can only be responsible to each other. We can only hold each other to account. That's what our legal system has set up to do. So uh, accountability is something that, that has to go to the responsible agents, which are always human and or, or their agencies. And, um, and transparency is the only thing that we can ask from uh, the systems. And, and of course, again, it's not that we're asking the systems, it's that what we must require to be in the systems. And the level of transparency that we need is driven by our needs for accountability. So, so coming back to the, uh, the comments, uh, both on uh, regulation um, and also, so that my, I, I said I would, I would throw another framing in here. I think this is important. Um, I think of our, first of all, we're, we're full, we're, we live in a regulated system. The AI is fully subject to, to regulation now. It is a manufactured artifact. It, there's product law that should be and is not yet to date adequately being applied and enforced on artificial intelligence. And I totally agree uh, with, with, with Lord, Lord Clement Jones on um, this point about general definitions, I make one that's even more general. I, artificial intelligence is any artifact that takes context and generates action, all right? So I don't care about whether you use machine learning to program it or not. And, and more generally, when I, talk, when I advise governments on, on uh, legislation, I say forget about that even. Just apply the, the existing laws and expectations of, man, of manufacturers to software developers, right? And, that, and that, that's, that's the core thing I try to get at with respect to that. The fact is that, and this is some mistake that was in the European white paper, it repeatedly says that AI uh, increases opaqueness. AI can be used to increase opaqueness. You can use machines to disintermediate the humans and to, and to cloak, you can delete what's happened, but it's digital, it's digital technology. It could equally be used to keep better records and to, and to be completely transparent in our dealings. So, so it's actually, it's set up to do that, uh, particularly if we pay adequate care to cybersecurity and immutable records. So the digital is a domain where it's very easy to change things and delete things. And so that's why we have to focus on, you cannot separate AI from cybersecurity, especially if you're really talking about the rule of law. All right. So I've already mentioned properly applied, I believe software is a product, if you think about it and, it, and also even if that product uh, provides a service. So we should be thinking about that. Oh, and let me come back to that with respect to proportionality too. Um, I absolutely agree that it's really important that we do this risk-based thing. I just learned this about this from Karen Young yesterday, the, the technical legal aspects of this. That again, the problem with the white paper is that it, it says it wants to do risk-based and then it turns it on its head by saying that there's this binary, uh, that, that you can binary discriminate between risky and non-risky. And even if we went to the five levels of the, the German government has proposed, I, I still don't think that's adequate. We, we cannot, um, just because we have AI involved doesn't mean that we can perfectly predict outcomes. And like the, one of the biggest hazards that we've seen in AI in the last few decades, and we are talking about an existing threat that we just hadn't properly identified before, all right? So one of the big things was people liking kittens, okay? It wasn't something. And who has been injecting this language? I was wondering this, like who is saying this stuff about opaqueness of AI and, and uh, oh, binary risks? Guess what? Then I'm on a panel last week with a representative, senior representative uh, for like uh, Switzerland, Austria, and uh, Germany of Google. And Google says, oh, we love this binary definition. And by the way, let, us, let me tell you what high risk is. It means it's a machine learning algorithm that's new. 
like 24 months or maybe maybe 18 months. What are they doing there? They're trying to say, don't regulate our primary product, which has always been AI, right? So, so just do not accept this definitions uh, uh, munching, right? It, it's, it's a means by which very powerful entities, and they're wrong. Again, the other thing I hate about uh, using regulation, it should not be used as a pejorative, right? All these people were coming up to me. I was very active uh, talking to Google policy around the time that the GDPR was coming in. And I was in London and people were saying, you know, everybody's going to stop doing business in the EU. And, and not just Google. This is not just Google. You know, Microsoft, big people are coming up and saying this. Not only to me, other of my colleagues were hearing this routinely. And then, of course, the next day they were all there. And then six months later, they're like, wow, it's actually easier to do business in the EU now. It's like, what do you think? The EU, sorry, sorry topic, but it was a trading block. It is a trading block. I'm still living in a trading block, okay? Of course, the GDPR is mostly about making it easier to, to, to improve the, the digital economy. Regulation, most regulation that is specific, specific to the tech sector is up regulation. It's massive investment. Why are you saying you don't want that? And why are you fighting against something that has already been demonstrated to benefit you? The same thing is happening now with the DSA. And I bet at the end of the day, the DSA is going to make it better, a better, more stable um, and, and a more and a more governable uh, platform for all of us that's actually going to increase our economic well-being as well as provide us with more protections. All right, sorry to rant. Um, I, yeah, so I want to go now to another area, which I have a forthcoming paper. It'll be out apparently the 11th of December. Um, people don't always realize that, that I'm working in this area too. If we're talking about the disruption of the rule of law, then we need to look at things like inequality, as I just mentioned, okay? And, and I think that this is something that, that uh, it's, again, it's not specific to the digital sector. It has to do with that we haven't gotten a handle on how to, how to deal with transnational uh, commerce. I, it was a problem that led up to the First World War and the massive inequalities and the massive instability of the late, you can read Churchill writing when he was still a liberal, you know, in the, in the, in the late 19th century about what is going on, why is it getting harder to govern. We're in that period again because again, I think what happens is technology shifts. All of a sudden some people get uh, more monopolistic power and we need to reinvent governance to handle that and address that. I don't mean totally reinvent. I mean, we just need to uh, find better ways to then deal with these new power sources and, and uh, regulate and redistribute uh, the outcomes of, of what can indeed be very beneficial. So I think it's important to recognize uh, that, 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 that a lot of the problems that we're uh, attributing to technology are a consequence of, of, of economic inequalities, and we do need to think about the digital tax. And, and, and I, again, I wouldn't call it digital. I would apply it to transnational companies in general so that we can get the digital on side. Again, help them see that investing in the infrastructure is a good way to, uh, to both you know, help their society, uh, uh, help their customers and their, and their employees, and also uh, have political power without just randomly hiring people for no reason. Um, the other thing is uh, we need to think about, I, but, but it is digital. So, so there, it is communication technology and that is probably also changing governance. I think one of the problems that's made government harder and the, and the uh, application of the rule of law is, uh, is the fact that you can no longer stabilize policies easily because it's constantly being observed. People are constantly looking for ways to, to I mean, look at what's happening in the United States right now. So that people are constantly looking for and innovating new ways uh, to, to disrupt uh, the governance. So we need to make uh, what's happening more transparent. Also, the good stuff, make, make, make that clearer so we can get more support on that. And, and, the, and, and so the inequality is highly correlated with political polarization. It's highly correlated with the kinds of instability we've seen. So we need to think again about wage support. And this is my, I'm coming to my final points here. The, one of the things about the, the artificial intelligence in particular, uh, not, that's not digital, that really is special to AI, is that we do make people more exchangeable by making it faster, by enhancing their capacities and making it faster for them to train into new skills. So that does indicate we may need to worry about things like wage support, about social mobility, and making sure that people feel included in society. Otherwise, again, that's another challenge to the rule of law. Okay, thank you. 
Joanna, thank you so much for covering, um, just like Ellis, a huge amount of, of ground in, in really no no time at all. Um, I you know I much regret at times having this like ten minute limitation for a keynote panelist because they have so many significant points to address. Um, so just a slight change in format for everyone because Joanna can't stay with us for the entire period of this panel. So hopefully- no, no, no. I can stay through this panel. I just can't come back this afternoon what you'd asked us to do. Right, okay. Well, yeah. oh, oh, I see, I see. Well, you know what, since we've interrupted, let, let, let's just keep going for a couple of minutes. And I would really like if Tim would be happy to respond to a point that emerged from both Ellis's presentation and also Joanna's, which is the fact that we have this, basically this, this deluge of ethical frameworks. And I, I'm very curious, you know, to know how, how many have there been, Joanna, since oh. your 2010 instrument? Oh, I mean, oh, oh, us as British people. Of course, I only have a British passport because I wanted an EU passport, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, but, but ours, I, yeah, the, um, the, I think there's been around 100, 120. It depends how you count now. And again, not every a lot of corporations have different things. But I, I, I really, I loved what Alice said about um, that the British government has has recognized three, and I think that's important. I, I think that uh, they under recognize the the work that they've done through the EPSRC mm. and the AHRC, which together were the sponsors of the the British uh, principles of robotics. But nevertheless, I think all the almost all the the best things from that are in the OECD. Uh, principles. And so uh, recognizing that it's the peak is important. I'm more worried about those other two. That that, that one's just, a, it's more of a vision. So it has no enforcement. The enforcement will come from things like the the, the Digital Service Act. And, and I believe the Digital Service Act is going to be uh, split up into something called the Digital Ma Management Act or something. But anyway, there, there's going to be now two of these coming out very, very soon and one like in a month or so. And that's going to, uh, again, like the GDPR, reframe things down at this level of what is actually the law, what is actually what is actually enforceable. But I do uh, totally agree with some of the comments by both of the previous speakers about needing agencies, uh, needing enough capacity to do the enforcement, but we also need to see the political will, even where there it has been an adequate means to do this. We need political will and the resources for the for the government to be able to do this. Yes. So just following on from that and connecting the points that you raised, Joanna, and that Ellis raised, and then if I could maybe uh, seek Tim's response to this, is the fact that um, a lot of the conversation and points raised so far focus have focused on one stage of the overall governance cycle, which is the development of new standards, which of course is hugely significant and underpins the entire governance cycle. But it is one stage of a cycle that in order to be in any way meaningful or adequate or effective inherently depends on the other stages of the cycle also being adequate and effective and i think both you both both speakers particularly um joanna and ellis touched on the fact that there are and I think your phrase, Ellis, was a guiding light for the public sector in terms of this new comprehensive set of principles that should be developed in, as part of one of the recommendations from the report this year from the Committee of Standards. It's a guiding light, but how do we get this guiding light to underpin implementation and where does this get enforced and how do we ensure oversight of this if we lack a centralized oversight body and i know ellis you're quite right in raising the point that codes of practice under the gdpr would mean that you have the ico as an oversight body in that space but i think in reality there is a really huge challenge here for the resources and the budget of the ICO in that data protection and the GDPR has been a massive focus for compliance in AI governance in terms of the regulation. But as you both mentioned, and Tim as well, there are so many other pieces of legislation that have not been given any kind of equal consideration. Product liability, competition law, there are so many pieces of legislation that really haven't been given the same level of consideration. And the point related to this is the fact that Joanna mentioned and her advice to current governments, just 
enforce and comply with all of the pre-existing legislation that you have in your country that link in to the use of AI, whatever that particular type of AI it is, as you rightly mentioned, Joanne, it's not just machine learning. Machine learning is just one particular form. So Tim, if I could ask you now, before we move on to Hamid's comments and also Carly, what do you think is the best way forward in terms of improving enforcement mechanisms and oversight in this space? Thank you, uh, Nora. <clears throat> I, I, I was really interested to hear what uh, Ellis and Joanna have had to say. I thought Ellis, um, perhaps, perhaps I would say this as an op opposition um, peer, but I, I think he gives slightly much too much credit to our government, really. Um, it's all very well uh, to think that we've got sort of these mechanisms like a data ethics framework uh, in place and the AI procurement guidelines and so on. But the fact is the compliance mechanisms aren't adequate uh, and uh, the ICO's uh, writ does not run in the mandatory way across government that it does in the private sector. So, um, uh, and, and that was illustrated and Ellis illustrated himself. So there was a slight contradiction there that the, the Committee of Standards in Public Life uh, you know, uh, were pretty critical. I mean, Lord Evans's report uh, w was a really important piece of work. And, you know, we haven't really had an adequate response to that, quite honestly. Uh, so I'd like to see much stronger uh, compliance uh, from the centre. Um, and I do take the point, you know, that uh, 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 there are lots of other bits of legislation, but, you know, nevertheless, you need to see this in a holistic way, I think, uh, when you're dealing with new technology. Uh, and, uh, you know, OK, yes, we've got to make sure that um, we understand that we're not over regulating. But for instance, you know, uh, the CDEI, which, you know, the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation, the, the answer lies in the title, was meant to really, in my view, set out a framework right from the very beginning. But, you know, it's all very well, therefore, for Ellis to say we've got three uh, sets of uh, principles. I'd like to see a single set that is applicable both to government and the private sector in an overarching way. And if even if they just said, oh, let's take the G20 or the OECD guidelines, I'd be a very happy person, you know, um, uh, uh, because then we would have a very clear uh, descending a uh, uh, set of principles that we knew that uh, was generally expected and therefore if there wasn't compliance or if the risks uh, were intolerable that therefore we would start thinking about regulation and you know uh, uh, equality I mean I absolutely uh, take what uh, Joanna said um, about the risks of you know exclusion digital divides all that uh, sort of area. Now, you know, it's all very well, we've got legislation on equalities and so on, but this kind of societal approach is, is far beyond the bounds of, of legislation. So there are some things that are going to be quite difficult to legislate for, but in policy terms, you need to think about it. So, uh, you know, actually our government mechanisms are not adequate and we need to have a much, you know, we need a cabinet committee or something of that sort that actually uh, really takes a holistic view of all of this. And you're quite right. There are, if you like, missing links at different points. Um, but that doesn't mean to say I'm still not going to uh, take on board the point that we need to have a kind of regulatory regime that's one size fits all. That's what I, I do not believe that. I think we need to get the different regulators really engaged. And the CDI is the best person to keep them engaged. As Ellis knows, he works very closely with them. Uh, uh, and, and the Turing in terms of the technical uh, tools, um, you know, we can really do stuff. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, I, I have to say, I really, I really am taken aback by your uh, enthusiasm and, uh, and ambition for the Centre for Data and Ethics and Innovation. I think, of course, that they have a hugely significant role to play in coordinating the collaboration of the relevant regulatory oversight authorities in this space. Again, I would I would highlight the fact that the CDEI is a, a very small public body. And I, again, would say that in order to fulfill that particular aim that you have set out, which I think is a, a very legitimate one, they would have to have a dramatic increase in their resources in terms of being able to fulfill that role going forward. 
But before I say anything more about that... All right, you'll see they, they're recruiting. If you look, <laughs> I think only yesterday, they yeah. are recruiting very heavily. So yeah. actually, I think that may be coming about. Well, I am I'm so delighted to see it getting that uh, support. And I really welcome all the future work um, that the CDI delivers going forward. And I just wonder uh, whether, whether Ellis would be open to perhaps commenting or responding to that point that you know of of this of the various frameworks that are now available and that are applicable to various software development and the role of ai do you think there are any particular frameworks for software development specifically in the internet of things and human data interaction that would be of particular relevance to computer engineers in terms of its accessibility or its focus. Yeah, I think um, you're absolutely right. You were talking earlier about the point, the development life cycle that we're at, which was development and that people, there is an appetite to move beyond that into implementation. But certainly in the work that the Information Commissioner's Office has done in the AI auditing framework and in the um, uh, explainability uh, report, we do talk about the fact that um, the privacy by design component of the of the GDPR has to be built in and in the minds of the people who are sitting down and creating these things from the get-go. So not only do the procurement people um, have a role when they're procuring uh, particular AI systems to think about um, the ethical component of that uh, procurement, not only in, in the public sector, but also the private sector, they need to be thinking about it as it is being built, because as we all know, it's very difficult um, and expensive and time consuming to try and retrospectively refit things things um, to make them better than rather have them um, work from the get-go, if you like, be privacy preserving according to the data protection and uh, by design um, principle from, from the get-go. So uh, I'm not aware that there are uh, particular um, frameworks which have any more currency or are any more popular um, than others. Obviously, I've read a lot of them and I find some of them better than others, shall we say that? And there is, if you go looking for them, a lot of really good, freely available staff. So that is, uh, I would exhort uh, uh, organizations to do a little bit of homework, look at all the free staff um, that is out there, which is of a high quality and read it. And going back to uh, my remarks, think about how that can be repurposed for your organization within your sector, within your corporate social responsibility program and the public statements that you make about how you behave. Think about how that can be filleted in to all of the good work that you're doing and then take it to the next level by, I'm going to use the word operationalize, uh, by operationalizing it appropriately I'm a huge fan of codes of conducts and kind of kite marks and certifications, and they have a role within the GDPR. I'm, I'm surprised that not more industry um, sectors have come forward and said to the ICO, here is a draft code that we're interested in um, cooperating with you in. Uh, and I think that would be hugely beneficial particularly in this space, obviously the codes of conduct and certifications under the GDPR are not limited to the AI world, but I think they would be really, really usefully deployed um, within this space where that um, AI is crunching on, on personal data. Um, but there is an outfit called Petras, which is the National Centre of Excellence for IoT Systems Cy Cybersecurity, which actually is headed by UCL, but Imperial is a very strong part of that as well. I think it's about 16 universities. Um, uh, they've got funding from UKRI. And this is one of the things that they are, you know, very heavily working on. And uh, very sensibly, they started off talking to the insurance industry. And they've done some very good work with Lloyd's, sponsored by Lloyd's and others uh, in the industry. Uh, because clearly, you know, that's the, uh, the, the soft underbelly, if you like, of, of uh, where people apply. They can't, you know, if you can't get insurance uh, because your house might be burgled or something of that sort for your doorbell, 
um, it, you can't get insurance for your house because you've got the wrong type of doorbell, uh, which is not cyber secure, then of course, that's a really good way of persuading manufacturers uh, to get it right. So uh, I, I was very impressed by some of the work they've done. I haven't seen how they're getting on over the last nine months, but hopefully uh, even during COVID, they've been uh, carrying on the work because I think that's highly significant. Of course, where you know, politicians particularly are way behind the curve on IoT, quite frankly. Thanks so much, Tim. And may I just say, it is, I think, incredibly challenging for us all to keep up to date with all of the technological and policymaking developments in this area. It's, uh, it's a very fast moving space. But yes, please, uh, please promote uh, any fantastic academic projects um, that you are aware of. And I, I extend that to, to everybody here. If we could take a moment for Carly to join us, to join the conversation, I'd really welcome her response as discussant. Carly, whenever you're ready, thank you. Thanks, Nora. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Carly Kind. I'm the director of the Ada Lovelace Institute. Um, really, really fascinating um, and very diverse presentation so far. I think there's kind of three questions or themes that have arisen in the presentations that I uh, thought I'd draw out and maybe put to put back to the participants or back to the audience as well. So the first is around um, thinking about ethics and the ethics of AI in the context of research and separating that out from the context of deployment. And this is like a question I have, which is, should we think differently about the ethics of AI research um, versus AI deployment? And is there a rationale for separating out the ethical issues and the ethical processes? On the, on the kind of the, the no side of that question, I think, is the very real concept of kind of techno determinism once technology comes into the world it it gains a momentum of its own and there is a much greater likelihood that it's going to be rolled out and adapted if it exists in the first place and i think that that warrants very real considerations of ethics right from the get-go around r d on the other hand i think is the problem we see with lots of ai technologies or algorithmic technologies more broadly is Essentially, these are not very well thought through applications that are being are in constant beta test and are being tested on the public at large all the time. And I mean that that is true whether you think about, um, for example, the use of risk scoring algorithms in public services in the UK, which are very much in a nascent stage. They're not kind of quality assured, but they're just being rolled out in an ad hoc manner, being sold by private companies to local authorities who aren't equipped to really scrutinize or understand them. So it's true for that, but it's also true, of course, with Facebook and Google and other platforms, which regularly test new AI products on users in, a, in quite an opaque, I'm, I'm aware of the use of opacity now, thanks, Joanna, but, it, but these, these products are being used in quite an opaque manner. And so there, there is a sense that there is, that it's a wild west and technology should just be tested and deployed wherever, you know, that there's no kind of vector through which quality assurance should happen before being deployed. So I think either we need to think about an ethical framework and a way to instill ethics right from the get-go, or we need to think about a safe environment in which AI R&D can happen with some ethical constraints, but not, but maybe slightly looser constraints than we might expect on deployment. And then it's kind of a, a gateway mechanism um, and some type of regulatory framework which enables the quality assurance and, and really strict ethical analysis to happen. I think it's unfair to expect uh, an individual computer scientist to be able to grapple with the very many ethical issues that come into play with the development of AI and new technologies. Um, I mean, an example, Hammond referred to this in one respect, this idea that GDPR just becomes a compliance question, but rather, and, and that, um, that's a re that becomes a reductive approach to ethics where it's distilled down to compliance with the GDPR or not. And there are so many other very fundamental questions, but can we really expect an individual scientist to ask, what does justice mean to the society in which I live? And what is a more just approach to how this algorithm should deal with, um, with its application? Um, so I suppose that's a question I, I would really love to put back to the panelists. Is, is there a rationale for two parallel approaches to ethics when it comes to AI deployment and AI research and development? Um, I think a second, oh, Jan, it looks like she wants to jump in. Do you want me to stop there, Nora, or do you want me to keep going? What's the... So Carly, I'm, very, I'm, I'm delighted for this to be as fluid as possible. So yeah. if you're 
jump in for Joanna to Yeah, respond. yeah, jump in, Joanna, I guess so. Yeah, otherwise I'll just keep talking. And Thanks, keep Joanna. Talking. Sorry, I just want to totally strongly uh, endorse uh, what you're saying here. Um, I want to say it's not just about unfairness, and of course no one person can know a lot of things, but there is a misunderstanding uh, as we look past this magic uh, supernaturalist uh, belief in AI towards the programmers. Now there's this weird belief that programmers are like doctors or lawyers, that, these, that you'll be able to hold the programmer accountable that mm -hmm. wrote the algorithm. No, it's much more like a bank or an architecture firm where it's an organization that you're going to have to deal with. Um, but I, I, the, the, again, it's not exceptional to other, so, to other sectors so much as people think. I really think it's important that we do have some ideas of what the consequences of, of releasing this kind of uh, technology can be. We didn't know when Facebook was first hacked in the first you know, dorm room or whatever. Now we have other things that we know we should be thinking about and testing. And Stuart, Stuart Russell just, again, I just was on a panel with him yesterday, where he was suggesting that um, that we ought to have some kind of you know simulations run and whatever. Again, I don't believe that we will ever be able. In fact, I know I can say as a computer scientist, it's tr it's it's computationally intractable to predict everything that's that could and will happen with new social innovations. So we must always have the things that are looking for and catching the errors. But I totally agree that just like with any other sector, once we start understanding what can go wrong, we need to see evidence uh, of due diligence in, in heading those sorts of things off. And we should be able to find that. We should be able to find accounts of that. Uh, again, uh, in, you know, again, that what the, the emphasis that the, the, uh, Lord Clement Jones was making on the C-suite, this is a responsibility of the corporations to mm -hmm. demonstrate that they did due diligence with respect to known problems. Mm -hmm. Can I just come in very briefly, Nora? This is a great conversation um, because as a lawyer, I'm not quite sure I recognize that you can't have both, that you can't both have organizational responsibility and individual professional responsibility. I was talking, we were talking about um, neural uh, uh, interfaces, brain interfaces at a conference the other day um, with the Society for Computers and the Law and a whole bunch of, of uh, scientists from Imperial. And that was absolutely fascinating. But it struck me that, you know, I mean, people have talked about a Hippocratic Oath for uh, AI developers and so on. I mean, having some sensibility or sensitivity to the issues involved, I, it may not go as far as, as talking about uh, having a Hippocratic Oath because, you know, in a sense, medical researchers, if they're medically qualified, maybe you could assume that they, they do, but if they're not medically qualified, but they deal with medical technology, you know, it, you get all sorts of false distinctions here. But actually in the training of our AI uh, developers, I think we ought to have a very strong element of this. Um, and, you know, Joanna will know much better than I whether our universities are providing that kind of background background uh, and you will Nora as well um, uh, uh, but I and I, but I, I don't disagree on the organizational responsibility uh, and that's exactly what I was saying but I think most of our boards are our c-suite if you like are pretty ignorant on this kind of thing no I, I totally agree that, that just as architects have to be licensed we may very well get to the point where software developers need to be licensed as well with their responsibilities I was only saying that this is insufficient. The people that think like, oh, it's okay, it's a Hippocratic Oath. No, that's not okay. It's a different kind of organizational structure. Yeah. Well, Tim, thank you so much. If I could just step in and ask if Carly and now finish, conclude with her responses, and then we can open it up for the remaining time. Thanks, Carly. Yeah, no, no, I mean, that was really, really useful. And actually, I haven't heard very much of the um, use of the phrase due diligence in the context of AI, and I really like that that framing. Um, and I and I should say on that point, there's a there's a kind of sub question, which is how equipped are our university ethics approval processes, where lots of AI research is happening, to deal with the the broader AI ethics questions, and do we need some kind of updating of those processes, and how might they align with corporate institutional review boards and how they're doing ethics approval? And I feel like there's a there's a kind of learnings to be done there. So the question, so the second of, of three questions that I had that came up, uh, I think, through the presentations was, um, what is the point of AI ethics principles if they're not translating into practice? And how might we translate them into practice? What does it look like um, for ethics to translate into practice? Um, 
I think, you know, there's all of these ethics codes and, and, and we spoke quite a lot about the three that the government have. And yet, you know, one of the biggest stories from this year was the off qual algorithm um, disaster, uh, I think, to put it mildly, um, which is unfair to call that AI. I'm sure it's barely more than a spreadsheet. But let's say we're talking about the general category of kind of semi-autonomous or autonomous um, data-driven systems. So three, three ethical codes um, uh, that the government is subscribed to. Quite a lot of work done by Ofqual in advance of rolling out that algorithmic system in terms of impact assessment, in terms of a quality assessment. It wasn't like they just kind of bought something off the shelf and rolled it out on 100,000 students' uh, A-level results. And yet we saw immense public dissatisfaction with how that was handled. And, and quite frankly, I think immense public uh, immense harm done to public trust in data-driven systems, at, um, algorithms and AI as they're used by government. And, um, and uh, so I think there's a big question about why didn't those principles translate into practice? Now, one response to that is that they did translate into practice, that the government thought about, or sorry, Ofqual thought about some of the principles around fairness, equalities, justice, et cetera, that are um, accountability, transparency, that are inherent in many of those ethical frameworks. But they, um, they came down with a different calculation of what fairness means than the, the broader public did. And there is, an, uh, without going into too much detail, there's an argument that they said, well, we're going to optimize for fairness um, with respect to previous generations of students' marks and future generation students. And we're going to standardize on that front. And so our concept of justice is this idea of justice over time and there being a kind of fair go for people who came before and will come after. And that was clearly found to be wanting by, by the public and by students who took to the streets to protest. And I think it really um, effectively illustrates just how complex it is to talk about notions of fairness and justice. It's so inadequate to have them at a high level. What it actually means in practice is an incredibly complex process of negotiation that we really are only at the start of. And um, someone made the point to me the, the other day, which I think was a good one, which is previously on, on very complex moral issues, we've been able to say, let's just agree to disagree and, and have a plurality of views in society as to the right answer to a moral question. But with technology, we can't agree to disagree um, uh, permanently. We have to, you know, AI is going to come down on one side of a moral issue or the other, and that's going to be enshrined in, in technological architecture. And so how do we get to that negotiation? And I think this is where things like public deliberation and public engagement comes into play. It feels like having that conversation with the public about, okay, what do you feel like a fair and just settlement is when it comes to a-level results, for example, here are all the factors we have to balance. Uh, here's how we're thinking about weighing them at the moment is, does that strike you as a fair calculation or should we adjust some of these parameters? And I think that that seems to me to be one area where the off-call algorithm fell down. Um, and, and so I think that for me, that says that it's just not sufficient to have a proliferation of ethical frameworks which use these words like transparency, accountability, fairness, and justice without saying, well, here's what they mean in practice, or here's the process by which you can understand what they should mean in practice, and then involving deployers in that process. Um, and, and I really liked um, Joanna's point relatedly about, you know, this idea of let's not talk about algorithmic accountability, let's talk about accountability for algorithms, i.e. there are always a, there is always a person accountable, not the algorithm itself can't be accountable for anything, it's a technological artifact, we actually need humans to be, to be involved in that process. Um, the third question or a third kind of theme that I, I found really interesting coming up in this conversation are these, um, is this idea of kind of structural questions around the data economy and, um, and how they relate to individual AI applications and their ethical compliance. Um, so, and I, and I challenge a little bit something that Ella said a couple of times, which is the GDPR is inherently ethical. And I, um, this is not to critique the GDPR, which I think provides an important kind of foundation for which we can have these issues. But Joanna did make the point um, with respect to Google that the GDPR, in fact, reinforces Google's business model rather than fundamentally disrupting it. And, um, and that the GDPR has been good for business for platforms, essentially, in the end, it hasn't kind of fundamentally torn away the data economy that, um, uh, that you know, that grounds AI development at this stage. 
And so there are questions of structural power, which are reinforced by the current way of thinking about data governance um, and are not challenged by data governance. And I think that that's an ethics question, but it's a, it's a kind of structural ethics or a structural justice question, which again, I don't expect a computer scientist to resolve. These are kind of big weighty issues of regulation and power. And I, I think it, just to kind of put a final point on it, I think the concentrate, the current concentration of power we have in, with, with a handful of tech monopolies is bad for the development ethical AI because it, um, it removes competition. So it, it doesn't incentivize the development of um, ethical products necessarily because there is a concentration of power in the hands of a few actors. It puts outsized power in the hands of those actors to influence regulation, which in turn will influence the development of, of AI. Um, it prevents new entrants from the market because we're in this incredibly data intensive phase of AI development and whoever has the most data is going to do the best machine learning development. And so there is a very few actors who are able to compete for AI development. Um, and, and that's only going to uh, exacerbate itself. Um, and I think it removes from the conversation the topics that I'm so glad Joanna mentioned around taxation, the redistribution of wealth that should come with um, AI development, um, the idea of universal basic income, for example, being something that should come with uh, the fourth industrial revolution. Um, so I, I really like what Joanna said about a lot of the consequences we're attributing to AI are actually problems of the digital economy. And I think that that, that is a, you know, a really excellent way of putting this issue. And, um, and so it is a question of regulation and ethics, but it's about structural regulation necessarily about just regulating practices themselves. Thank you so much, Carly. We Thank are you. coming up on uh, the clock now, and we did have a question from the floor that I would like to put to the panel before we conclude. And that was a concern raised around the role of industry in not just developing their own governance mechanisms for their ethical conduct and practices, but also combining that with a greater role that they're having in co-regulation and whether there is an element of, of imbalance here in light of all of the points I think that you've all raised in terms of the overall architecture of monopolies and socioeconomic factors and the other factors in terms of prioritizing innovation other, over other values and public interests and tech solutionism. So maybe we could take this question for everyone to respond to. And then if you could also give any concluding thoughts, if everyone could maybe attempt to do this in two to three minutes, that would be wonderful. And that will om almost keep us within time, ju just about. So maybe if we could, um, Tim, if we could start with you and if we just go um, with the order that we have for the keynote panel, I hope that's all right with everyone. Tim. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Nora. I 100% agree uh, with Carly on the fact that this is the digital world that we're talking about. I mean, AI is part of that and it's made us think much more carefully, but it is necess uh, necessarily part of that total digital universe. And I do think one of the real issues is, you know, we might call it co-regulation. I might call it um, uh, regulatory capture. Uh, uh, if one is not careful. I mean, I, you know, obviously I, I, companies need to have a relationship with regulators, but I don't want to see it too close. But I'll tell you uh, just in closing where I think I really do worry. And uh, Carly mentioned it. It's this big tech concentration. You know, I'm a big fan of William Gibson. And, uh, you know, if you look at a dystopian future, what you see is about two or three big AI systems where everything gets sucked up to that. Your digital ID is determined by one of those systems uh, or your data uh, capture um, is from one of those systems. And you have to choose. It's a bit like Coke or Pepsi. You almost have to choose which system you are part of in the future. And that's exactly what we have to avoid, basically. I don't want to have to make a choice between which fang uh, AI system I am going to be part of in the future. And we really do have to struggle against that, you know, uh, uh, in the future. And I don't think many of us, you know, which which one of those is our IoT 
uh, 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 device uh, linked to. You know, there are all kinds of choices and we're making them already. I'm already deciding whether to use Chrome or Safari or, you know, whatever else it happens to be. And that concentration of power is, is, is very dangerous, actually. Thank you so much, Tim. Ellis, when you're ready, please. Yeah, I mean, this is really, really um, very interesting and isn't the nub or crux of some very um, difficult, pressing and live issues. So just to pick up on something Hamad said about the ad tech work, um, that I think that was put on pause during the pandemic. Uh, I think we've been open on the uh, on the website and uh, possibly Simon's done a blog that that ha the pause button has been lifted and that work um, is continuing. Um, and so I don't think there is regulatory capture. I'll defend the ICO from that. But I do have to kind of recognise that these are incredibly complicated areas. And we as a regulator um, need to understand what it is um, that we are seeking to regulate. And so we have to have a conversation with experts, with the people who are leading the field, so that we understand um, exactly how that technology is working and what our, our policy should be in, in relation to um, regulating that, given the black and white letter of the law that we have. So I see that that, that, that role can, uh, um, that kind of tightrope can be walked um, quite neatly with the codes of conduct and certification, whereby industry comes to us and we have a discussion about what is appropriate on an industry-wide basis um, and we can view those through the lens of the GDPR um, before uh, applying them and potentially in terms of resourcing which everybody knows is very tight the certification route whereby that is then handed over to a third party to go out and monitor uh, uh, and enforce uh, appropriately I think is uh, particularly in this area is a very interesting opportunity that we, we should be looking at um, very proactively. Thank you so much, Ellis. And I think also the, the sandbox approach that the ICO have, has put forward in terms of de developing uh, AI technologies and their application is also perhaps another mechanism that could be very useful going forward in this space. Joanna. Okay, well, I, I feel uh, I, like I already talked a lot and I want to apologize to all speakers and everyone about the fact that I have some kind of uh, uh, inhibitory uh, problem and was writing so much during your incredibly awesome talks. I, I'm just like that. And I hope that it, for some of us, it, it did bring some other uh, streams forward, but I realize it's also a distraction. Uh, so I, I, let, let me just come back then and talk a little bit about, I want to hi highlight yet another new thing we haven't talked about before, but that comes from uh, Lord Clements Jones' uh, point just now about this ecosystem capture. Um, some people in Europe now, this is something I don't like that, that's, that's sneaking into the DSA, are saying that, you know, the data that's being captured by these other companies is ours, right? And so therefore we should get it back. And then and the, and they should have to give it to us. And there's this misunderstanding by lawyers, unfortunately, of this idea that there's this free data that they get, like when you click on which, uh, which search term you get or whatever. Look, nothing is actually free. There's an enormous amount of scaffolding back there. There's one actual world that's, the, that's really all the data, the, the, the real physical world and, and it's past. And then everything else in, in a computer is a reduction of that. And so that reduction will be, sector, will be specific to the needs of that company. And if we say you have to give us your data, we're really saying lock us in to your way of doing business. So that's a danger we have. Um, and then if I have a minute left, I'll show you one other thing, uh, which is only just a starting, a starting uh, point for a much longer paper, but about market capitalization. Uh, can you see that, that slide? I, nobody's talking now, so I can't do it. Not or something, yeah, okay. Um, there's a narrative that I've been, which has not come up here, but that I've been hearing a lot in the EU, maybe because that's, we're the ones that people are trying to influence right now, that uh, the United States and China are in a Cold War and that the Europe has to support the USA in this Cold War. Um, so I actually, there, I, I'm not showing you the, the counter stuff that we're trying to counter. This is actual data on um, the corporations worldwide that listed at least two patents in uh, the WIPO uh, uh, database in 2019 in the area that WIPO considers to be AI. Okay, so it's a subset, right? And what you see here is that, uh, well, both, I think this really shows that market capitalization and patenting are both corporate strategies that, and different corporations in different countries and regions play them differently. 
a substantial amount of the large market cap companies in Europe are in Switzerland. They're not in the EEA, okay? So I think we, we need to realize that market capitalization is a sort of a weird thing. I mean, look at China. Why does China have two companies with the same market cap and the same number of patents? Tell me that that wasn't a control decision, right? So market cap allows you to, do, to exercise, again, regulatory control. It also allows you to exercise um, uh, you buying out of competition. You know, it gives you, it gives you uh, leverage. You know, it gives you uh, financing. Um, I, HP, a number of other companies have decided to disaggregate because that actually increases the investor value. So this is not about investor value. Um, the, there are certain corporations now that are feeling that, the, that, that for political reasons, for snowballing reasons, they have to do this to keep large political uh, power. So I think this is absolutely a regulatory question and please do not ignore the rest of the world, right? The rest of the world is bigger than China and the EEA combined. Um, again, by these two imperfect measures, but, but the digital is a leveling ground. Okay. Thank you so much, Joanna, and such an important point to raise that this isn't about Europe or North America or just China. It's a global set of issues, and um, hopefully some of the global AI frameworks will reflect those, those broader issues and also those broader cultural questions that other jurisdictions and their laws and their ethics will also bring to this conversation as well. Carly, whenever you're ready. I feel like everyone's had enough of me. I think one point I guess may, I'd make of uh, Joanna's excellence, well, two points of Joanna's excellence slide. First of all, I just had to Google Aramco, which I'd never heard of, which is a Saudi Arabian oil company. I'm fascinated by the amount of patents that they have. Um, so I'd be interested to learn more about that. But secondly, I think reflecting on that slide, you still see the dominance of major US companies in AI development. And one thing we haven't talked about, but of course we should more is diversity in teams developing AI. And that's not only about gender diversity, which is incredibly important, but cultural diversity as well, which strikes me is probably going to be lacking from, from it, just looking at that table as a starting point. So, um, but otherwise, thank you for having me and I'll, I'll sip it now. Okay, everyone. Well, I just want to say that this has been the most fantastic start to the conference. And I just want to thank the keynote panel for the most fantastic presentations covering so much ground and also for the divergence of views. It is really wonderful to have different perspectives and insights informing the debate. And I have to say, a very special thank you to Lord Clement Jones for his fantastic lecture that is going to inform and shape the rest of the conversations and debates throughout the conference. And to say that while I'm, 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 very, I'm quite sad to conclude this particular panel, I, it would be wonderful to keep it going, but could I just say that while this is the end of this particular panel, I hope this isn't the end of the conversation for all of you and that I hope that you take some of the ideas and provocations from this morning with you in terms of reaching out to the community of people who've been having conversations already. And it's, there's nothing left for me to say now except to say thank you to everybody and enjoy the lunch break. And I hope if you can, that you can join us after lunch for our first academic panel. Thank you so much, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion on issues of accountability and governance for new technologies. My name is Dimitra Camarino, and I will be the chair for this panel. I am a researcher for the Cloud Legal Project at the Center for Commercial Law Studies at Queen Mary University of London, I'm a PhD candidate at the same university and a visiting lecturer at King's College London. In the interest of saving time, um, as we have six speakers and we would like to leave some time in the end for questions, I would like to introduce to you all of our speakers before the start of the presentations. Um, I also wanted to let you know that tomorrow afternoon there will be a more informal session dedicated to asking questions to all speakers. So in case we don't have time for questions later on, um, you could ask your questions then. Our first speaker is Andrew Clark, um, who is an LLM candidate at the University of Kent, specializing in intellectual property and international commercial law. Andrew's presentation will focus on the impact of the GDPR on surveillance capitalism. Our second speaker is Hannah Lim, 
who is the head of rule of law um, and emerging markets in Southeast Asia for LexisNexis Legal and Professional. Hannah's presentation will focus on AI and the rule of law in developing states. Our third speaker in this session um, is Natalia Menendez Gonzalez, uh, who is a PhD researcher at the European University Institute in Florence and a foreign researcher at the Constitutional Law Department at the University of Oviedo in Spain. Um, her presentation will discuss issues of algorithmic accountability for AI-empowered facial recognition technology. Uh, moving on, our fourth speaker will be Dr. Sarah Hurani, who is an associate professor at the School of Law at Middlesex University of London and a visiting lecturer at the University of Aix-Marseille in France. Uh, Sarah's presentation will discuss the research project led by herself and Dr. Ayuro Karanasu um, on the impact of automated um, online dispute resolution procedures uh, on the principle of principles of independence and impartiality. Our fifth speaker, um, final fifth speaker, will be uh, Dr. Patrick O'Sullivan, uh, who's a legal researcher with the IETIC Research Cluster um, in the Business Information Systems Department of University College Cork in Ireland. Um, and Patrick's presentation will focus on the very topical issue of how to regulate fake news during a pandemic. Uh, in terms of logistics, speakers will have about 10 to 15 minutes for the presentations. And following the presentations, uh, we're very fortunate to have Graham Smith as our final speaker and discussant. Uh, hi, as most of you know, um, Graham is of counsel at Bird and Bird, um, and he's one of the UK's leading cyber law experts with a practice encompassing advisory and contentious work in the internet, IT, and intellectual property fields. We hope to have time at the end uh, for our speakers to address Graham's points and to reply to any questions from the audience, as I said. So um, without further ado, I'll give the floor to our first speaker. Andrew, please go ahead. Hey, thank you very much for your introduction and Dimitra. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I actually graduated from my master's yesterday and the paper I'm presenting Congratulations. today- Congratulations. Thank you. And the paper I'm presenting today is titled Reclaiming Privacy in the Digital Era, the Impact of GDPR on Surveillance Capitalism. So I'll first just try to share my screen with you. Okay. So firstly, I'll provide an overview of the issue of surveillance with some historical background. Then I'll explain the, contact, the concept of privacy online and detail how surveillance capitalism conflicts with privacy. I will then look into a few relevant cases such as Google Spain and the concept of consent within GDPR, which restricts online surveillance. Lastly, I will briefly examine one proposed loophole for continued surveillance through anonymized or pseudonymized data sets, followed with the concluding remarks. So firstly, in 2018, Facebook was fined £500,000 for their involvement in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, where some 87 million users' data were harvested unlawfully. This legal action represented a mere flea bite in an online advertising industry that is now worth some $200 billion US dollars. Following the dot-com burst, many Silicon Valley companies refinanced through targeted ads that modified consumer behavior. The developers of this economic model, Facebook and Google, convince users that their services are free, whilst every comment, search, like, or use of web-enabled devices, also known as the Internet of Things, is harvested as raw material, analyzed by big data processors, and then used for commodification in predictive solutions that are designed to effect behavioral modification. It is this unrestricted mining of behavioral data for commercial profit that was termed surveillance capitalism by Shosana Zuboff and is antithetical to digital privacy rights. Surveillance capitalists exert unilateral control over personal data without consent or with vague or extensive click wrap agreements, which most users neither read nor understand exactly what they're consenting to. This creates an imbalance in the consumer cooperation power structure, treads upon the fundamental rights to privacy, and even threatens the democratic institutions of our society. Against this backdrop, my paper examines digital privacy rights and the GDPR 
to determine whether its obligations on data processors and controllers effectively restrict surveillance capitalism. So parts one and two of my paper detail how surveillance capitalism strips away the right to privacy in the digital age. So I'll firstly address the concept of privacy. So Warren and Brandy famously defined privacy as the right to be let alone. At the heart of this concept of privacy is a protection of self, meaning one's ability to decline access or observation to one's personal information provided to others. Contrary to this, Facebook and Google have created trade-offs in their collection and flow of data through digital platforms where privacy violations are justified by the free access to online content. In the digital economy, privacy relates to the right to control what and to whom your personal information is made known in any online activity. However, with the rise of the Internet of Things, the lines are now blurred between what constitutes offline and online informational privacy, as people possess smart surveillance devices, such as Alexas, Fitbits, and Google Nest thermostats that monitor your real life behavior, including your speech patterns, your health data, and your whereabouts, even whilst you're confined within your own home. Privacy rights are also significant because they preserve individual autonomy and decision making. This is restricted in surveillance capitalists' constant user observation as they profit from directly influencing their users' natural behaviors. For example, in 2004, Gmail scanned private emails to create targeted ads for profit without consent. And by 2010, Google's AdSense surpassed 10 billion in value using unauthorized access to user profile information containing users' search patterns, their document inquiries, and their online behaviors. Personal details could also be deduced from data input by other individuals. Subsequently, Android services were provided free to mobile producers because Google intended to capitalize on users' data input and pre with pre-enabled behavioral trackers that required retroactive deactivation. So essentially, user privacy was stripped away by default. One, a study in 2018 of over a million of these Android applications by Ruben Binz revealed that 90% of them were designed to transfer all user data to Google's databases by default. Protecting digital privacy preserves the self-dignity of human beings, ensuring that individuals are treated as valuable, contrary to the capitalist perception of users' human experience as raw material for commercial gain at the expense of private life. As Zuboff noted, this shows how surveillance capitalist, capitalism specifically seeks to restrict our free will and our right to the future tense through indefinite data retention. The latter issue was addressed specifically in the 2014 Google Spain case, which I'll move on to in the next slide. Prior to 2014, it should be noted that numerous privacy cases in the UK prevented publication or uploading of private information without consent. For example, in the 2001 Venables case, permanent injunctions against the entire world, protecting personal information was allowed. The conflict between surveillance capitalism's indefinite data retention and privacy rights, however, came to a head in 2014 in the Google Spain case where the right to be forgotten was enshrined into EU law. In that case, the claimant had contested Google's perpetual indexing of a previous foreclosure of his home to his name in Google search. This impacted his present reputation despite the matter having since been resolved. The court held that Google was accountable for its perpetual indexing of personal data, and that commercial profit was not a legitimate interest to refuse a request from a user to delete their personal information. The preservation of fundamental rights, therefore, required a right to have one's data deleted from the archives of the web, as this was central to personal identity, integrity, security, and data privacy. Following the Google Spain case, the GDPR was approved with 99 provisions, effective from 2018, with the right to erasure included at Article 17. However, one notable limitation to this right is that a deletion request for an EU search engine does not compel Google or other web providers to remove it from all other global versions of their search engine. This means that the information may continue to exist elsewhere as clarified in the 2019 dispute between Google and French authorities. Although the court stated that web providers should discourage other internet users from seeking out deleted information elsewhere, and national courts can choose to impose further restrictions. This does suggest that the right to erasure still remains a limited solution for resolving the issue of digital eternity in practice. Beyond the right to erasure, another primary restriction on surveillance capitalism within GDPR is a criteria for informed consent. I will now move on to address this issue. 
So how did the GDPR criteria add to Google Spain in the fight against surveillance capitalism? Well, Article 6 and 7 of the GDPR requires freely given consent from identifiable data subjects to lawfully process personal data. Sensitive data processing is also more heavily restricted. Data minimization is required, meaning that cooperation should collect only what is necessary for how long it is needed. And purpose limitation means that users should be able to opt in and clearly consent to each processing operation. Data held must also be accurate, stored for only as long as required and then deleted and kept securely. Underpinning all of these principles is organizations' responsibility to demonstrate compliance, that is to maintain accountability. Having examined GDPR's core obligations, it becomes clear that surveillance capitalists' reliance on take it or leave it click wraps or terms of agreement to mine data is unlawful. This has led to administrative fines on internet companies, which I'll discuss in the next slide. It was due to unconsented data mining and the use of vague terms of service that both Facebook and Google were fined by UK and French authorities in 2018 and 2019 respectively. In the former, Cambridge Analytica had accumulated over 5,000 data points from over 80 million Facebook profiles unbeknownst to users. Whilst in the latter, Google had accumulated data across 20 Android services or more to be used for the targeted ads from a, ge pre a generic pre-selected privacy policy. This meant that users had to retroactively opt out of further processing within their smartphones. This breached GDPR's informed consent criteria, which required specific consent for each type of processing. Google also could not rely on targeted ads as a legitimate interest for the company's mass surveillance operations. The GDPR success is also evident from the rise of data breach notifications, with over 160,000 being submitted between 2018 and 2020. The 50 million fine imposed on Google shows that a lack of transparency and a failure to obtain explicit consent will lead to high administrative fines, which may be up to 20 million euros or 4% of a company's global revenue under the General Data Protection Regulation. Furthermore, the GDPR adds an additional layer of protection amidst AI development in predictive analytics by generally prohibiting and um, profiling and automatic decision-making, which prevents algorithmic bias. Human oversight is therefore required where use of AI has legal or other significant impacts or outcomes on data subjects. However, Baker has suggested that a loophole for continued data mining under GDPR is the use of anonymized or pseudonymized data sets. I will address core points of this loophole in the next slide. So anonymized or pseudonymized data sets were suggested as a means for unrestricted mining because they are exempted from GDPR's purpose limitation, which allows further processing of data beyond the initial purposes for which consent was obtained. To be anonymous, personal data must be deleted in an immutable manner. And to be pseudonymous, unidentifiable data must be stored apart from identifiable data to keep personal data unattributable to specified data subjects. Both anonymity and pseudonymity require intricate technical architecture that is continuously monitored and complied to data protection by design under GDPR once data remains unattributable to data subjects. However, with pseudonymization, the identifiable data continues to exist. This means that if separated data sets are recombined, data subjects may be re-identified. Furthermore, unidentified data transfers, such as the dynamic IP addresses to third parties, will constitute transfers of personal data if the controller on the other end possesses the means to re-identify data subjects when combined with other data sets held. This was noted in the Breyer v. Germany case in 2017. Such a data transfer would not be suitably anonymized or pseudonymized and bound by the full scope of GDPR. However, these derogations may not actually serve surveillance capitalist interests well. Facebook and Google maintain market dom dominance by modifying consumer behavior. Hence, the more personal data processed and retained, the more lucrative their predictive solutions and personalized ads will be. For these reasons, Google and Facebook have persistently lobbied against even biometric data regulations. Thus, anonymization or pseudonymization may devalue these highly precious traded data sets, contrary to those capitalist data mining aims, whilst privileging user privacy over surveillance. This brings me to my concluding remarks. To conclude, it is worth recounting GDPR's significance to digital privacy. Firstly, GDPR effectively establishes primacy of data control and privacy for data subjects. 
is extra territorial application to processing EU citizens data worldwide also prevents forum shopping. So Mark Zuckerberg's 2018 restructuring of Facebook's privacy policies from Irish to US law are futile since EU users continue to use the platform services. Moreover, in the recent Schrems II decision of 2020, the court invalidated the EU-US privacy shield, declaring that the US government's surveillance operations negatively impacted um, privacy protection for EU citizens' data. Consequently, controllers must ensure that recipients of international data transfers are compliant with GDPR or meet equivalent adequacy criteria. Risk assessment of the local legal framework is also required when determining the adequacy of standard contract clauses. Perhaps Strems too will drive the imperative for stronger US privacy laws. It is also worth noting that many countries now have privacy legislations that mirror or contain similar provisions to GDPR, such as those in Brazil, Barbados, India, and California to some extent. This trend is likely to continue as data-driven business grows in order to maintain consumer trust and the free flow of information. Furthermore, strong data protection laws preserve democratic values through the curtailment of practice, practices such as election tampering, as in the Cambridge Analytica scandal. By limiting mass surveillance and behavioral modification, the GDPR protects rights to dignity, autom autonomy, and privacy. The corporate burden of transparency and accountability is therefore paramount with expansion of the Internet of Things that also rely on click wrap agreements. GDPR's data portability gives precedence to data subjects who may compel controllers to provide copies of their personal data in a machine readable format to securely transfer it to other chosen controllers, processors, or to use it for personal means. Nevertheless, Facebook has continuously refused to share its shadow text detailing the algorithmic models and their usage of behavioral data. The cases fought by Google and Facebook emphasize that they will never voluntarily provide this information, leaving us reliant on GDPR to expose it. Although GDPR has not halted data processing entirely, in a short period, it has declared that surveillance capitalists do not have a right to unilaterally control, harvest, and or retain our data, and EU regulators are armed to hold them accountable. The core messages from GDPR's enforcement may be taken as fundamental rights should be preserved at all times, all digital users possess these rights innately, our life experiences are not extractable raw materials with rest nullis, and informed consent and transparency are GDPR's cures to the affliction of surveillance capitalism. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you for keeping within the allocated time. That was excellent. Um, Hannah, would you like to, yes, would you like to proceed? Sure, thank you. Let me just share my screen. Okay, um, you can see my screen now, I guess. Um, okay, well, thanks, Andrew. That was that was very interesting. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, and, and thanks, Hannah, everyone. Um, Hannah, for... Sorry, excuse me. Sorry to interrupt you. I cannot see your screen. Oh, I, don't know I think it's other here. people. Can you see my screen now? I, I cannot. Oh. Personally. Well. Yes, now, I, can you see now, my <laughs> I think now it's getting there. Yes, we're, we're okay now. Thank you. All right, great. Um, so thanks everyone for having me. Um, I'm, I'm not an academic, so I really appreciate this uh, sort of platform to be able to share a topic that's quite close to my heart as I do a lot of work in Southeast Asia, managing LexisNexis's rule of law program there. So with this topic, I, I hope to explore the relationship between AI and governance, but not from the perspective of governing AI but the impact that AI has on states to govern and their ability to give effect to the rule of law. And ultimately this leads me to a larger question of whether we need to rethink the rule of law to better suit our current technological context. Um, this has been a bit of a difficult paper for me to write, so I'm hoping that this forum and the subsequent conversations would help me make sense of this. Um, I also want to manage expectations to state I, I don't have any solutions to the questions that are being asked. Um, and the purpose of this paper is really to sort of situate and frame the questions around AI and the rule of law to bring in the context um, of developing states. And in doing so, I hope to highlight the importance of context when analyzing technology's impact on society and governance. 
So most discussions around AI and its impact on the rule of law arise from the developed world, and that does have a specific context um, with a particular social, technological, and political char characteristics that may not always be shared by countries in the global south. And just to illustrate this point, um, the figure you see on the left is from the 2020 AI Readiness Index. And this demonstrates how ready different governments are to use AI in the delivery of their public services. So the darker the region, the more AI ready that government is. Um, the figure on the right is a shot from the World Justice Project's 2020 Rule of Law Index, where states in green have better or stronger rule of law, and those in orange and red are further down the spectrum. So my focus, again, is going to be on Southeast Asia because that's what I'm more familiar with. So perspectives from elsewhere would also be very much welcome. So just zooming into the region, and, and this is Southeast Asia, I'm focusing on lower middle income countries based on the World Bank's classification, and those are the countries you see here. And I hope that this sort of um, focus helps to redirect the discussion on AI in developing countries away from the more popular candidates like India, maybe China, and onto countries that don't really get a lot of attention when it comes to technology related topics. So first, the question is, how is AI being used in these countries? How are the local populations and communities encountering this technology? Um, as you can imagine, the bulk of AI engagement and interaction in these countries are going to be with respect to the private sector on e-commerce platforms, social media, with your usual suspects, Facebook, Google, TikTok, um, ride-hailing apps, and so on and so forth. Um, they're the ones taking the lead. And very, very little is being done by governments, if at all. You can see by their global rankings on the 2020 AI Readiness Index, which is the first number below each of these country names. Um, AI adoption by governments is extremely low in its nascent stages. Thus far, only Indonesia, which is leading um, this group, has a national AI strategy, and that in itself was launched this year in August. And the rest of the countries, if they do have an AI approach to strategy, they tend to envelope this with a larger, high-level approach to Industry 4.0. But discussions around AI and the rule of law tend to focus on the impact by the use of AI by government in decisions made by the state or by quasi-state actors, um, for example, maybe by the judiciary. And the focus tends to be on where AI-enabled decisions or decisions made by AI itself might impact the substantive or procedural rights of an individual. Now, this is not happening in these countries right now. So these discussions are not relevant yet. So what are we missing from this conversation when we do not account for such a large gap between the public sector um, in a particular place um, and the private sector in terms of their AI usage. And this gap is driven by, by many factors, um, each with its own dynamic. So for example, wealth disparity, language and experience barriers, um, and so on and so forth. Just as an example, I think when, when Myanmar was opening up at the beginning of this decade, um, there was a lot of uh, discussion around how do we translate the word privacy um, into the Myanmar language because there was no natural direct um, translation. Well, maybe that gap between uh, private sector and public sector capabilities might one day narrow in this region. But even if it were to do so, it is unclear if AI and the, if that, if that AI and law journey will evolve in the same way as we see it evolving in developed states today um, for a variety of reasons. The rule of law is so much weak, as you can see from the second um, tie each of these country names, that's their ranking on the rule of law index. So that's just an overview. Oh dear. It's just an overview of the region and the AI activity that is widespread right over there right now. Um, and as mentioned, there is overlap between how well these countries perform on both indices. And I think this comparison highlights the evidence of the effectiveness of the state when considering how AI might impact the rule of law in any community. So I want to unpack that a little. Now, the rule of law is a concept of 
governance. And as pointed out by Catalina Muller in her report to the Council of Europe's Ad Hoc Committee on AI, when considering governance with respect to AI, we need to recognize that AI systems also comprise the socio-technical systems and context. So we need to focus on the social structures around it. And the most basic and fundamental social structure that we live in is that of and that which is created by the state and its relationship with various stakeholders. And perhaps directly related to its role in building this social structure that defines most of our existence, the state is also a central tenant of the rule of law. Now, regardless of how you define the rule of law, there is always an implicit assumption of a sovereign. A sovereign that has the de jure and the de facto authority to give effect to justice according to the law within its, within its jurisdiction. And that sovereign today is the state. Um, in fact, the word for rule of law in most European legal traditions, you know, Rechtsstaat, um, expressly refers to the state. So from this perspective, we're really looking at the impact of AI on the state and the state's ability to effectively build healthy, robust legal systems that in turn engender the rule of law within this new technological context, keeping in mind that the experience of the global south may be very different from that of the global north. Um, but so what? Why does an analysis from the perspective of developing states um, matter? And I think it matters on two fronts. First, simply from a justice and humanitarian perspective, while these states in the global south may not be AI ready, according to the index, AI is certainly already there. It's there in the form of you know, surveillance capitalism that Andrew was speaking earlier, um, social media platforms and the fake news that comes with it. And given how globalized our world is today, AI enabled tool products, perhaps like facial recognition technology, that's developed by private actors far away, perhaps in Silicon Valley, can very easily be transplanted, deployed, and used in these developing states far more easily and more quickly than it is to transplant or develop robust legal and governance systems. And if they are left out of the conversation, this could result in negative outcomes for them. As someone once mentioned, if you're not at the table, you are on the menu. And second, by situating the analysis in the context of developing countries, I hope to remove some of the subconscious assumptions that we have with respect to the nature of the state and of government. The state and government as institutions are also not static and are impacted by the socio-technological context. Um, and perhaps this exercise might reveal concerns that while showing up more starkly in developing countries are also applicable um, to the global north. But I think the real question that all this sort of leads to is whether our current institutions and governance systems, such as the rule of law as, as we conceptualize it, do they even have the capacity to address the concerns that new technology such as AI is presenting to us and can be expected to keep presenting to us in the long run? Do our current technological capabilities um, exceed the limitations that the rule of law has? Um, I don't think this should be a surprising question as all systems and concepts have their limitations and the rule of law as we know it today was developed within a specific technological context to address the requirements of a certain era, relying on tools and frameworks that were available at that time, frameworks such as the state as sovereign. But the experience of developing states will tell you that the existence of a sovereign state in, in, in and of itself is insufficient for the rule of law to take root. Effective rule of law requires an effective sovereign, a state government that has the ability to achieve what it sets out to accomplish. And there's not much use in having sovereignty if your sovereignty is not effective. And effectiveness is not a given, and it is also relative to the socio-technological context. Um, new technology such as AI presents new challenges to the state. Technology of this immense complexity is a new competency that governments need to develop, both in order to deploy AI-enabled services to their citizens, as would be the expectation, as well as to effectively regulate their deployment and use. And the inability of governments to do both or either could erode public confidence in institutions and adversely impact the rule of law. Of course, this is not a, a concern that's limited to developing states, although it's probably showing up a lot more strongly in, the, in these regions um, for now. And with AI and the internet comes the 
proliferation of digital spaces with many of our many aspects of our social financial and political lives being lived out on these platforms governments don't have the same level of oversight over digital spaces as they would over physical spaces and developing states perhaps having even less oversight for a variety of reasons so the quality of state sovereignty in respect of these activities is unequal even between states and without effective state governance digital spaces might for some communities be characterized as ungoverned or less governed than for other communities but an ungoverned space does not equate to there being a power vacuum and digital spaces are certainly being managed and governed by non-state organizations and usually that's the, the platform provider. Now, can the rule of law be said to apply to such spaces where conduct is regulated by the platform provider's terms of use? And if rule of law doesn't apply, should we be concerned if more of life takes place within such spaces? And finally, I think these first two trends accelerate the rise of network governance where governance is no longer delivered by the state government alone, but by a network of actors, including civil society and private sector. And the state is being just sort of one actor amongst um, a few. And this is a trend that's happening despite the fact that the rule of law is heavily dependent on a sovereign that is the state in order to be given effect. So how does network governance look like in developing states? Does the fragmentation and distribution of governance driven by technology um, to other non-state actors, does this have an impact on, on the rule of law? Um, I mean, certainly um, the civil, cival society and non-state is very important. It's supporting the rule of law, um, but it, it is support. And I don't think they can fundamentally replace uh, a functioning and effective legal system that's set up by the state. Now, I'm not suggesting that all of these developments um, and the technology that's driving them is negative, and I'm also not suggesting that it should or can be stopped. But I think what this, what this does require is sort of an expansion of how we conceptualize the rule of law such that it better suits our current social technological context, where the state is less sovereign than it needs to be. Perhaps we need to adjust our notion of the rule of law and how it is delivered so that it can go beyond its current limitations. Today, more than half the world's population without some protection of the rule of law. Ideally, the rule of law shouldn't end at a border simply because that's the limit of a state's jurisdiction, especially as new technology is, is not deterred by borders. And perhaps to do that, we also think that does not rely entirely on the state government as the sole responsible entity for ensuring that the rule of law is given effect. Perhaps the legal infrastructure and institutions that give effect to the rule of law should also become networked like, like the rest of governance. So the ultimate question of questions is what systems do we need today to ensure that the values enshrined in this age old concept of the rule of law effectively apply to everyone today? And how do we build these systems? I think this journey requires us to question notions that we take for granted, such as jurisdiction and the nature of international legal personality, perhaps. But hopefully in doing so, we become better prepared um, to develop governance systems that rise up to the challenges that technology poses to us in all of our different contexts and circumstances. These are very tall orders and it's not easy to do, um, but I think it's important to remember that our current systems of governance are a matter of design and they can be redesigned. So thank you. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Well, thank you very much, Hannah. That was very interesting. And again, thank you very much for um, staying within the time limits. Um, uh, Natalia, um, please go ahead. Thank you very much, um, Dimitra, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I'm very pleased to be surrounded by such high-level speakers. In fact, I'm going to refer to many of the questions arisen this morning by Lord Clement Jones and also at the keynote panel, but specifically refer to facial recognition technology. I hope that this helps to shade some light to such interesting and necessary debate. 
And let me start by defining facial recognition technology. We can define it by saying that whether it creates a template from the facial image of a subject and compares it with one or many other templates to identify or validate an individual's identity or to extract a certain characteristic of that individual. It can be said that the advent of artificial intelligence has made the picture of facial recognition technology from science fiction movies real. In the past, classic facial recognition was limited to the identification and verification functions. Furthermore, the facial images fed to the system had to meet very specific requirements. The most important of those being that the photographs where the subject was not perfectly portrayed, looking at the camera in a very ID style, were practically useless. Along with the improvements in computer vision, artificial intelligence meant an exponentially boost in accuracy for identification and verification. From that moment, faces in movement without looking directly to the camera or even people wearing accessories such as glasses or hats were no obstacle for facial recognition. But probably the most controversial aspect uh, brought by artificial intelligence relates to categorization. At this regard, in the last time, a plethora of applications have made their appearances and I want to give you some examples. Juan and Kosinski have claimed to achieve a facial recognition system using neural networks to extract sexual orientation from a facial image. In June 2020, a press release from the Harrisburg University of Science and Technology announced the forthcoming publication of a paper entitled A Deep Neural Network Model to Predict Criminality Using Image Processing. However, a strong campaign from the academia that included the signature by more than 1,700 academics of a letter to the publishing house ended up with the publication of the piece. The signature is claimed that the system enhanced systemic bias. There are also several research projects working on detection of depression from facial images, such as the one conducted by Zhou, Jing, Xiang, and Guo. They use a deep convolutional neural network to produce a score base on what they call the generated depression activation map. This previous example relates to the research stream called sentiment analysis. While it does not rely on facial images only, it also relies on the merge with other sources of data such as voice or handwriting, and it aims to detect emotions. This research arose in the context context of consumer response in neuromarketing, but it is now one of the biggest concerns as recently stated, for example, at the expert seminar on artificial intelligence and the right to privacy by the United Nations Human Rights Officer of the Higher Commissioner. And lastly, facial recognition technology empowered by artificial intelligence has been used in the eye border control project in personal interviews with travelers. The system spots face cues in search of disease. So this non-exhaustive enumeration gives an idea of the new realm that artificial intelligence has opened for the categorization function of facial recognition technology. With only a facial image, a relatively easy thing to obtain, for instance, from a social network service account, a vast amount of extremely personal data can be obtained. So now I'm going to move on to the legal challenges posed by facial recognition technologies. Facial recognition technologies poses a several challenges from algorithmic fairness, transparency and accountability to the right to privacy and data protection. I'm going to focus on some of the most interesting and also less known. From the algorithmic transparency point of view, as long as facial recognition incorporates artificial intelligence, the black box approach applicable to the latter affects the former. In the current state of the art, of facial recognition, human beings cannot discern or explain how artificial intelligence systems work and how they process both the training and input data to obtain its outcomes. This issue has put artificial intelligence in the point of view of legal professionals. For instance, COMPASS, an algorithmic tool used to predict recidivism within the United States, has been accused of entailing an infringement for the right to due process, since the reason behind the predictive score are unclear or unknown. From the algorithmic accountability point of view, the question of whether or how accountability can be demanded to algorithms is being widely discussed in the literature. For example, who should be held accountable according to what criteria and to whom for an inaccurate or discriminatory performance of this algorithmic system? The European Data Protection Supervisor has expressed his concern about these specific questions 
and the literature is exploring the possibility of even establishing an authority, a watchdog for artificial intelligence, and even specifically for facial recognition. For instance, there have been recently some interesting inputs regarding the deployment of an FDA for facial recognition technology. But probably the area where most of the academia and European institutions have put their eyes regarding facial recognition technology is privacy. There is a wide range of issues that facial recognition technology poses for the right to privacy and data protection, starting with consent and in the line of the things uh, pointed out by Andrew, there is plenty of deployment scenarios where the individuals might be subject to facial recognition without giving their consent. Let's take as an example all those cases where facial recognition deployed in big areas is built on top of a CCTV system, admin, I identifying terrorists. The consent of all citizens passing by would not be recalled. The literature has pointed out that in the case of face categorization, consent might not be free and informed because both the uses and functioning of the technology will not be clearly explained. And therefore the processing might be considered unlawful. A constant problem which has also been identified with facial recognition is the difficulty for the data controller to determine when consent is specifically needed for a certain action or if other grounds, such as the use of the legitimate clause, might suffice. The different functions that facial recognition might perform have also to be taken into account. In the worst scenario, the data subject might end up swamped with consent requests. Moreover, uh, would it be possible that a subject denies the consent of using a facial image lawfully obtained for a person's social network service, profile and therefore subject to its privacy policy? For instance, Clearview AI claims their databases are fed with facial images legally obtained for mostly from social media and internet web pages. Furthermore, as various authors have argued, due to the innovative nature of the technology and the low degree of trust it enjoys, people do not possess enough knowledge and power to understand the true impact of what they are consenting to. One of the possible solutions to the consent conundrum might be the establishing of a compliance standard for consent. This standard could include legal assessment and possible certification in the same line as conformity assessments for product risk or ISO standards. It would act as an incentive for technology suppliers that currently express their uncertainty against a volatile technology in a rapid changing scenario to try to include it privacy by design and default criteria on their designs and deployments. While some authors are for these instruments, among other reasons, such as harmonization to demonstrate compliance with the data protection requirements, others warn of the risk that such soft law provisions could be increasingly expected by the industry up to the point that they eventually become formal requirements. In this case, the role of the data protection authorities and the European Data Protection Board might be crucial in monitoring compliance and assessing this certification. So what are the regulatory approaches at this moment contemplated against facial recognition? Maybe the beginning of the debate in Europe at a mainstream level can be tracked down to the white paper on AI by the European Commission. In this process, a leaked draft warrants also attention. This draft dated the 12th of October, December 2019, proposed a temporary moratorium on the use of facial recognition in public spaces. However, the definite version of the white paper did not include this moratorium and was not very extensive regarding facial recognition. But later, after the death of George Floyd, the protests against the use of facial recognition by law enforcement agencies intensified, IBM, Amazon and Microsoft withdrew temporary or indefinitely from providing this technology. And the facial recognition moratorium returned to the European agenda. The three regulatory positions against artificial intelligence and therefore facial recognition proposed in this white paper were using the current legislation without further amendments, adapting the legislation to embrace full usage of the technology or create a new law to specifically regulate AI, facial recognition and all the legal challenges that come from its deployment. I'm going to very briefly examine these approaches. 
Regarding the use of the current legislation, although facial recognition and artificial intelligence are not mentioned specifically within the GDPR, many of the provisions apply in the technologies use. In general, academics have argued that the GDPR fails to guide on how to deploy AI-enhanced technologies respecting its content. The main critiques are focused on its wide and often vague content. Although a course approach might not be a bad thing per se, allowing for flexibility in a rapid changing environment, the lack of a specific regulation renders all difficulties to be faulty addressed, bypassed by the public interested clause. Conversely, modifying a directive such as the GDPR is inherently difficult. We should not forget that the aim is not only to answer to the challenges posed by AI or any other technology for the matter, but to build the basis of the data protection regime within Europe. Thus, the regulation scopes beyond AI might turn changed, lost, or deviated. Adapt the GDPR to artificial intelligence would require the flexible course approach, but introduce finer technology-driven data protection regulation dispositions. This last, the last option uh, would be to create a brand new regulation specifically to the technology. It should contemplate the widening casuistic and provide tailoring responses. This option is not infeasible at all, as shown by the Washington State's bill entirely devoted to facial recognition, the first of its kind. The regulation beyond definitions and key concepts dedicates its majority to what has been called accountability report, a detailed document that has to be filled by any public agency interested in using facial recognition technology. And in my opinion, and some concluding remarks regarding these regulatory stances, in an analogous way to the wide debate on choosing over privacy or health during the COVID-19 health emergency, I consider that regarding facial recognition, the way to find effective and legal measures comes from not only looking at legal and technological solutions as separate and often contradictory tools. But to tackle privacy problems for facial recognition, we might look at, for example, differential privacy. Differential privacy is a mathematical formalization of the foregoing idea that we should be comparing what someone might learn from an analysis if any particular person's data was included in the data set with what someone might learn if it was not. The concept was developed in the early 2000s by a team of theoretical computer scientists and this solution might be of application when using facial recognition for aggregated data purposes, for example. Other technical tools such as key anonymization, phenotypically or demographically diverse data augmentation using generative adversarial networks or homomorphic encryption might also play an important role at this respect. From my point of view, lawyers and policymakers should focus on these kinds of solutions instead of pushing for a ban adapting general regulation to specific cases, or even promulgated new laws that, given the rapid and never-changing scenario, might become obsolete in extreme short periods. Instead of seeing technology as an enemy or threatened to human rights, we should embrace the technical developments and even use the technology to legally mold them. And hopefully, we could benefit from the technological advantage offered by facial recognition without sacrificing our rights. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Natalia, for this very thorough overview of the relevant issues. I was, that was very interesting. Um, we now, the, our next speaker is Sara. Welcome. Thank you very much, Sarah, for the very kind introduction. And thank you very much to Nora and Eliza for organizing uh, this event. Um, I'll now share my screen with you. So does, can, any, can everyone see my screen? Uh, yes, yes, it's all fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, a research paper that I started quite a few years ago uh, with a friend of mine. And um, well, it's still at the very beginning, um, but let's say that since then, um, things have evolved quite a bit. So I'll be talking about what those evolutions are and how this affected um, ODR. So ODR is basically short for Online Dispute Resolution, uh, for those who are not familiar with this. Uh, I'm sure that at some point of your life, um, as a consumer, uh, you've come across ODR in one way or another. 
especially if you've had a dispute on eBay or PayPal um, and you've used their uh, dispute resolution platform or if you um, have used the EU uh, ODR platform uh, that provides basically for ODR services. So I kind of stand, not stand out, but I think that I'm amongst the very few uh, private law uh, lawyers here. So this is basically um, ODR is a private method of dispute resolution, at least so far. Um, and I'm going to talk about how AI is affecting ODR um, because AI and ODR has been in existence since the 1990s, actually, um, and it has been functioning in a legal vacuum. Uh, so the question is, you know, uh, given that we're uh, witnessing an expansion of ODR to, um, you know, aspects of dispute resolution that are more formal, such as arbitration, um, and that affects, um, you know, uh, the rule of law, really, um, the question is, you know, what standards do we have at the, at the moment and uh, what can we do about it? And so I'm just pointing out some questions. I'm not really reinventing the wheel today. Um, so for those who are not familiar with ODR, uh, we started seeing uh, the creation of ODR platforms actually with the eBay um, dispute resolution platform in the late 1990s. Um, and it was created as a method for dealing uh, with increasing um, number of disputes that were arising as a result of the increasing number of internet um, users, uh, specifically of the eBay uh, platform. Um, but this is not the first time that we, you know, had heard about ODR. Uh, Professor, Ethan, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Ethan Cash had already started talking about ODR and the potential that ICT holds for resolving disputes for consumers. Um, and private parties um, since the 80s and early 90s. But this is the first time with the um, eBay platform that we've seen an actual substantial uh, creation of such a platform. So if you're wondering what ODR is, because it's not very clear, um, we have several definitions. We don't have a unique definition, uh, but the most popular definition is that it uses ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, um, that uses ICT basically. So it's um, ADR that is based on um, ICT to resolve disputes. And ADR um, consists of several things. Amongst them, the most popular uh, methods of, ODR, of ADR are uh, negotiation, mediation, and conciliation. So negotiation is basically when the parties come together and negotiate an agreement. Um, we don't have any intervention from anyone else. It's just the parties on their own. Um, mediation is when you have two disputing parties and you have a third, a neutral, uh, who's a mediator, who's trying to mediate between both parties, but they don't really intervene. So the neutral doesn't intervene here. They just try to mediate the problem between the parties. Um, and then we have conciliation. This is when we have a more active, um, let's say, intervention by the conciliator to come up with a solution uh, for the dispute. Now, the most popular form of ADR um, so far has been arbitration, specifically for um, commercial disputes, for international commercial disputes. This is the main way um, that um, you know business disputes, you know, uh, resolve their disputes. They don't go to litigation, um, at least in most cases. Um, so what's been interesting is that arbitration is obviously something that is normally considered a part. It's a type of dispute resolution that doesn't really fit with an ADR. It's, you know, it has a special status, let's say. Um, and what was interesting is that we were familiar uh, with ODR so far with um, online negotiation, online mediation, specifically in the consumer context uh, for resolving consumer disputes. Um, but um, resolving uh, disputes online for arbitration hasn't really been a thing. Um, and it was met with a lot of reticence, let's say, uh, from the community. However, we've had quite a few interesting um, developments even prior to COVID. But e after COVID especially, uh, we've seen the rise of online arbitration and this has be become the common practice of arbitration, which is why, you know, I think that it is, you know, becoming increasingly important 
uh, to uh, regulate this type of arbitration, especially as you know time goes by, uh, more and more uh, technical uh, advancements will be used uh, in the procedure itself and eventually perhaps like ODR in uh, making the decision. Um, so it is quite important to understand you know to what extent uh, we have legal protections against that uh, for now especially with regards to preserving um, the dispute resolution process from bias from the decision maker um, because one thing i did not precise with arbitration is that arbitration is very similar to a court uh, judgment basically case or a court case uh, because the outcome uh, the decision that is issued by the arbitrator, uh, who's the third neutral, and we can have also a tribunal, um, is that the decision itself is final and binding. So it does have the same value automatically as that of a court judgment. So you can see here um, how it's important to you know, assess um, what you know, ICT sort of measures are being adopted into uh, this type of procedure. So here I have an example of the most popular um, ODR procedure, which is the eBay uh, platform. It's called the eBay uh, Dispute Resolution Center, um, and it's available on the eBay uh, website. So as a consumer or as a trader, if you have an issue, then you can um, basically posit it here on the uh, platform. And this platform is the most successful one, I'm saying, is because each year, I think it deals with around 60 million uh, disputes. Um, and what's interesting is that 80% or over 80% of these disputes are actually um, not made by a human. They're based on um, an algorithm and they're automatically basically um, made these decisions. So um, the eBay um, Dispute Resolution Center is obviously for business to consumer disputes. So, so far it has been okay for this to continue functioning in a legal vacuum, let's say, um, because, because if you search on the eBay uh, platform, we don't really have reference to what the applicable law is or what the protections are. Um, so, you know, in a way it, it did create its own standards um, uh, procedural standards to function. And so far it has functioned because it is consumer law and obviously um, it is mediation. So if there's a problem, the consumer is still entitled to go to court and challenge um, what, or, you know, go to court and actually um, sue uh, the trader. So you can see that uh, eBay is just one uh, type of a system here of these ODR systems, and there are different levels of automation uh, that have been adopted uh, in by these different ODR systems. So we have different uh, system designs for ODR um, processes, um, and here are just a few examples that are quite well known. Uh, so Madria is basically created by the creator of the eBay Dispute Resolution Center, so it has a similar um, process design, let's say, to that of the eBay one. You can see that Madria also has adopted an automated negotiation and mediation process. And then we also have the Smart Settle and Cyber Settle systems, um, which have adopted a blind bidding tool system uh, for making automated negotiation um, decisions, basically. Um, and for those who might wonder what blind bidding is, it's when each of the parties to the dispute um, basically communicate uh, their claims and you know the issues that they have with each other. Um, they um, send that, they feed that in uh, to the platform and the system. And what the system will do is through an automated algorithm, try to evaluate what the similarities um, in uh, the problems that each um, bid has and try to come up with a solution um, basically. Uh, based on these bids. So this is how that functions. So these are just a few examples. I think nowadays we're witnessing an explosion of uh, different um, platforms that are coming up uh, with you know, different uh, procedural solutions and different procedural designs. And we currently don't have a legal framework that says that you need to follow a specific design. So I think uh, the discussion has been led more or less by the idea that, you know, um, code is procedure so far. So I think now the table is turning and we're witnessing, you know, 
a more awareness of that. And I think there's uh, perhaps an appetite for more um, uh, regulation of these, you know, uh, codes and these system designs. Um, and with regards to um, AI that is used in ODR, you've seen so far that's this, uh, you know, something that is quite established. It is part of the ODR tradition by now. Um, but we've been also uh, seeing a few developments in the context of international commercial arbitration with regards to AI. And as I said, international commercial arbitration um, is very important. Um, and it, you know, the award itself has the same value as a court judgment. And this is why it's quite interesting to see how things have evolved here in terms of AI. Um, so at the moment, we don't have any um, mock proceedings or not something that has been pub published at least or that I'm fully aware of or that the arbitration community knows of. Um, we haven't really had any sort of mock proceedings on AI arbitration or anything like that. I think it's something in the works. Um, for instance, we've had blockchain-based um, arbitration proceedings or smart contract arbitration proceedings. Um, that you know have been uh, trialing, such as Cleros or um, Code Legit or Materium. So we've had quite a few of those uh, that are based on blockchain, but not really on AI so far. Um, but we've seen that uh, these AI tools have been um, adopted for things like e-discovery, uh, data processing, or analytics and prediction. Um, so these are some examples of how. Um, AI is used as a tool, basically, um, for the, you know, for um, uh, supporting uh, the arbitration process. Um, but as I said at the beginning of this uh, presentation, uh, we are seeing, um, you know, a, a common practice now of using virtual arbitration proceedings. Um, we've had, you know, arbitration institutions that are very traditional and that were not necessarily very adamant on online stuff, um, at least for the proceedings, the main proceedings take place online. We now have guidance from them and we have rules um, that were basically um, issued by them. Um, so um, it's quite interesting to see that, you know, there's this uh, more keenness on adopting uh, technology in ICT in uh, arbitration. Now, with regards to the ethical standards on independence and impartiality in ODR, we have ethical standards, and then I'll also talk about the current rules and laws that we have. Um, so with regards to the ethical standards, um, we do have uh, two uh, well-known ethical standards that have been adopted. So uh, we have the NCTDR, it's the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution, Ethical Principles for ODR. And you can see here, I've underlined it. They have a stipulation on fairness and it's saying that ODR processes uh, need to basically uphold due process without bias or benefits for or against individuals, including those that are based on algorithms. So I would say that this is actually the only um, ethical standard or, you know, uh, type of um, let's say standard that is trying to regulate ODR arbitration um, that ha has specific mention to um, algorithms and the fact that decision making can be um, automated and that these automated systems need to also abide by uh, independence and impartiality um, standards. And then we also have the International Council for Online Dispute Resolution Standards and again uh, they include that, you know, uh, you need to make sure that um, conflicts of interest of providers, participants and system administrators must be disclosed in advance of commencement of ODR services. There's no mention of algorithms here, but at least um, they are mentioning um, the fact that system administrators, you know, should be involved in this process, given that if you have an automated dispute resolution process, some, someone needs to um, be liable somehow for um, um, the decisions that are being made or for the errors that are being made. And we also have um, an international um, standard also. Um, so the UNCITRAL is the United Nations Commission for International Trade Law. They, ca they came up with the technical notes on ODR. So again, this is just guidance. It doesn't have any legal value. And you do have a section on the importance of independence um, in ODR. 
Um, but things are a bit more complicated. Sorry, yes. sorry to interrupt, just to say we have one minute left. Okay. Yes. okay things are a bit more complicated when it comes to the EU regulation um, and when it comes to arbitration. Um, because there is a heavier and more strict uh, um, application of independence and impartiality there. But still, uh, we're faced with, the, with these questions here that I pointed out, um, because we still have gaps with regards to um, assessing independence and impartiality in AI-based ADR, ODR, sorry, or arbitration. So we have issues like, how do you prove bias in AI-based ODR? Obviously, we need uh, transparency on how automated decisions are made. Um, and the ultimate question is who would be liable for bias or errors that lead to bias. Uh, for those who don't know, um, in ODR, technology has been uh, labeled as being the fourth party, but you know, again, this doesn't really answer that question. So my ultimate quest is really uh, to emphasize on the importance of the need for regulation with regards to AI ODR and dispute resolution or, or arbitration um, more, more regulation with regards to AI uh, and, you know, preserving independence and partiality, especially for binding and enforceable um, outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah, for a very interesting um, uh, discussion and uh, some of the issues some, some of us might have not known in advance. Um, uh, Patrick, would you like to, would you like to go on? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I think you can all see my screen, I hope. Uh, yes, yes, we can. Thank you very much, yes. So, hello, my name is uh, Patrick O'Sullivan. I work as a legal researcher uh, in UCC in the ETIC Research Cluster. It's in the Business of Information and Systems uh, School. And today I'm going to examine how you could possibly regulate fake news during a pandemic. So the first do certain key terms. So according to the World Health Organization, an infodemic is an overabundance of information and the rapid spread of misleading or fabricated news images and videos. So during COVID-19, we had a lot of information about how it kind of came into being, how it could spread, and that's kind of changed, obviously, as, we, as scientists discover more information about the, the virus. Um, and so a lot of people just get this bombardment of information. And of course, with all this information comes the risk of disinformation, which is deliberate creation and sharing of false or manipulated information that continue to deceive or meet audiences. And you also have the related uh, problem of misinformation, which is the inverted sharing of false information. Uh, and both those definitions come from the UK Parliament, who had a report on uh, the dangers of disinformation and misinformation. So they are two different things. You have disinformation is when someone deliberately decides to create false information, and then you'll have someone who will inadvertently share that, and that's then misinformation. So from an Irish perspective, we have a constitution that allows freedom of expression under Article 46 1i, but the right is limited. You can't, for example, uh, defame someone, and you can't state stuff that might be, or broadcast something that might be a danger to the state. For example, in Ireland, uh, there was a broadcasting ban on um, the IRA, and as a result of that, Jerry Adams' voice used to be uh, distorted um, when, when he was doing interviews. But that was uh, the broadcasting ban. So they are, in an Irish context, there is history about restricting broadcasting and the freedom of expression. Other European constitutions would have a similar qualified freedom. There's kind of a, a recognition that, yes, the right exists, but it is limited. It's not unqualified. And the European Convention of Human Rights would also adopt the sim a similar stance. Article 10.1 uh, recognises the freedom of expression, but again, it is limited. Uh, in certain states, that limitation has been abused. So, for example, in Turkey, they have restrictions on the Kurdish language, whereas in other states, um, they tend to be very, they, they adopt a, broad, a kind of a broader um, uh, acceptance of what freedom of expression constitutes. So what I just thought to do for this paper was look at maybe the medical sphere and see what type of balances and frameworks they have in place uh, for, uh, I suppose, medical research and see if they could be tailored into the context of freedom of expression during a pandemic. Uh, because, of course, uh, 
you could kind of, it, it is a medical situation, so you're trying to adopt what's already in the medical sphere. The Belmont principles were, were adopted to basically prevent um, unethical experimentations on people, um, which happened under the Nazi regime in, in Western Europe. Uh, and they came together, uh, these different ethics, uh, ethics and, and legal experts, and they formed three different principles uh, to set a kind of a benchmark, as it were, and these were, the three principles were fairness, benefits, and justice. So fairness basically refers to the res respecting a person's autonomy. So if someone is doing a clinical trial, you have to make sure that the individual or community in question has uh, consented to this trial and that you respect the decision-making process throughout the trial. The second principle mainly refers to maximizing the positives and minimizing the negatives of the research. And then the final one is about burdens versus benefits, which group holds the burdens of the research and which group will benefit from it. So you may have one group that has to go through the clinical trial and they will take the risk, but of course the benefit then may go to a different group. So if you look at fairness and autonomy and apply it in a kind of freedom of expression um, perspective, you can kind of understand that you have a similar kind of strand. You have to respect someone's autonomy and what they may express or what their position may be in a certain situation. Um, so you have to kind of give a, a person uh, their own type of, I suppose, you have to recognize their free will as a war if they have a certain position, a certain belief. And that's kind of similar to the autonomy strand under the Belmont framework. And there's also benefits where you have um, clinical trials, you have the ma maximization and the minimization of, uh, well, the benefits and obviously then the risk. And that's an issue as well with communications. If you allow everyone to say whatever they want and you have unfettered communications, you could end up with social upheaval, you could end up with um, discrimination, or you could end up with uh, a health pandemic uh, spreading a lot faster than if people actually listen to the official, I suppose, advice or the advice that's rooted in information. So there is that kind of uh, the value of an individual expressing their beliefs and their positions is, is a core tenant of, I suppose, Western Europe and other states. At the same time, there is a harm potential from that. And this then comes to the, the last strand, really, justice. And that comes down to the burdens and benefits. So if, you, if someone wants to express their opinion, what benefits do they have? And what's the burden on the state then to restrict that benefit and vice versa? What burden is on the individual to protect their right of communication? I will examine that now further down. Um, of course, the state enjoys considerable benefits when enforcing um, communication restrictions because it, has the, it can introduce legislation or it can sanction individuals um, and by, I suppose, blocking their communications or else uh, placing them in prison. So this is just an example. On one side, you have the state's perspective of what justice is. And on the other side, you have uh, the individual's perspective. You have, uh, for example, an individual would say they're immune. They can basically say whatever they want and they can communicate to whoever they want. And the, the fairness for them is the fact that they have a freedom of expression. Whereas from the state's perspective, the justice uh, strand would be a sanction. They want to sanction the person for spreading the false information. Um, they want to restrict the flow of the information to minimize harm. And then, of course, they also want to ensure that there's no discrimination coming from that freedom of expression, i.e. one person basically abuses uh, another uh, group or individual by stating what they want to state without thinking of the consequences. So in order to kind of delve a bit deeper and build a better framework, I also examined John Rawls and what I came to kind of realize is he has a particular um, a framework as well. Um, under his legal theory, there is the concept of maximum equal basic liberties and there's also a veil of ignorance. And what that is under Rawls's theory is that if you had people who weren't aware of the real outside world, they would all come together and agree that they're entitled to certain basic rights. Uh, behind the veil of ignorance. And one of those rights presumably would be a freedom of expression. However, if you were to contaminate the veil to some degree and give more information to the people behind the veil and say actually there's a health crisis going on in the real world, they might also concede that freedom of expression may need to be restricted. And you can see that's the graphical representation of that theory. I also wanted to look at how Roz and uh, Benefence would combine together 
And he has an issue raws about, or he has a, a theory about unequal outcome. Um, once there's fair and equal opportunity within society, um, that's the key for him. Yes, un, un, inequality may derive from that in time, but the key is that there's a fair and equal contest before, um, between different people in society for a position. So in certain cases, communication may cause considerable harm to others if not restricted. Does that, does then the right of expression overcome social harm? So there is an issue with, you know, if certain people have uh, special knowledge or expertise, should they then be protected to some degree with the information that they release, um, maybe via social media, rather than the normal person who's just uh, literally making stuff up without any basis in fact. So there is an equality of freedom of expression but there may be an equality of outcome or harm. And this is kind of the, the issue again, and it just re-emphasizes the problem. So in one perspective of communication, if it's say outside the official narrative, it might result in a debate. It might result in the state kind of uh, protecting liberties uh, more so than it would like to do in a, in a pandemic. And there might also be a debate about alternative solutions. And you might also, it might also really result in research. On the other hand, you have, if you have unfair communication, you could have put on risk. You have undermining of official, official medical advice. You could have discrimination between different groups, and you could also recklessness or social upheaval. And the third strand then of Rawls um, is that of, uh, I suppose, on a, uh, inequality or an unequal outcome of inequality. And Rawls believes that inequality is not necessarily a negative outcome if the inequality gives rise to wider benefits to society. You could also have a similar issue in relation to... Um, sorry, Patrick, we cannot hear you. Um, would you like perhaps to turn off your camera and this and might make your connection? Well. Sorry, Patrick, um, I was just saying, sorry to interrupt, but we couldn't hear you there for a moment. So perhaps you would like to turn off your camera and maybe your internet connection will work better. Okay. Um, well. Thank okay. you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. So the, that's the third strand of Ralph's theory is that there's inequality. Um, it may lead, for example, um, it may lead to a benefit of outcome or a, a, a negative of outcome. Oh, uh, issues here now with my with my slides. <laughs> uh, sorry, I just can't get my slides to move. <laughs> okay, are you? I mean, yes, you can turn on your camera again if if that helps with the moving the slides. Uh, no, I have my camera back on, but the slides won't move. I don't know what's going on there now. Um, sorry about this. Uh, I don't know if I can help in any way. Back now. Oh yeah, there we go. I'll just speed it up because I've obviously lost a bit of time. Um, but I just want to make an issue about the source of information and the communicator. So the source of information is the person that has certain qualifications and knowledge. Uh, and basically, what that means is that if they, state, if they state something in social media, there is obviously some value to what they're saying. Um, they have uh, uh, an equal, uh, maybe uh, an unequal position in society because they have expertise or knowledge. And from that, uh, it, there is a bit of unfairness, yes, because not everyone has that expertise, but there's also a benefit. And information that they propagate should be considered, it should be critiqued, and it should be open to debate. It shouldn't necessarily be considered misleading or false. And that comes back to the burdens and the benefits. So for the state, the burden is on establishing um, whether or not the information, should it be considered false or disinformation or should it be protected? And the state has the benefit of having a lot of investigation, uh, investigatory powers to examine that. On the other hand, the source has the benefit of if they have certain knowledge and they can prove that their information was not uh, a causative uh, link to a, a health crisis uh, that they then are protected. And that protection will also go to the communicator, the person who spreads the, the information um, and who is the state is obviously engaged in misinformation. And this is kind of a, a graphic again, it just gives you the expert, because it kind of gives you the balance, I suppose, really. Um, in the one hand, you have 
an individual who has certain knowledge or expertise, um, and they, are, you know, they have a value of the information they convey, so they shouldn't be considered or, or sanctioned. On the other hand, the state will argue, you know, there's no expertise behind this information, so there's no shielding for the communicator, and also the source is the causative factor behind the health breach in question. There's also some social value to the information under examination. And this comes to my last point, which is basically the need for an information tribunal. Um, I'm kind of moved away from just a black and white definition of disinformation and misinformation. And in order to deal with fake news, I think your best bet is to develop an information tribunal so that the state can assess information in, an, in a kind of show, in, a, in, a, in a form, a specialized form, where experts have a look at what the information is. And if there is no basis in it, then the person in question should face some kind of a sanction maybe a financial penalty, or else is, is barred maybe from social media use if they have caused significant harm. So it's moving away from kind of just the black and white definition into something more. And I think that's kind of the, the summary of the presentation. I examined the Bellamo principles. I've kind of applied them using Ross's uh, legal theory to kind of come together with, um, I suppose, a theory, a new theory to kind of balance up what is information that should be protected and information that shouldn't be protected. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick, for this interesting presentation. Um, even though we had some te technical difficulties, thank, th difficulty, thank you very much. You. Um, and now I'm gonna um, um, hand over to Graham, uh, who will be discussing and commenting on all those very interesting different presentations. Uh, Graham, over to you. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed to uh, all the presenters for um, lifting several corners of my veil of ignorance. Um, I, I, I would love to debate and comment specifically on all, on uh, all the papers, but we I think we'd be here all afternoon. Um, so what I'm going to do is make a few background general comments. Um, and then pose one or two specific questions, which hopefully we'll have time to to uh, to get the panelists' responses on. Um, so, firstly, a few background comments generally about um, the rule of law and fundamental rights. Um, as I say, not specifically related to any of the uh, any one presentation, but we have heard um, uh, a lot during the uh, the presentations about. Um, both the rule of law and fundamental rights. Um, so we've heard about the rule of law and of the existence and strength of legal norms, trust in legal institutions, fairness and efficiency of judicial processes, absence of corruption, and 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 so on. But it's also about um, the legality principle, the requirement for clear and precise rules governing conduct. Um, and we just heard. Uh, an allusion to that um, in Patrick's talk in terms of where you where you draw the line between what is and is not permissible in terms of uh, of of speech. Um, this is you know, the rule of law contrasted with the exercise of arbitrary power by individuals um, in a position uh, to exercise that power. Indeed, we can say that uh, I think that there can be no rule of law without rules. If rules are absent or if they exist but are so vaguely framed that they do not amount to an ascertainable rule of conduct, then the rule of law is absent um, because decisions of courts, regulators, prosecutors and others descend into ad hoc exercise of arbitrary power. And that is an issue in any society, uh, wherever it may be located on, on the planet, north, south, east or west. And on that issue, I think the rule of law and fundamental rights overlap. Uh, the European Convention on Human Rights contains the prescribed by law requirements, which requires clear and precise rules. And that is a precondition. If you don't satisfy that requirement, you don't move on to consider necessity and proportionality and balancing of rights. But I think conversely, we can also say that not every rule is a rule of law. Um, a theme park or a stadium sets rules for its visitors, but those have never been considered to be rules of law. The same may be said of online intermediaries, although, of course, that is increasingly hotly debated. 
we shouldn't assume, I think, that every debate about what the content of law should be is a debate about either the rule of law or fundamental rights. There surely is a sphere, potentially a wide sphere, in which we can debate what the law should be, but neither the rule of law nor human rights gives us the answer. We cannot derive a single optimal content of law from either of those. And speaking personally, I would say that is how it should be at least if we value the possibility of diversity of rules and laws in different countries and different spaces. So against that background, just a few specific comments and questions. The first I think is relevant uh, particularly to three of the presentations on facial recognition technology, developing states and ODR. First, I wonder whether to the extent that uh, lack of rule of law reflects human failings when we're talking about issues such as corruption, arbitrariness, partiality, and so on. Should we perhaps consider the possibility that AI has the potential to be more trusted than human beings? We do point, of course, to the possibility of hidden AI bias, but does AI have the potential advantage of being incorruptible? But on the other hand, how can we be sure that the rule of law in the sense of the application of known clear and precise rules is being observed when the reasoning employed in the decision making is not knowable? Is that indeed a genuine rule of law issue? And is the answer different in a private rather than state prescribed scheme? Moving to fake news, I, I, I do wonder what an alternative source such as the Belmont Principles gives us that we don't already get from conventional fundamental rights analysis of legality, legitimate public aim, uh, necessity, proportionality, and balancing of rights. And do all such methodologies in practice operate more as a gateway um, to overriding individual rights if the public need is sufficiently pressing, rather than uh, providing a, um, a genuine restraint on such, um, uh, on such restrictions? And specifically on that, um, is, is there a risk that emergency rules will in due course become the norm? Um, how do we distinguish between uh, pressing social need in an emergency such as the pandemic um, and that in normal times? And lastly, um, whilst GDPR and data protection are always presented as being a matter of fundamental rights, does that really tell us where the dividing line should be between what is and is not permissible? And in reality, is that framing um, often no more than a policy debate dressed up in human rights clothes, sometimes with a heavy political seasoning of underlying antipathy to capitalism as such? Those are my questions. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for um, the summary and the comments. Um, do any of the panelists uh, want to reply to comment on uh, Graham's points? Um, I believe your first question about uh, whether AI could be more trusted than human beings was uh, particularly addressed to uh, Natalia, Sarah, um, Hannah. Would any of you like to reply? If I, Please go ahead. If I may, yeah, very, very quickly. Thank you, Graham, for the very interesting comments. And yeah, regarding the, the trust issue is something that we have seen nowadays with contract tracing apps in the context of the COVID-19 health emergency, that they are not sufficiently adopted uh, among other reasons because this lack of trust uh, precisely regarding data protection or a potential data breach uh, by the by the population and by the citizens and also regarding uh, humans humans in the loop the people operating artificial intelligence uh, systems for example in the case of facial recognition technology the the washington bill that i mentioned has a not a very detailed but a, a section regarding the requirements in terms of qualifications and in terms of formation that the people operating this system should have so it's an aspect that it has not been paid many attention. We focus more on the technology, but not on the people operating the technology. But definitely, I think it's something we should be, um, we should be looking at. Uh, thank you, Natalia. Um, so anyone else? Yeah, if I could just add really quickly to that, I think also building on Natalia's 
point um, on, on the, the human in the loop. I think the question of trust is also, it's, it's not just, a, again, it's not just a technical question. It's also a question about the socio, um, you know, uh, culture around it. Um, and while an AI system may be extremely trustworthy, people may not still trust it for other political factors around it. So I think that that task of trust building um, can be enabled by AI, but it cannot be replaced um, by AI. And I think it's also a question of scale, of degree. Um, again, it, it goes down back to the question of to what extent um, has the system reached its limits? I mean, if you've got a certain level of trust, you may be able to implement AI systems and have people trust them. But if you don't have enough basic trust, even the most trustworthy system um, will not be trusted, um, I think. And, and I'm, I'm looking at this from the context of having tried to do some technology projects in Southeast Asia when it comes to developing the rule of law. And we do find that even you know a simple system can be rife with a lot of politicizing and like self-interest and it can be very difficult um, when there isn't sufficient social trust to start with. Yes, for sure. I mean, and it will depend on context and uh, country specific and culture. Um, what about uh, Graham's next point about uh, whether there's a risk that emergency rules will become the new norm? Um, Sorry, Dimitra, I just wanted oh, to add with regards to trust um, and please. with regards to Graham's first question. Thank you, Graham, for the question. Um, I just wanted to say uh, there, that we are seeing um, a lot of research coming out uh, with regards to uh, this apprehension of AI-based decision-making in ODR um, and whether we should trust, um, um, you know, AI or algorithmic-based uh, uh, decision-making more than a human being. Um, and so far, I would say, um, you know, Know, with the eBay uh, platform, for instance, um, consumers are not necessarily aware of the fact that it is AI that is making uh, these decisions, right? Um, so in a way, it has been kept away from them. So I think that uh, initially because, you know, uh, things have started to pick up with this uh, platform and because it has been successful, I think it has been a built trust and the fact that it is working within a consumer context, it has worked so far because a consumer always has a chance to go to court um, but I think the danger is perhaps more uh, you know with regards to um, judicial decision making and you know applying AI in that or um, in arbitration where the results can be a bit more binding. Sure thank you thank you very much Sarah. Um, yeah so so to move on because I'm aware of the time I mean I, I know that the next um, uh, we have a coffee break after this session, so perhaps we can spare a few more minutes if it's okay with all of you. Um, uh, but I was wondering if perhaps Patrick would like to reply to um, Graham's point. Yeah, um, I think you know it, it's it's a, it's a good point in that like the framework and how it's applied will ultimately depend on the state in question um, and whether or not emergency powers have a tendency to kind of become kind of part of the established uh, legal landscape quite quickly. Um, I guess the reason the Belmo principles I picked them was because they had a, a medical research slash health context, um, but it is difficult to kind of apply something whereby ultimately what is disinformation or misinformation kind of, yes, there's a thing, there's, there's facts and they're, they're what matter, but you'll always have kind of expertise and people with knowledge Misinter or reinterpreting the facts in a different light. And then you have people who literally just don't care about the facts. They're just going to have their own alternative facts. And that's how you kind of distinguish the two. I think how you do that is, is kind of the challenge for a state uh, and indeed for uh, normal people on the street, um, particularly in, in a pandemic when facts kind of, the actual facts do change. So we were, we were told early, uh, earlier in the pan pandemic, you didn't need to wear a mask. And now we're told you have to wear a mask. It's very important. And there's nothing sinister about that. It was just that the facts changed because the research changed. They found, they discovered more about it. And I think that needs to be kind of, um, maybe explained to people more often as well. Maybe there's an education, an educational uh, need as well to get more information out there to people. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely, Patrick. And I think you're right. It's a very fast evolving situation. And uh, also, I, I agree with you about the educational aspect um, in terms of how people get their news from how many sources, you know, how they judge the reliability, perhaps, 
Uh, Graham, do you, would you like to add anything? Sorry, just unmuting myself there. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I wonder what Patrick had to say about the my my the first part of my question is to you know what what something like the Belmont principles gives us that we don't get from a conventional um, fundamental rights al analysis such as under the under the convention. I suppose it's kind of a, an effort to try and balance the, the information in question. So rather than uh, have just a, a kind of a basic convention article saying you have a freedom of expression, but you can't defend someone or you can't threaten national security, you actually look, in the, in the context of a pandemic, you look at the information in, under examination and you determine whether or not it, it comes under or misinformation or disinformation or whether there's actually value to it. Um, I suppose if you apply with the current infrastructure, you still come down to the argument of, um, I suppose, the power of the state and, and how much power they have because they can ultimately determine what is or is not disinformation, whereas this approach is trying to, I suppose, bring in more expertise and be a more critical analysis. Uh, whether it would work in practice is, is, is a different question, really, because, I mean, an information tribunal sounds great in theory, but in practice, it would depend on what experts you get to sit on it, and it would depend on the information they examine as well. Um, and of course, it would also depend on the relationship between um, the health breach in question and the information. So you have to kind of see if there's a specific health breach that has happened, and whether there's you can you can actually link that into a, a specific communication on Twitter or Facebook, and you you can then get that person and say, well, do you have expertise? No, I don't. Well, then you're you're subject to a sanction. Um, I mean, you could do that under the uh, existing infrastructure too, I suppose. Um, but I suppose the Belmont principles are kind of the way because they're rooted in kind of research ethics, uh, they're kind of the pivot I was using, because um, I think that they, they allow for nuance. So no no place for Barrett room epidemiologists? Well, no, I mean, <laughs> the more the merrier, as much expertise as you can get in. Um, I mean, even at the moment, there's, there's people in, in kind of the medical sphere that are having debates about, um, you know, whether lockdown work, works or not, um, and you have different countries going about it a different way. And it's just difficult to kind of determine, I suppose, what is, uh, what, what currently the dominant narrative might change in two weeks' time. And I suppose that's why an information tribunal might be of some value. Um, I mean, it, it's just a theory, but uh, I think if you give people unfettered freedom of expression at the same time, you might end up with, with a lot of damage or a lot of, you know, a lot of healthcare breaches will, will arise from it. So I think if you actually uh, examine the person's position, and whether there's some basis to what they're saying, uh, in fact, you might have, it might lead to, a, I suppose, a more uh, open and honest discussion uh, among people and among individuals in the state. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick and Graham. I also have a, a question from the audience uh, for Andrew. Uh, so the question is, to what extent do you think strong data protection may stifle AI innovation? Okay, thank you very much. I think that's um, a really good question. So first of all, I, I would say that I'm aware that there have been some voices from the tech communities that have claimed that data protection laws are too restrictive and will prevent uh, technological innovation and advancement of artificial intelligence. However, I disagree um, for two reasons mainly. Firstly, data protection regulations have been purposely um, designed to balance fundamental freedoms with corporate interests rather than to restrict data flows entirely. Secondly, intrinsic to this notion of creativity and independent thought and analysis of the natural world that's around us, um, this is necessary to recognize existing technological gaps in the market, along with self-determination and the freedom to tinker around until a new solution is made to address any issues that you've encountered. Autonomy is therefore a core criterion for incentivizing innovation in a free thinking liberal society. Um, this is seen in the justifications that you would find, for example, given authors intellectual property rights in original works, such as in copyright, patents, and trademarks. So if machines are allowed then to fashion the actions of individuals, right, and provide alternatives to every inconvenience that we came up upon and decide what's best for us before we actually have the opportunity to make this determination, our own mental capacity is likely to become restricted. So this suggests that 
the modulated society designed through over surveillance hinders innovation, whilst privacy regulations can actually provide the shelter for innovation to thrive. Thank you very much, Andrew. Does anyone else want to comment, um, reply, um, make a comment on this question? I mean, it was addressed to Andrew, but it's a, it's, you know, it's a question we all ask ourselves anyway. Well, okay, if, uh, if no one um, has any other comments or um, questions, I don't know if I, let me see if I have any, I don't have any other questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to end this session. Thank you very much, all of you for participating. Um, Andrew, Hannah, Sarah, uh, Natalia, Patrick, and Graham, thank you very much uh, for the very interesting discussions. Um, and thank you to all, all of you for, um, for attending. I hope you have a nice evening. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Peter Cohn. I'm going to be chairing um, this afternoon, chairing this panel this afternoon. So thank you for joining us for what uh, promises to be an absolutely fascinating panel on algorithmic transparency and state power. Before I introduce our excellent speakers uh, and their papers, I want to just quickly run through the format for the panel. So I'm going to introduce all of the panelists who will then present their papers in turn. They're going to have about 15 minutes to, uh, to give their presentations. The papers will be followed um, by our discussant, Dr. Rachel Adams, who will respond to, uh, to what our panelists have said. The panelists will also have an opportunity to respond to, uh, to what Rachel said. Now, depending on time, there will then be an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, but if you don't get an opportunity, for whatever reason, to ask, ask a question, please don't worry, because there is going to be a dedicated and more informal meet the speakers session tomorrow afternoon. So there's going to be another opportunity to chat with those panellists who can attend that session. Um, so the panel will begin with uh, Petra Molnar um, and her paper entitled Borders and Pandemics, AI and Migration Management in the Time of COVID-19. Now Petra is a lawyer and researcher specialising in technology, migration and human rights. She's the current Mozilla Open Web Fellow, which is an international leadership initiative that brings together the best emerging technology, talent and civil society organisations to protect the open web. Petra's paper will be followed by um, a paper given by Wen Long Lee, Karen Jung and Andrew Howes. Um, and their paper is entitled Digital Experimentation in the Public Sector, a Critical Interrogation. Dr. Wen Long is a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Birmingham. Professor Karen Jung is, inter is the interdisciplinary professorial fellow in law, ethics and informatics, also at the University of Birmingham. And Professor Andrew Howes is a computer scientist, again, at the University of Birmingham. The final paper will be given by Perry Keller and Archie Drake, and their paper is entitled Paternalism in the Governance of Artificial Intelligence and Automated Decision-Making in the United Kingdom. Perry is a reader in Media and Information Law at the Dixon Poon School of Law, King's College London, and Archie is a research associate also at the Dixon Poon School of Law and is a visiting Research Associate at the Policy Institute at King's College London. Um, Katerina Foss Solbrecht was also going to be giving a paper on this panel, but unfortunately she isn't very well, so she's unable to attend today. But her paper was on algorithmic disclosure under EU law. Our discussant for this afternoon is Dr. Rachel Adams, as I've already said. Rachel is a senior research specialist at the Human Right, uh, sorry, the Human Sciences Research Council of South Africa and is an Associate Research Fellow here at the Information Law and Policy Centre. Rachel's research interests lies at the intersection of philosophy, gender, technology, law and race. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Petra, who will um, begin, the pro begin the panel by uh, giving her paper. Petra, I'll hand over to you now and uh, I'll mute my, um, mute my microphone. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for having me with you today. Uh, it's my pleasure to share with you some ideas from the most recent work that I have been doing that lies at the intersection of trying to understand how technology is experienced at and around the border. 
Um, I will also try and kind of bridge some of the theoretical ideas that I have around um, the governance of, of AI and algorithmic decision making in border and migration, and also try and pull in some findings from my most recent trip um, to Greece and um, some of the photographs that we took while talking with people on the move and refugees that find themselves in the Greek refugee camps and who are kind of at the sharp edges of the technological development that is occurring in, in these spaces. I'm going to share my presentation with you. Um, but like, uh, like Peter said, I am a lawyer and a researcher and I try and pull in different ideas um, when it comes to power and technology. The most recent project is a conglomerate of different actors, um, but again, we're trying to understand how automated decision making and AI is playing out in real people's lives. Because I think oftentimes when we have these conversations, it's very easy to forget that the systemic harms that are perpetuated uh, by the, the introduction of new tech, uh, particularly in opaque and discretionary spaces like the border and immigration decision making, there are real people at the center of this. What I'll do today is I'll give you a brief overview of some of the new technologies that are finding their way into migration management and how COVID-19 and this kind of push towards biosurveillance is exacerbating some of the human rights implications that I think we all need to be thinking about. Because currently, um, very little governance and regulation exists when it comes to this kind of technological experimentation at the border. And then I will leave you with some broader questions to think about. Why is this happening and why are particular powerful entities able to experiment on particular groups over others? Because at the end of the day, I think it's really important to consider the broader ecosystem in which these technologies develop. We're increasingly seeing anti-migrant sentiments, criminalization of migration, rise in xenophobia, and now also biosurveillance, which will disproportionately impact particular groups that are historically made marginalized. When we're talking about migration control technologies, really this kind of ecosystem approach of trying to understand how a person's migration journey is impacted throughout the course of their movement is helpful. It definitely helps me to try and situate some of these ideas um, in, in practice. Because when we're talking about migration management tech, Really what we're talking about is a variety of, of uh, innovations that occur before the border, at the border, and beyond the border. So we're, for example, talking about things like um, drones and unpiloted technology that's used to police the border. We are talking about um, new ways that algorithmic decision making is importing um, different ways that decisions get made. For example, when it comes to immigration detention, we've been seeing ICE in the United States, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, use algorithms to justify detention at the US-Mexico border. Um, we are also seeing the rise of biometrics, for example, uh, and uh, also big data and population predictions. Um, when it comes to, for example, trying to understand uh, where uh, people will be moving and what will be happening. Um, however, what is increasingly uh, becoming apparent is that tech experiments are tested out on particular communities that are on the margins. And what's concerning with COVID is that the rise of new technologies and the way that we uh, are, of course, thinking through how to stop this current pandemic from, from spreading, the concern is that the new ways that states are experimenting with innovation will be tested out on the same types of populations that we are already seeing this occur. But again, this, this kind of panopticon, this idea in which uh, we find ourselves when it comes to the border space, the systemic approach is, is really useful because it allows us to think about how these technologies are interconnected throughout the course of a person's migration journey. What I wanted to share with you now is just a few photographs from my most recent trip to Lesbos, which is an island in Greece. Those of you who follow migration um, situations might remember that in September, one of the biggest refugee camps on the outskirts of Europe, Moria, burnt down and essentially rendered thousands of people um, without uh, a place to stay. Now, the Greek government then moved quickly to try and rehouse these people, um, these refugees who are waiting to be processed for asylum, or who some of them have already received asylum, um, into a new camp that is essentially another containment zone on the same island. And 
my colleague and I, who's a photographer, uh, had the opportunity to go and, and speak to people and also try and understand this kind of security apparatus that we are increasingly seeing in this particular um, geographic zone. And we saw this really fascinating and troubling intersection between, again, COVID. Um, uh, here you see, for example, policemen and women dressed uh, in hazmat suits while thousands of people are waiting in line, unable to socially distance while waiting to be processed into a new camp. We were also trying to understand how conversations around surveillance, biometrics, data gathering and the like were making their way into this particular space. But oftentimes, um, of course, COVID is an afterthought. Uh, this right here is the COVID containment area in the new camp. As you can see, it is a barbed wire um, field essentially in the center of the camp. And it begs the question, what kind of surveillance is being used? How effective is it? Should it be effective? And, and what are we really doing about the pandemic if people have to live behind um, barbed wire with no running water or access to appropriate health care? Here again, you see people lined up for hours, days on end really, um, trying to make their way into this new camp. In which I should say a lot of people actually did not want to go into. They want their asylum claim process. They don't want to be in a new containment zone. And another common um, kind of trend that we saw uh, was this, this conversation around the inaction of the European Union and how particular spaces, frontier spaces like Greece, Italy, and Spain become these kind of technological testing grounds in which AI, surveillance, aerostats, drones are being piloted and tested to make borders more impermeable, more difficult to cross, and actually automate different facets of the immigration and a refugee regime without thinking about what this is doing to human dignity, procedural fairness, and the like. Again, I think it's important to remember that there are real people's lives that are impacted by this. Um, this is a photo from the Brento camp in Moria, and I think it really, again, it, we need to think about these spaces as spaces that people move through and live through, and, and they're not just technological testing grounds, as we are seeing. But again, really, there are six main takeaways I want to leave you with. This technology is already in use and in development. This isn't some sort of forward-looking exercise. The sheer scale and potential impact of migration management technology and automation in this space is quite extraordinary. We're talking about thousands, potentially millions of different applications in people's lives that are impacted. And the risks to human lives is really real. There's also this point which um, I think is really important, the contextual analysis of immigration law being a highly discretionary area of law with safe, uh, weak safeguards and oversights is something important to remember as well. What does it then do when we superimpose partial or full automation on a lot of opaque and discretionary decision making that is already inherent in the space of immigration uh, law? Now, at this point, I won't go into too much, but I would be remiss not to mention, of course, there, there is legal and practical nexus with national security law as well, which oftentimes means even weaker oversight because states and even uh, different entities are able to hide behind a veil of national security, which makes accountability and oversight even more difficult. But perhaps most importantly, this kind of AI hype or techno solutionism is not an appropriate mechanism for fixing a humanitarian crisis that's very complex, systemic and historical. So really in the remaining time, I just wanna highlight a few human rights impacts that are important to think about. And having a holistic assessment of how people's human rights are impacted when it comes to AI and migration is really key because of course, freedom of movement, life, liberty and security of a person is already engaged if we're talking about detaining people at the border based on algorithmic decision-making and even things like freedom of association and religion. But I wanna focus on two rights. I want to talk about equality and freedom from discrimination and also privacy and data protection. For example, we know that algorithmic decision making and things like uh, facial recognition that oftentimes uses um, these types of technologies has a very bad track record on things like race and gender. What will this mean in the migration context, however, where again, um, safeguards are weaker and we need to think about the ramifications on people's lives. This makes me think of the now perhaps ill-fated experiment called eye border control, which purported to introduce essentially quote unquote AI lie detectors and a risk assessment mechanism into European borders. And this in and of itself is a really fascinating and troubling and problematic example because we know, for example, that lie detectors generally are not reliable. 
But what about AI lie detectors that purport to discern whether someone is telling the truth at the border? How will they be able to deal with differences in cross-cultural communication or the impact of trauma on memory and the fact that we don't, for example, recall our stories uh, in, linear, in a linear way? How will equality and discrimination play out when we start augmenting or replacing human decision makers at the border with automated decision making or AI? Privacy rights and data protection, of course, very important as well. Differential uh, expectation of privacy is something to think about when we're talking about refugees, people on the move, who fear that their data might be compromised or shared with repressive governments. Again, that contextual specificity here is really key. But again, in practice, all of these rights intersect. And having this holistic understanding here is, is really key to try and unpack how far-reaching these impacts really are. Now, I won't get into this too much, but again, administrative law issues are also really important to think about because procedural fairness and standard of review are both engaged when we start thinking about automating different facets of the immigration and refugee regime. What counts as a fair decision when an algorithm is involved? And what do you do if, for example, you are wrongfully deported, which already happened to over 7,000 students in the case of a faulty algorithm making a mistake and accusing people of cheating on a language acquisition test in the UK. What if you are one of those students and you wish to challenge this decision in a court of law? How will you challenge this? What will you be challenging? What will the standard of review look like? And how can we think about this again in the context specific area of immigration and refugee decision making, which is already very opaque and difficult to understand when humans are involved, right? We know, for example, that immigration officers, two immigration officers might be looking at the exact same set of evidence and will make two completely different determinations. Now, just to end, why is this happening? Why is this experimentation occurring at the border and on people's lives? Here, I think context really matters, both pre-pandemic and now during this pandemic moment in which we find ourselves in. Because I think it really is about some broader questions that we have to ask ourselves as a society. Migration management as a project is really all about making different people trackable, intelligible, controllable. These practices map onto historical ways that certain communities, people of color, for example, are made marginalized. And the state as an entity is the powerful one that gets to determine what priorities count. And again, I would be remiss not to mention the role of the private sector here as well in shaping the priorities, which we consider to be the ones driving the conversation. Because really, at the end of the day, perhaps it's about this. Who gets to participate in conversations around proposed innovations? And who gets to decide what we imagine as possible? Very little oversight and accountability exists right now. But at the end of the day, who gets to decide what our post-COVID world will look like? I think what's really key uh, and clear for me as I increasingly try and stitch together this web of my own understanding of how this works is that the hubris of big tech and this kind of allure of quick fixes really does not address the systemic reasons why certain communities continue to be marginalized, why people are forced to migrate in the first place, and why certain communities maybe are more vulnerable to uh, COVID-19. Because again, I think the deliberate lack of governance and regulation right now in migration management technology needs to be interrogated from a critical lens the kind of obfuscation and opaqueness that uh, benefits states, benefits private actors, and benefits the kind of system of power, this regime, which again renders certain communities not even being able to participate in these conversations is a deliberate one. And I think it is incumbent upon all of us, um, you know, at this workshop, in, in academic conferences, to think about who is actually at the center of this innovation and how does power accrue um, differentially when it comes to technological development. So I will leave it there. I just wanted to share with you a recent report that we released just last week called Technological Testing Grounds. It's based on interviews with refugees and people on the move across, the Europe, across Europe. And it's also part of a bigger project that we are launching called the Migration and Technology Monitor. If you will indulge me, I will share those links with you in the chat and I look forward to our conversation during the discussion. Thank you so much.
me a second. Sorry. Is that better? Can you? Right. I'll, I'll try again. Sorry, everybody. Um, Petra, thank you so much for such a um, thought provoking and powerful talk. That was really, really interesting. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. I really, it, was, it was great. Really enjoyed it. Um, if, if anybody wants to ask any questions of our panellists, please do so. You can use the Q&A uh, chat function below, which is at the bottom of your, um, of your screen. So please do start to put your questions in that and I'll be monitoring that and we can put those questions to the panellists um, once all of the papers have been delivered. So thank you again to Petra. Um, what we will do now is we'll move on to Dr Wenlong Lee's paper. So um, Wenlong, if you'd like to take over um, and I'll, I'll hand over to you now. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can, I can hear you, Wenlong. Great, thanks. Um, let me put on my slide in a second. Right, um, good afternoon. And thank you, Peter, for the kind introduction. Um, my presentation today is um, uh, about a research project I'm, I have been uh, doing for a while together with uh, Professor Karen Young, from, uh, a research fellow from the University of Birmingham, and Professor Andrew House, um, who is a computer scientist. Um, and the basic idea behind this project is that we want to look at how algorithmic systems uh, and machine learning in particular um, are tested, trained, uh, deployed, and even evaluated in controlled or wild uh, environments with real consequences for, for citizens and including uh, some vulnerable groups as well. Uh, for this presentation, my plan is to first map out the, uh, um, uh, so uh, at this phase, um, uh, we are taking the live facial recognition trials in London and Wales as, a, as a, a case study. So my plan is to first map out the legal issues around these trials and then uh, have another look at these uh, dimensions through the lens of digital experimentation. So as you may know, uh, now live fish recognition is literally everywhere. And I found this um, interactive map, which basically gives you an overview or a global view of what's happening. Uh, another interactive map, if you like, uh, is about the regulatory measures or uh, efforts taken against this kind of trend and uh, but this uh, map covers the US states only. Um, I think one in interesting fact to, to, to look at is the way uh, they frame this regulatory measure or momentum and actually very few states or countries would say that they prefer a uh, blanket or total ban, but most would agree that a, a moratorium is an appropriate, um, an appropriate form of a response. Um, in the UK, we don't have a ban or a moratorium, um, so apologies, in England and Wales. Uh, we now have a, a kind of a moratorium in Scotland. Um, but this kind of proposal has been made, for instance, by Biometric Commissioner and the Forensic Science Regulator. Uh, they propose that no further trials should take place until a legislative framework has been introduced and guidance on trial protocol 
protocols and, and an oversight and evaluation system has been established. Uh, fortunately, in the UK, we have Edward Bridges, who has uh, brought the trials uh, performed by South, South Wales Police to court and has so far won the case. And um, actually, I think most of us would have been uh, surprised by the High Court judgment last year. Uh, which held that the, the use of like facial recognition by the South Wales police was lawful. And the primary reason behind this uh, related to the common law powers in the hands of, of police. Uh, for instance, in the uh, London police uh, uh, legal mandate about like facial recognition trials, they said they uh, uh, use common law powers as a legal basis. And actually the, the, the case law uh, has established that the, the rules need not to be statutory, providing that they operate within a framework and there are effective means of enforcing them. Um, so the common law powers are particularly relevant uh, where there is an absence of its specific uh, legislations or regulations on live fish recognition trials. In the UK, we have POFA and REPA, but all those instruments do not apply because uh, POFA covers um, uh, DNA uh, foot fingerprints uh, uh, and cellular samples only. And um, uh, RIPA covers covert surveillance only, and all these trials were performed in overt manner. We do have data protection requirements, which are perhaps the most powerful tools we have to hand to hold um, the digital experimentation to account. But apart, apart from that, uh, there has been debate on whether uh, there should be new legislation uh, that specifically regulates uh, live fish recognition. For instance, the Biometric Commissioner uh, in his latest report uh, said that uh, probably we're likely to see further legal challenges. And if we don't have a specific legislation, the police exploration would be slowed and rely on judge-made law, something that most of the judiciary do not like doing. So when it comes to ex experiments, I would say consent would naturally come to mind as a, a, a widely used principle to justify potentially harmful interventions or, or treatment. But consent in the Bridges case was not uh, engaged uh, simply because the police did not rely on this and um, the information commissioner has made it quite clear in her opinion that it is very highly unlikely uh, that individuals will be able to provide valid consent. And as such, the commissioner suggested that, that the police forces rely on uh, the so-called strictly necessary test uh, instead. Um, perhaps the, the impact assessment required by the data protection law and the equality impact assessment by the Equality Act to 2010 in the UK are the most handy tools we have. Uh, um, uh, and these uh, measures were considered in the previous cases. Um, for instance, uh, the Court of Appeal uh, how that Article 8 rights were not engaged. So the, the DPIA performed by the uh, South Wales Police was inadequate. And it's interesting to see that the High Court once considered the, an air of unreality when it comes to the public sector equality duty. But the Court of Appeal didn't accept that. 
and consider this is a, a serious issue of public concern. Last but not least, we have uh, a, a different separate issue relating to the retention of uh, custody images by police, but this was not contested before court simply because uh, Edward Bridges was not on a watch list. So uh, he could not be regarded as a victim. But a customer custody images review uh, released by the Home Office in 2017 uh, review that there are millions of images illegally retained by police. And those images were taken by those who had been arrested but released uh, without a charge. So the review concluded that there should be a presumption of deletion, but that is not the case yet because um, um, the police forces mentioned some legacy problems uh, that all those images cannot be automatically deleted. So they have to apply for deletion six or 10 years after conviction. So this is a snapshot of the legality issue and our research project tends to bring it further. So let's go back a little bit to the slide on a ban or moratorium. And uh, after a moratorium and even the establishment of a legislative framework, I think the, ne the next critical question to ask is what makes a good trial? Um, as I said earlier, um, the common law powers appears to be the trump card in the hand of uh, uh, police just, and they can simply on that basis justify everything they want to do. And um, this was not disputed by the UK courts, either the High Court or the Court of Appeals. The, the High Court was um, a bit inconclusive uh, on the matter of legality and uh, the quality of law in particular, because they paid heed to the nature, to the trial nature of what uh, South Wales police have done. The, the, the Court of Appeals considered this a little curious as, uh, as is stated in their judgment. And uh, this latest judgment also uh, concluded that the, the issue of legality should be a binary question. It is either legal or illegal. So the fact that this case involves the trial should not erode the standards for legality. So I suppose, uh, uh, but even the Court of Appeal didn't address this issue relating to the common law powers. So I suppose that like a critical question here is um, um, that indeed police have legitimacy to keep up safe. And in the British model of policing, this relates to the concept of policing by consent. But whether uh, they can draw on the legitimacy already obtained to keep up safe to justify other unconventional undertakings, such as to play with a technology toy, is another question. Um, we also mentioned that consent cannot be obtained in public uh, places, and that most of uh, us would agree on that point. Um, back to the 80s, uh, there were some STS scholars uh, who developed the idea of consent by proxy or, or public consent. And this uh, has been taken by, uh, for instance, the, the Scottish, Scottish uh, Parliament's Justice sub, sub, uh, Subcommittee on Policing. Uh, and in their evaluation, it states that police needs to have demonstrate that there is a, uh, a public consent. So far, we have three empirical surveys, one by the Ada Lovelace Institute, uh, one by the London uh, Policing Ethics Panel, and another from the ICO. And all these surveys conclude that there is 
in general, a high rate of public acceptance. So this begs the question as to um, how should we deal with this sort of public sentiment and the extent to which it can be translated to democratic legitimacy. And um, of course, the impact assessment would be a necessary uh, complement to public consent. But again, um, there are loads of unique questions about trial design that do not fall squarely into the legal context. I raised two uh, interesting cases. The first is from London Policing Ethics Panel. And um, uh, in the trial, there was a pedestrian uh, who was stopped by a, a police officer at, because he tried to avoid uh, his faces from being scanned. And there was a, a, a certain form of resistance from that person. And as a, resu as a result, that person was issued a fixed penalty notice. And another interesting case, also from the London trials uh, at Soho in 2018. Um, uh, so uh, the police uh, officer engaged upon a, a, a alert triggered and successfully arrested a person on the, on the watch list. Uh, interestingly, uh, another person who walked alongside with him was uh, engaged and uh, because that person was not on the list but still wanted by the police. So the police decided to harass that person as well. So these two cases, but the question is, does a trial really count? And possibly a, a more fundamental question is, what exactly is a trial? It's quite interesting to see that the police forces would use the terms like um, a deployment or um, operational trials in their own evaluations. But when they communicated with the public about what they do, they will consistently use the word trial instead. And lastly, uh, the primary reason why uh, the police forces want to retain uh, those uh, uh, images and even enlarge their database is that they, they need the data to train their systems uh, or make the, the system effective. And this has been confirmed in some uh, ev independent evaluations, such as this one from the University of Cardiff, which uh, confirms that there is a serious impact of image quality uh, on the overall effectiveness uh, of the system. And this can be linked to another contentious issue that a US company, Clearview AI, has been supplying uh, 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 low quality images scraped uh, from all over the in internet to law enforcement uh, um, uh, agencies. So apparently there's a tension between uh, uh, the level of effectiveness the police want to achieve and the availability uh, of data uh, to the police forces. I would like to wrap this up uh, uh, with a quote from uh, Sir Francis Bacon. Uh, the, best the best demonstration by far ex is experience if, and this is a big if, it go not beyond the extra experiment. Thank you. Thank you, Wen Long. That was a fascinating paper on what is a very pertinent topic at the moment and, and something that um, impact or could impact upon all of us. Um, I know uh, I've actually been talking about this issue with my, with, with, with my students in, uh, in one of the modules that I work on. And a number of those students, I think, will be are attending this conference. So I'm sure they'll appreciate your, your paper. Um, but thank you so much. It was, it was brilliant. Really, really interesting. Absolutely. So, to hand over now to um, Perry Keller for um, his paper. Um, Perry, I'll, uh, I'll uh, let you take over. Thank you, Peter. Um, the first thing I'm going to do uh, for everyone is I'll just turn off my 
video because I have my uh, screen set up beside me. You'll be looking at my ear as I talk you through things. So I'm going to share my slides with you in just a moment and uh, I'll catch up with that. So. Right, just to uh, start you off, I'll tell you a little bit about the background of this project. So Thump Trust in Human Machine Partnerships is a EPSRC funded grant project, which is centered on the informatics department at King's College London. Um, the law school has uh, a legal work stream within the Thump project, and that's what I work on with Archie Drake. One of the things that we've been looking at are questions about explainability and trust. And so in the course of uh, talking you through this paper, I'll explain some of the things that we've discovered in our work about those two almost totemic goals of uh, AI governance at the moment. So our concern as we've developed this work is that artificial intelligence and automated decision-making, AI, ADM, is ushering in increasing exclusivity and paternalism in the governance of democratic societies, not least in the United Kingdom. So let me tell you first about our concern and then the way we went about trying to test some of those concerns out in the project that lies behind uh, this particular paper. So first of all, what, what do we mean by paternalism? Well, there's a fairly standard definition of paternalism is interference of a state or an individual with another person against their will and defended or motivated by a claim that the person interfered with will be better off or protected from harm. Well, of course, against their will sounds like coercion, but there's a lot of paternalism which is against a person's will through deception. So that's our, our really, uh, our major concern here is that um, it's a combination of decisions being taken, uh, whether people want them to be done or not, or other decisions where people are not properly informed about the decisions being made. Now, one point to make, as the point of this is about paternalism and governance, is that paternalism is a ne necessary feature of all governance. It's impossible to govern without taking some decisions which people don't want to have made, but those in authority and the power to do something about that um, will uh, insist on those decisions. So, so we do accept that, you know, Paternalism is necessary to a degree to governance. Now, immediately when I talk about paternalism and relation to AI ADM, you may immediately start thinking about all the ways in which, of course, we feel manipulated in some way by AI systems and the various concerns that have been voiced and are being very widely discussed in this area. So let me call that paternalism A. And you can see I have a quote there by uh, Denchik and others, how this is uh, paternalism that arises in a way we're being manipulated by AI systems and thus how we come to understand the world, what services we are able to access, where we are able to go, what we are able to do, and the way we are governed all potentially feature data practices that shape the terms and conditions for our participation in society. And that would be concerns, including, as you can see on that slide, problems of discrimination, bias, and also problems particularly of deceptive manipulation. So it's not just about persuading us, but also about deceptively manipulating us to do things we would not otherwise want to do if we had the full awareness of the consequences. 
But that's a realm of paternalism A, which isn't really what we're interested in here. What we're interested in is paternalism B. That is how AI and ADM is changing the nature and processes of governance itself. So how we address the problems of AI, ADM, that very process of developing the principles, the rules and the methods of governance has this paternalism in it. That is the idea that decisions are being made for us in ways that we wouldn't want if we had the power to change them or we wouldn't want if we knew more about what was happening. So let's stop for a moment and think about, well, what are these new challenges to governance that arise out of AI and ADM? And the, they are really are the very familiar ones of opacity, complexity, and confidentiality. So opacity, of course, refers to our old friend, the black box, the black box problems of understanding how AI decisions are being made. And with that, a huge amount of technical complexity, both within the actual algorithms and of course, in the more advanced kinds of data analytics, uh, we uh, pretty well all know that you reach a point where even those who program and develop these things don't know how the decisions that are being made by the system are arrived at. And confidentiality is, uh, as I'll discuss shortly, it's, it's always been an issue in relation to uh, problems of governance um, and technical systems, but because of the nature of algorithms as being developed by commercial systems, confidentiality, commercial confidentiality, has risen to a much greater prom uh, prominence as a problem of governance, the protection of confidentiality. So those are some of the things that governance of AI is, uh, is uh, trying to, for, uh, to address at the moment. A lot of the solutions that are being discussed are developed or uh, indicating that what's needed is more explainability. It's a very familiar idea. So explainability in AI ADM that will result in trust and trustworthiness. Those, I'll come back to that later, but those seem to be, uh, the, the, that describes the general path for a lot of, of work in this area, that governance ought to ensure that there is explainability. So this arises, uh, gives rise to trust and trustworthiness. But as you can see from the slide, I asked the obvious questions, explainability for whom? and for what purposes, and who's trust and trustworthy for what purposes. And I can say that in the work we've done in the Thumb Project, it's been fascinating to work with the informatics people who are really concerned about the human uh, computer, the human AI team, and how human beings work with a particular AI system, and that they have trust in its outcomes. So for them, trust is all about the technical operation of the system, that it does what it says. But for them, the kind of further stakeholders and subjects of the AI system and whether they have confidence in it, that they trust it for reasons that they may have in relation to their, for example, their personal privacy and data autonomy, that is not the focus of their work. So it, it's very important to think that you always have to ask, you know, who is this explainability specifically for and, and what kind of trust or trustworthiness is being uh, generated. So our concern then is that in the course of developing ways to address opacity, complexity and protecting confidentiality, in governance, there is a growing exclusivity and paternalism. Exclusivity is that this is increasingly seen as a technical area which the public cannot understand, and paternalism that in the sense that decisions have to be made to protect the public uh, without public participation. 
And you'll see on my slide, I then say, well, fading contestation and contestability. So our concern here in relation to democratic societies is that one of the features of modern democracy has been a high level of contestation and contestability. And that means that there are avenues for contestation of uh, public decision-making and the public decisions are contestable in how they are carried out. And the question here is, um, are the ways in which governance is now beginning to happen something which is at a remove from some of the developed tools. And a, a good example of that, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, is freedom of information. Because freedom of information gives you rights to existing information. But freedom of information does not give you a right to the creation of information. And that means freedom of information law does not provide a right to demand an explanation. You can only obtain information which exists. So you can see there that some of these kind of contemporary uh, features of what we could call participatory transparency and accountability um, are not working that well in relation to AI ADM. So one of the reasons why there's a, a reluctance to develop public participation in this area is because of disclosure risks and compliance burdens. Disclosure risks are, of course, uh, heightened by this concern about the confidentiality of algorithmic processes. So somehow we need to have accountability, but we can't have public disclosure. The other side of that is that, for example, if we were to equip freedom of information law with a right to explanation, there is an uh, immediate concern that public authorities would be absolutely overwhelmed by the need to create information to answer these demands for explanation where they were using AI systems. So out of that, we can see that other, uh, either through atrophication, that means that, like as I described with AI, that simply that the tools of public participation and public transparency are simply fading in their uh, effectiveness, or otherwise a reluctance um, to develop or even a determination to limit some forms of access rights by defining them in ways that they don't intrude into these areas excessively to create these disclosure risks and compliance burdens. So that, that is our, our concern. And uh, just taking a quote from Lord Sale's well-known speech in this earlier this year, where he said, through lack of understanding and access to relevant information, the power of the public to criticize and control the systems which are put in place to undertake vital activities in both the private and the public sphere is eroded. Democratic control of law and the public sphere is being lost. So what we set out to do in the work that underlies the paper that I'm discussing is to test that concern. So we looked at uh, a lot of documentation over the period of 2016 to 2020 using a set of criteria. And out of that, we arrived at a final selection of 25 documents. They were either originating from the UK or the European Union and the Council of Europe. And we used a broader definition of the governmental system to include material originating from non-governmental organizations, but given an explicit role in government policy processes. And I've given you an example of three of those 25 documents. So you can uh, see the kind of documents we were looking at to test out these ideas about paternalism. So out of this work, uh, Archie and I, and I have to give Archie great credit here, he did a lot of the legwork on, on this, uh, this review uh, as it ran into the period of COVID and everything else, that we discovered there are um, 
three major agendas in this area of uh, work on governance of AI and ADM. And those three agendas are data protection, industrial strategy, and AI standards in the public sector. And as I'll discuss shortly, they all have elements of paternalism, but they are differently paternalistic and to different degrees. But as you can see for the slide I'm, you're looking at at the moment, that data protection has been more the focus for academics and regulators, particularly obviously in the UK, the ICO. Um, and industrial strategy has been much more at a governmental focus, particularly for the UK government. And a good example would be the Hall Pazenti Review of 2017. Uh, so that has more than data protection and privacy uh, concerns which figure in government work, but the, the really driving agenda has been industrial strategy. And then along with that, there has been a lot of concern about AI standards in the public sector. And that has been the work of uh, the civil service bodies and also in civil society as well. And that is really uh, tended to draw heavily on, on uh, concerns about ethics and ethical principles and the ethics of AI and ADM. Uh, watching my time here in case Peter is a bit concerned about that, um, that those three agendas then, as I said, live to uh, uh, brought, we could de detect in them uh, different kinds of paternalism. And so in the field of data protection, we were, one of the things we're very much aware of is the way in which data subject rights and remedies are being shaped to foster ideas about personal privacy and individual data autonomy that are both highly uh, protective and sometimes quite effective, but they're also being shaped in a way to ensure that there is this balance to uh, limit disclosure risks and compliance burdens. So it's a sense of, yes, your data privacy your, and your data autonomy that will be protected by uh, data protection law, but in the ways that we uh, dictate. So, and particularly for those of you familiar with data protection law, you can see that a lot of that is is been directed towards that you have rights to exercise those particular data subject rights that of uh, rectification, objection, erasure, etc. And that's what it's all about, or largely what it's all about. And then also uh, data protection law stretches to address discrimination and bias and deceptive manipulation. It's, it is not a all-purpose tool and it's stretching in ways to address some of those concerns. So as going back to UK industrial strategy, um, here the major concern is to avoid the anticipated harm of failing to realize anticipated economic benefits. So there may be some discussion of some of the harmful other impacts such as um, bias and deceptive manipulation, but the really major harm that's seen is the UK will lose out by not developing its AI and ADM across the commercial and governmental sectors. And certainly there has been in that area a lack of initiatives to foster public participation. So there's a strong kind of paternalism in the sense of this is what the country needs and um, this is not a place for a huge amount of public participation in the setting the rules for how this is going to happen. And then also then UK standards for AI in the public sector. Here uh, you can see that there is, while, th while there is a great deal of attention paid to the ethical standards and principles, there has been a lack of substantive new standards to address issues apparent in this sector. So there is uh, a lot of work has been done in the general and uh, there is a distinctive lack of uh, specific steps. And again, public participation doesn't feature very highly in that. It's a very protective 
at times highly protective view of what is needed, but it's one in which experts, technical and ethical experts, will set the, the necessary uh, principles to carry that out. So that takes us then to uh, the where I'm going to end today, and, this, and that's where our project is working at the moment, is you know, what is the future for contestation and contestability in AI and ADM governance? So we still have these problems of disclosure risks and compliance burdens, and they are going to limit the ability to develop new ways for the public to participate. But one of the interesting areas, which is uh, which I, I meant by what I said, where we are at the moment, is look at trusted intermediaries. And that is either government uh, bodies like the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation, the CDEI, and the way it might become more representative of wider uh, public interests and, and carry forward that kind of contestation and contestability of the rules to disrupt in some ways some of the conclusions that are made in a paternalistic way about what is good for us and to you know to make that part of the public agenda of what we think we need protection from and the other is to look at these wide range of uh, societal bodies that are also involved in their different spheres in uh, trying to attack or, or, or not attack but address problems of um, AI ADM uh, application. And I mentioned Big Brother Watch, that's an obvious one in the privacy sphere, but you could think client earth in the environment sphere. There's a lot of organizations that are trying to deal with the increasing use of uh, AI ADM and how the decision-making process is, is closed to public participation. So thank you very much, and please do get in touch if you'd like to know more about our research. Perry, thank you so much for such a fascinating paper on, uh, on a really interesting and important project. That was that was excellent. Really appreciate it. Um, and I'm sure there'll be questions from the from the audience um, once we've finished the panel. So what I'm going to do now is hand over to Rachel Adams, who's our discussant. Thank you so much, Peter. I must say that the last two years I've been with Nora in London, so it's really strange to be first in a virtual space and to be here in South Africa, many miles away from you where it's almost seven o'clock and we're all thinking about a drink. So I'm in that space and uh, yeah, that, that's how I'm coming to you now. But I must say that I was really, really interested in all these presentations that I thought all of them raised critical issues around how AI is challenging our understanding of democracy, our experience of democracy, um, our access to rights in really meaningful ways. So I really enjoyed that. They were all like very radical in their different ways. And, and it was uh, interesting to think across the different presentations which addressed really different topics, but there were some strong similarities there. So Petra, I. I've known a little bit about your work for the past, um, over the past year, and uh, it's becoming increasingly important as this area of biometrics is expanding. And I think one of the things that, that I find so interesting coming from South Africa, where there is on the continent a whole history of uh, whether scientific or technological experiments that are trialed here, that have been beta tested on populations and population groups whose lives are more expendable in places where the law does not have such a strong hold. So it was really interesting for me to, to see the study that you are doing um, in terms of how migration um, populations are experiencing these kinds of technologies and, and, and what it means, what it means um, as a kind of uh, paradigm of, of how the world is dealing with um, 
some of the issues around technology and these really high risk technologies, uh, where the vulnerabilities are lying and, and the kind of political status of those vulnerabilities, where they matter, where they're being shut out of public conversation. Um, so I think, you know, this question of opacity and obfuscation has come through in a number of ways and it's not just about the technologies themselves being opaque and being unexplainable but how they're used and in spaces that are already these kinds of zones of indistinction um, where it's not clear to it's not clearly articulatable if that's a word to um to work out what rights exist, what legal frameworks are pertinent and can be drawn upon. And I must say, uh, Petra, I was listening to you and I was thinking about Hannah Arendt's arguments all those years ago about the right to have rights and that basic right of citizenship, which means that other rights become claimable. And of course, in the, with migrants, that, that, that's always what is in question. So I wanted to, to ask you uh, when it comes around to, to asking questions, I wanted to ask you whether this uh, framework and thinking of human rights and international human rights is enough. And it seems really nihilistic to even question that. But when these atrocities are so stark and there's such high kind of linguistic barriers that a right to refusal becomes impossible and where uh, national security discourses are sort of shaping and legitimizing any form of governance and control, whether human rights uh, is a strong enough um, means of redress um, means of tackling uh, the, these issues which are so systemic. So perhaps from your own experience, you can talk to that and talk to how far you think human rights is, is, is the way to address this or whether it also needs to be coupled with more transparency, I guess, more understanding about why and how these uh, issues are so complicated and so outside of the realm of kind of public discussion. And I think that's especially so now in COVID-19. I don't think with so many of us not traveling and so many of us locked in our homes and our countries, it's really difficult to imagine those who are sitting at borders, who are going through all these processes so yeah, I'd be interested to hear your views on that. Um, Wen Long and Andrew and um, and Karen, your presentation was also really, really interesting. So thank you for that. And and I guess that issue of testing technologies, it was 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 similarly but in very different ways uh, raised. Um, I think at one point at the beginning you said how these technologies are tested in wild environments and, and I found that really, really interesting just from my own understanding of and history of thinking about um, how these technologies have in one way or another been developed um, historically in places like South Africa. So there's a really interesting book by a South African um, academic called Keith Breckenridge that traces the emergence of the biometric state to apartheid South Africa and the work of Francis Galton who developed these uh, fingerprinting and statistical uh, measures and his um, experiences in Southern Africa. So I, 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 it's a little bit off, off but I found it um, I found it really interesting to, to, to think about that um, in the context of who are the populations that are most targeted um, by these technologies or who are most vulnerable to bias and discrimination and material effects on their lives um, by these technologies. And, and a similar issue to what Petra raised with regards to is there enough meaningful engagement with the communities that are affected by these technologies, that are materially and directly affected by these technologies, and how can this be shown? Um, so, I, you know, from my own perspective, I'd be interested to know whether you think, um, whether you think there really is 
meaningful engagement with affected communities with these facial recognition technologies being used by the police force, whether I mean, even articulating and defining who the affected communities are can be discriminatory. So it's, it's a very opaque kind of setting to begin with. So I'd just be interested to hear from you about how public engagement, how that kind of democracy element that Perry, that you talk about later in terms of contestability, how that could be done uh, better and going forward with the use of facial recognition or high-risk AI technologies um, in England and Wales. And then, Perry, you raised uh, a really interesting argument around um, paternalism, the growth of kind of paternalistic forms of governance with AI, um, which I fully agree with. I, 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 um, I think that it goes against this issue of opacity and how the ways in which data protection laws define and describe what our rights are as citizens, what our expectations are of um, privacy, how we enjoy fundamental rights. It is so complicated for a lay person to go and access all the images that the police, the New South Wales Police, not New South Wales, South Wales Police Department took of them. Um, it is so complicated to um, exercise and claim those rights. So. Uh, I was interested to hear to hear your arguments, um, and also this issue of trust has been one that I um, raised in my own work a few years back, which was my PhD was on this concept of transparency, but from a critical perspective, and it seemed to me that this idea of trust was just so paternalistic. It was so depoliticizing in the way in which trust had to be so blindly promoted without recognizing that a certain degree of mistrust and skepticism um, is so important uh, in a healthy democracy. Um, so I think one of my questions for you, which is again probably quite vague and broad, is around how citizens, how the public can try and shape or engage with these narratives around uh, the use of technology that come from policy spheres, that come from the UK industrial strategy and the data protection laws that's, that in their kind of totality make a really defined statement that our future will be governed by AI and there's no other way of thinking about our future other than a future in which AI dominates every sphere and if there's a way of trying to resist that within the kind of current policy paradigm, the current uh, kind of discursive framework around AI um, that we currently have at the moment, or whether we need to be thinking in more radical terms around um, how we shift and make more contestable um, this space. So thank you very much. Rachel, thank you so much for your fascinating thoughts on all of that. That was that was brilliant. Um, really, really good. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So I think what I'll do is I'll give. I'm just keeping an eye on the time, but I'm going to get. I know we're, we're kind of getting to the end now, but we can. Uh, uh, if Nora's happy, I think we can go over a little bit and uh, give Petra and Wenlong and Perry at least an opportunity just to respond to Rachel. So um, Petra, are you happy to just kind of go first? Have you got any thoughts on what Rachel has said and the issues that she's raised? Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, for your thoughts. And it's great to see you, at least virtually. Um, I really appreciate that question because for those of you who might know me, I, I identify as a very reluctant lawyer um, and I am quite suspicious of the kind of human rights, top down, Western neoliberal project of human rights and superimposing that on governance mechanisms. It's tough because, I mean, on some level, I think human rights allow us to parse out the problem and pin responsibility to a framework that is intelligible and that allows us to think about responsibility in a particular way. But like Rachel said, I think it's it's incomplete at best and at worst it actually exacerbates a lot of the power dynamics that are present in trying to understand how this technology plays out on the ground. And 
you know, it, it just goes back to some simple ideas around even just individualism, right? And the fact that human rights are inherently tied to the individual and they don't really allow us to think about collective rights, collective rights to privacy, for example, or even the kind of expectations that different communities have, whether you look at indigenous legal traditions or others. So I think if, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a perfect mechanism at all. And it's one I, that sits uneasily with me when I try and under, think through how this, this area could be governed. But I think it's a step in the right direction, but perhaps the conversation now is moving further and, and something we're trying to do in our work is actually call for a moratorium of these high risk applications at the border and immigration, unless and until there is some sort of meaningful conversation around what the systemic harm that is perpetuated is in, in this kind of application. Perhaps a little bit of abolitionism thrown in there for you that maybe we all need to think about in this space as well. Thanks. Thanks, Petra. That's great. Um, Wen Long, would you like to respond to Rachel? Oh, yes. Um, thank you, Rachel. That's a very good question. Um, empirically speaking, um, my finding was that there was very little public engagement by uh, police forces in, in, in England, uh, Wales, and even uh, there are a couple of other trials in, in um, Berlin and other states. Uh, for instance, the, the London police uh, mentioned that they have been striving for uh, engaging the public and including uh, Big Brother Brooch, uh, a Big, Big Brother Watch, uh, the non-profit organization, but there was no further information than that uh, that has been just uh, uh, has been disclosed. And I think uh, regarding the spectre, possibly the uh, starting point would be the idea of public consent. And that fits very well in the UK where actually uh, police gain legitimacy from uh, consent, which, which is a, a, a principle established a long time uh, ago. And uh, building on top of that, I think, of course, transparency will be key and the essential and the ways in which they uh, review the key aspects of the trials to the public and to ensure that uh, the public would understand what's going on is very important. And apart from the, uh, uh, the impact assessment I just mentioned, uh, the data protection impact assessment and the quality impact assessment, there is a demand for a community impact assessment. I think that probably is the right way to go. Uh, but the exact form and nature is still um, uh, needs to be uh, further researched. Yeah, that's pretty much from me. Thanks, Wen Long. That's great. And and Perry, would you like to respond? Oh, we can't. You're, you're muted, Perry. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Uh, yeah, thank you, Peter, and th many thanks, uh, Rachel. That was really interesting. Uh, so, bearing watching the time here, I'll just uh, throw in a few things to try and pick up from where things have been left. So, um, you know, it is it's so interesting to, at this point to say, well, well, what is the public to do? And then, from our perspective, as the you know, as I'm explaining, we just see. A process of the governance that are sometimes highly protective, but as Rachel really put her finger on it, is we'll tell you what you need to be protected from and how you'll be protected. And to the loss of ability to start arguing and say, well, no, no, that's not what it's about. We need these kind of rights or something like that. That's that's a big concern. And so We've looked a little bit in terms of things like the CDEI and, and ways there can be organizations like that that would uh, could act as a conduit bringing in a kind of this more contestation into this. But that's, of course, rather difficult for those organizations which are dependent on government funding and things like that. So we, we're looking at that. We're quite interested. But the major thing that we're working on the moment is looking at uh, public interest organizations, uh, as I mentioned, things like Big Brother Watch or uh, Client Earth, et cetera, and their work. Now, of course, there is a very big issue as to uh, what is their representativeness of the public. 
and there will always be attacked in that way and there's the you know, legitimacy issues. I, we fully recognize that. But our interest is in what are the legal tools available now and how can they be pursued? And so some of the really key issues at the moment that people aren't so aware of, you know, there's a government's uh, review into judicial review. And one of the things that's under discussion there is the duty of candor. And the duty of candor is the basis for disclosure in judicial review cases. That is disclosure by a uh, government authority uh, to a claimant and whether you know those rules should be up that's hugely important in relation to the governance of ai because you know you have to have those amazing tools of litigation to push into these areas which are in many ways otherwise out of reach and also uh there is a very important case of lloyd and google going to the supreme court uh, about representative actions uh, based on data protection law, but the scope and the availability of representative of class action. So these are some of the areas we're interested in. I completely recognize the limitations of this litigation focus, but it, it has, and we know from Schrems too, been an area where the, you know, there are some interesting successes. Although you could say, well, looking across the broad piece, they stand out as exceptions. There we are. Thanks, Perry. Really appreciate that. Well, I'm, I'm just going to ask a quick question. I'm going to take advantage of my position as chair just to finish things off. Um, just to remind everybody, actually, uh, all of the participants that, uh, again, that um, there's going to be a meet the speakers session tomorrow. So if you do want another opportunity to ask questions of the panelists that can attend that session, that'll be an informal opportunity to do so. Um, but I was just going to ask a quick question. This is actually on behalf of, of Nora. Um, what's the view of, of all of you, actually? This, this is open to all of you as, as a panel on the call for a moratorium for live automated facial recognition technology. And related to that, I was going to ask, uh, again, what's the view of all of you on the police and other state agencies using facial, re facial recognition technology in partnership with private organisations, which we've seen, we've seen this with Yorkshire Police, for example, in, in Sheffield. Um, they, they've used facial recognition technology with British land um at the meadow hall shopping center so uh, i know they're kind of two related questions i just want to think, um and, and if so uh, please feel free to to just uh, just chip in and, and answer well why don't i say something here i i think that uh you know it makes me think of of the, you know the work i did there's a paper called uh, that I wrote called The Reconstruction of Privacy Through Law. And I think this is one of those moments where we had a kind of privacy of anonymity in public, and now that's being taken away. And what often happens is we are offered a compromised version of the privacy we, we had, where we say, uh, yes, we're going to use this because there's enormous benefits, and don't you worry, we'll put in these safeguards. But they are always less than what we had before. And so the idea of a moratorium is really nice because it, it really allows one to stop that process of reconstructing what we had in law in a lesser form and really have a deeper inquiry into that. But the whole history of the reconstruction of privacy through law over the past century and a half is that these things have sometimes an unstoppable force. Thanks, Perry. Um, well, Long, were you gonna, were you gonna uh, 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 say something as well? I just noticed you've, you've unmuted yourself, so. Uh. <laughs> yes, um, uh, definitely, I think that's the right thing to do. And um, actually, the current situation we have, at least uh, uh, re regarding the uh, use of light facial recognition by police, is that um, um, the exploration by police have just as the biometric commissioner uh, has says, has run ahead of institutional or regulatory uh, arrangement. And actually uh, the reluctance of this government led by Boris Johnson uh, to lay down a, a specific legislation framework uh, has frustrated uh, loads of uh, regulators uh, who don't have the exact powers that, such as the um, the Surveillance uh, Camera Commissioner who only have advisory powers. 
uh, but they all uh, strive for developing a, 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 a governance uh, framework. And in, in contrast to some well-established area involving experimentation, there are really careful and delicate rules on preventing harms, on dealing with side effects, for instance, on informed consent, and, and generally how a trial should be performed in a valid way, but we don't have these at moments. So apparently this is essential that we uh, secure some time to, to put in place all these uh, 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 frameworks. And another question Peter raised about the, the collaboration be between public and private sector, that's a quite thorny and uh, a, a very intriguing issue as well. And um, if you look at the interaction between police forces and uh, 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 official recognition uh, manufacturers such as NEC, we find that actually there is a lack of uh, standards or guidelines on how public sector should uh, consider and evaluate the quality and potential discriminatory effects of those systems. So uh, I think I, I, I just spotted a document uh, from uh, the keynote this morning on uh, public procurement of AI technologies. And, and I think that's definitely something both of us should look at uh, to de develop the rules, uh, and including the uh, distribution of liabilities on both private and public sector uh, players. Wen Long, thank you so much. Um, well, look, I'm, I'm aware of the time, and, and as Rachel said when she began her discussion, we're kind of getting to that time, but we probably want to drink as well, aren't we? It's that time of the evening. So um, I think I'll start to draw things to a, to a close now. Um, I just wanted to say, um, you know, a, a, a huge thank you to um, to our panel, to, to Rachel, to Wen Long, to Perry, and to Petra, um, and also to their co-contributors for, for, for their papers as well. Um, you know, that you, what you've delivered to today has been absolutely excellent. Really, really fascinating discussion. So thank you so much to everybody. And of course, thank you to all of our participants as well. Marina, and I will be presenting on algorithmic disclosures under EU frameworks. So this is a, a presentation about how we can crack open the IP black box that is shielding algorithmic decision making from judicial and public scrutiny. And I look at how this can be achieved by um, using three different frameworks, the Trade Secrets Directive, the GDPR, and the human right to obtain a fair and effective remedy and to have a fair trial. But before I do that, it is first necessary to define an algorithm. So an algorithm is, as defined by Hill, a finite, abstract, effective, compound control structure, apparently given, accomplishing a given purpose under given provisions. So similar to a recipe, an algorithm is a method constituting of a sequence of steps used to calculate different data variables, so the ingredients, to yield outputs, the dish. And this way, algorithms can tell computers how to complete tasks when incorporated into computer programs. And algorithms have various control structures and are therefore divided into algorithmic subcategories. And of particular importance to us, are predictive algorithms. And they are a part of predictive modeling, which is, which is an approach and not a fixed process. And this is designed to try and predict results based on historical data. So these types of algorithms scour through big data sets, searching for patterns or correlations between different variables and the final output to engender predictions. So machine learning, which is when computers execute tasks autonomously without human intervention usually aids this process. And there are two different types or two main types of machine learning algorithms, unsupervised and supervised. And although they are different and they are trained on different types of data, both are trained on data to uh, create an algorithmic model. And each type of algorithmic model affords different degrees of interoperability. So the decision tree on the top right is arguably more um, interpretable or understandable than the neural network on the bottom. However, 
Both supervised and unsupervised models can be black box or white box in terms of their IP protection. So the question of how algorithms fall under EU intellectual property laws could probably be um, could probably be a presentation in itself, but I'll try to briefly outline the most important points. So under copyright, the software directive expressly excludes algorithms. And algorithms also likely fall short of amounting to an author's in own intellectual creation and being an expression of said creation as required to constitute work under the Information Society Directive. Algorithms are probably too technical to meet the, also the creativity requirements under copyright law. However, oddly enough, they are not technical enough, at least not according to Board of Appeal decisions from the EPO. More often than not, they fail to fulfill the novelty as well as the technical character criteria, and they often lack an inventive step. However, when I was writing and drafting my paper, I submitted freedom of information requests to the national patent offices of the EU member states. And they disclose that they do grant patents for AI related inventions. And also the updated EPO 2019 guidelines provide some examples of the different types of algorithms that can get patent protection. So the possibility of obtaining patent protection for algorithms is there, but seemingly underused. So therefore, trade secrets are being used as a fallback because for companies who still wish to protect their algorithms. And this is in large part due to the, the issues of protecting them under copyright and patent law. But it's also in some part due to the convenience that trade secrets law affords. It allows vendors to effectively escape regulation, hold crucial evidence in court proceedings, and to elude accountability, whether intentional or unintentionally. However, given the broad definition of a trade secret, any information pertaining to the model is also protected. So this means my personal data as well as your personal data could arguably be a trade secret for a company. However, it is very important to stress that trade secrets do not create any exclusive rights to know-how or information. However, as a result of trade secret protection, an IP black box is created for algorithms. They're not being disclosed at all, which raises serious explainability, transparency, and accountability concerns, especially because the output of the algorithm is not always fair, nor does it meet the discrimination laws, or nor is it, um, does it engender results that are in the public's interest. Sometimes they directly harm individuals and how the functioning of society. And here are some different examples of where an algorithm has um, engendered such results and I'm sure that many of you know a lot of different examples as well. However, this is why an algorithmic disclosure is necessary. And you probably are wondering why I'm talking about an algorithmic disclosure as opposed to algorithmic transparency. And this is for a couple of reasons. There is no agreed upon definition of algorithmic transparency. However, what is clear from literature and from the different explanations that are being afforded is that revealing the algorithm is not necessarily a part of algorithmic transparency. They more focus on the explanations of the system as being the vital part. And explanations are important. They help ordinary citizens understand the automated system that they may just have encountered. But disclosures are also important because not only can they help explanations by bringing to light what is effecti effectively being explained, but they can also serve as a means to verify the accuracy of that explanation. So explanations therefore form one branch of algorithmic transparency, whereas overall transparency arguably encompasses algorithmic disclosures. And an algorithmic disclosure entails disclosing the data as well as the algorithm but the disclosure itself is context dependent. So this means that what, it, what would be disclosed depends on the audience in which it would be disclosed to. So it would, be a different, it would be a different amount of information that would be disclosed to a judge or in a judicial setting than what would be disclosed to the public at large or to a public servant if they're using or licensing computer software from a private company. And this is also what can kind of cushion 
the effect that algorithmic disclosures would have on intellectual property rights, but it's also a way in which we can balance the competing interests which algorithmic disclosures give rise to. But in sum, an algorithmic disclosure entails disclosing the algorithm as well as the information relating to the model, and this includes things like data variables, testing processes, period checks, auditing results, and impact assessments. But what can and should be disclosed effectively depends on the context in which the disclosure is sought. So this brings us to the question, how can we accomplish algorithmic disclosures under EU law? Because algorithmic disclosures, like I mentioned, they give rise to two competing interests. On the one hand, there's a clear economic interest for companies um, who have algorithms to keep algor algorithms, the data and information secret. Not only are these intangible assets estimated to be the new oil in terms of financial value, but they give a competitive advantage which, which can't be quantified. And they also serve as a springboard for further success. But on the other hand, there's a, pure, there's a clear public interest in algorithmic disclosures. Because algorithms now underpin society's infrastructure, the public has a right to know how algorithms work in order to understand how we as a society are impacted and so we can hold actors accountable. But also, as an individual, there's not only an interest in knowing whether our rights are respected, but, there's, but in actually being able to exercise these rights. An algorithmic opacity threatens both. A balance therefore has to be struck to ensure that the rights on either side are being weighed equally, but currently they aren't. So the first avenue which is possible to be used for an algorithmic disclosure is under the Trade Secrets Directive itself, because Article 1-2 states that the, the directive shall not affect the application or national rules requiring trade secret holders to disclose for reasons of public interest. So there's a public interest grounds in which a disclosure can be sought. And accessing information is in the public interest and it has continuously been found by the CJEU that this is the case. So there's a strong line of case law where the CJEU firms that access to information constitutes a public interest ground and it has been used to obtain access to confidential information. For example, re relating to the costs of company cars used, used by public bodies, internal audit results of Oracle software using university systems or government departments, telecommunication in, invoices, and so forth. So, and there also seems to be a clear public interest in individuals being able to challenge the algorithms that have made vital life-changing decisions about them. And it's really hard to see how the rule of law is upheld otherwise. So against this background, companies and scholars may sometimes overestimate the scope of protections that trade secrets affords. Trade secrets allow actors to exclusively reap the benefits of their assets, but trade secrets aren't comprehensive enough to hide algorithmic information entirely. But this does not mean that all algorithms will be disclosed to the public at large. There's still a balancing test that has to be done. But the balancing test previously shows that what for, for algorithmic disclosures in particular that what is being disclosed does not coincide with the amount of information that can and should be shared and therefore trade secrets can be used to afford a greater amount of disclosure and particularly if it's released in a court setting on public interest grounds so therefore reframing algorithmic disclosures as being in the public interest of transparency rather than an individual's right to an explanation is key. And so the second avenue that we could use is the right to information and the logic involved as afforded under the GDPR. And this can be used to allow people to access personal data, but this right does not allow people to access the underlying algorithm. Individuals have the right to receive meaningful information about the logic involved. However, this doesn't furnish a right to obtain proprietary information that is unrelated to themselves and that is owned by others. The GDPR expressly disclaims otherwise, and Recital 63 states that obligations under Articles 13 and 14 
to F and 2G should not adversely affect the rights or freedoms of others, including trade secrets or IP, and in particular, copyright protecting the software. However, article, however, recital 63 also provides that the GDPR limits data protection rights in place of IPRs, but this does not apply where others' rights and freedoms are adversely affected. And recital 35 of the EU Trade Secrets Directive states that this should not affect inter alia data protection rights. So adversely affects versus not affected, not affected denotes that a lower threshold must be met for data protection rights to precede trade secrets when they conflict. So the GDPR can therefore help re reveal personal data, but it will likely fall short of providing a strong enough legal basis to disclose only the algorithm. However, revealing the data can give grounds for further disclosure, and it can also help determine the appropriateness of the automated system itself. But it has some limitations when it comes to the type of data it can reveal as well. So anonymized data as well as generic data and the algorithm will likely fail to be disclosed under the GDPR. So this necessitates another avenue, which is probably the most promising one. And that is our fundamental human right of, a, of obtaining an effective remedy and a fair trial. And the link between human rights and algorithmic disclosures can remain overlooked in academic, academic literature, particularly in the context of it being used as a solution for algorithmic transparency concerns. However, the recently passed 2018 Toronto Declaration signed by NGOs worldwide emphasizes how one's right to obtain an effective remedy for, presents a strong counterforce when algorithms harm equality and non-discrimination. And the right to an effective remedy is protected as a fundamental human right under Article 47 of the Charter and Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights. And to uphold this right, individuals must remain in the loop, perceive individualized re reasons behind decisions, notifications behind when a decision affecting them adversely is reached, and the Council of Europe report notes that even a lack of awareness of an automated system coupled with its opaque decision making threaten, threatens this right. So by failing to understand, explain or impart algorithmic information, this right is affected. And also, there are some cases where um, trade secrets or other intellectual property rights have been pierced in order to provide for access to information. So for example, the necessity of viewing a source code protected as a trade secret in order to substantiate infringement claims convinced a court, convinced a judge of, of the district court of The Hague to order the reveal of the set of said code. And although a case addressing this issue has yet to arise on an EU level, the CJU has held that withholding information infringes one, one's right to a judicial remedy in other matters. So for example, in Cody, Germany, the court held that actors invoking banking secrecy to confi confine information concerning the name and address of account holders impaired an individual's right to an effective remedy and their, and their intellectual property rights and was thus impermissible. In Basai, the court found that interpreting the reach of Article 7 of the Charter to absolutely protect an entire household where one family member had committed copyright infringement would lead to an effective and ineffective enforcement of copyright especially when IPR right holders have no other remedies at their disposal. So these cases demonstrate that the strength of other rights diminish when the effectiveness of remedies are at stake. And because a claim is unlikely to succeed without information, it should be no different when actors threaten this right by refusing to release algorithmic information due to trade secrets. However, the effectiveness of viewing an algorithm is agreed, debatable. But if it falls within the sphere of exercising one's right to a fair trial, the presence of that choice is arguably more important than its outcome. Still, algorithms are only one constituent piece of a larger, pu larger puzzle of problems. So when viewed on their own, they can seem unproblematic. But when viewed in relation to external factors, such as its training and input data, a myriad of issues surface. So it's important to look at both the data and the algorithm when pursuing an access to information claim in order to um, 
have obtained a fair and effective remedy. But in sum, if one's right to obtain an effective remedy is threatened, trade secrets are more likely to be set aside than any other avenue explored. So to conclude, I sought to show that it is the context which determines what is a lawful and meaningful disclosure, and it is the context which determines what is a balanced algorithmic disclosure. But most of all, I hope that I've shown that what is currently being disclosed does not reconcile with the amount of algorithmic information that can be disclosed. And should you have any further questions, please feel free to email me. And I hope to see you all on Friday. Thank you so much.